Greetings, ladies and mendigents, and welcome to the science fiction audiobook version of the fourth wave taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 41, written by Semi Loki. I raced after Jack into the night. Despite the armor's thermal regulations, I felt as if someone had jumped a kite down my spine. An airship, on fire, here. Nightmares of flaming wreckage of the Hindenburg flashed through my head. Was that what I would see, a pillar of fire crashing down to the earth like a wounded giant? When I finally forced myself to look up, I wasn't sure if I should be disappointed or relieved. The airship was on fire. For the moment, though, it was mostly contained to the wooden cabin area below it. There were flames licking the gas bag, but for the moment, it was only charred but not burning. Swerians had been using airships for thousands of years, I reminded myself. They had probably worked out some of the basic fireproofing techniques by now. Which is not to say that this was not a crisis, as I watched and saw shadowy figures backlit by the glow of the fire scrambling about inside the darkened cabin. Every now and then I thought I caught a cloudy puff of steam as a fresh bucket of water was damped on the flames. Still, that might have been my imagination. It was clear that they were up to something inside, but I couldn't quite tell what it was, or why the ship did not seem to be slowing down. The propellers churned and spattering, the flaming ship staggered towards the field. Blackened lines of char rolled up along the sides of the gas bag like tiger stripes. Slowly, they began to swoop lower. They were bringing it in for a landing. Here. Yeah. Nervously, I glanced about and took in the scattered tents and shantytown wooden area scattered about the field. If that ship touched down here, there would be no containing the blaze. Once the gas bank lit up, it would be hard-pressed to keep the flames from spreading to the nearby city. The airship chugged along until I was only forty feet or so off the ground. Oddly, it had then leveled off, soaring above the field. It was now close enough that I could hear the voices shouting at one another from the inside. To my horror, I then saw the door fly open and a silhouette of one of the people inside stand before the opening. Before I could even think about what I was seeing, the figure jumped. He fell. He had no parachute and there was nothing but grassy open fields below. I wanted to scream, but my throat was locked. The eye was helpless to do anything but watch as a figure plummeted to the earth and stuck with such a force the dirt was thrown up in the spray. Vodge! That hurt! The figure shouted as he rose from a kneeling position. It was shied. He limped a little as he staggered out of the shallow crater, but otherwise he seemed intact. He looked up and cupped his hands over his mouth. Dry kvodging rolling, he bellowed upwards. I didn't, and my kvodging knees still feel like someone took a kvodging hammer to them. Another figure leapt from the ship. It struck the ground with a roll. Hookson stood up, cursing anyway. Doesn't help much, as you think, she grunted. Still hurts. Belatedly, my brain caught up with what my eyes were reporting to them. The arm, I said. It absorbed the impact. Not entirely, Huxon groaned as she staggered closer. That's quite a fall, but Reynolds is afraid that if he brings it any closer, he won't be able to gain enough altitude again. Enough altitude, I asked. For what? Hold that thought, she said as she looked at the crowd. Better stand back. I think John's is up next. Even as she shouted a warning, the enormous figure of the engineer appeared in the doorway and stepped out. I swear the ground shook when he hit. He was up on his feet and half running, half staggering to clear the way before Yakimo fell up from above. The twins tumbled out after one another and landed with awkward rolls. I waited for the next person to jump, but bizarrely the ship began to rise again. It's probably taken both of them now just to keep it under control. Hookson mused. It was getting pretty bad before Rhymer was supposed to jump too, but I guess it's off the table now. Rhymer and Reynolds aren't jumping, I asked. What are they doing? She gestured at the far wall that served as a barrier between the oasis and the sea. Going to try and get it over that wall, she told him. 
Can't risk bringing it down over here, so they're going to try to ditch it in the ocean. As I watched the flaming airship altered course to curve away from the wall, I watched it float upwards in a lazy spiral towards the top of the wall. I felt like I took forever, possibly because I was watching more and more of the gas bank turn black and charred spread. Whatever they used for fireproofing seemed to be losing the battle. They're never going to make it, I declared. As if I was saying this, I had given permission for it to happen. The flames chose that moment to burn through the skin of the gas bag and ignite the hydrogen within. When the Hindenburg went up, it looked like it went fast. One moment it was normal, the next, a comet of destruction crashing into New Jersey's field. Maybe it really was that fast. Maybe the Spherians had more experience with this sort of thing. All I know is that the first sight penetrating the gas bag was a result of a jet flames streaming off into the night. As the gas was pressurized, as it rushed out of the hole, it carried flames with it. The fact that it was leaking actually kept the gas bag itself from igniting at first. At first. Yet the fountain of flames was having an effect. It wasn't just leaking gas. The hydrogen fed flames making them grow hotter. The fireproof shielding of the canvas and gas bag from normal flames. But this was like being touched by a giant's blowtorch. As the flames jetted away, they burned as the ever-widening hole. The airship's slow ascent slowed even further. Another fountain of sparks and flames erupted, followed by a third. It was as if I was watching a fireworks detonate in slow motion. Petals of flame spread out from the central point. Then the gas bag itself began to glow orange as if smoldering flames consumed more and more skin. The airship lurched to one side and... To my surprise, I saw it cresting on top of the wall, though I could almost hear the bottom of the cabin scrape against the passing it. The last I saw of the small ruddy was a brightly glowing ball of yellow-orange dropping away on the other side of the wall. Hooks inside. Kavodj, she said. Guess I owe him five bits after all. I blinked in surprise. You bet on whether they would survive or not, I asked. She frowned. I know, she admitted, suck a bet, really. I mean, how am I supposed to collect if I'm right? So, are you going to come with us? With you. She jerked her head in the direction of the cobblestone street that ran alongside the field. To my complete surprise, I saw a horse-drawn cart waiting there with Shide holding the reins. To the gate, she said. I just hope that those two are as good swimmers as they claim. I'm not going out there to drag them both in. With that, she began stomping her way towards the cart, and I fell in step behind her. "'What's going on?' I asked. "'Ain't it obvious?' She asked me with a climber up the side of the cart and called the shotgun on the bench next to Shide, and leaving me to climb up into the flatbed behind. "'We're saving two idiots from drowning themselves.' "'No,' I said. "'I mean, why was the ship on fire in the first place?' "'Better Kavodjing save that question for Ranald,' Shide put in. He'll want to update you himself, but, I stammered, he held up a hand. Save it, he said. We've got a lot to talk about and no sense saying the same things cavorting twice. With that, he shook the reins and drappled the grey horse began dropping along the cobblestones. Can you at least tell me what started the fire, I asked. Was it an engine problem? The engines were fine right up until the arrows hit them, Shai declared. Good thing we were already turning around before the flaming ones came after them. Flaming arrows, I squeaked. Hoaxen looked back. What he means is we flew over a battlefield, she translated. Each side must have thought we were supporting the other because they both turned and fired on us. There's a war going on out there, I asked and then wanted to kick myself. Of course, there was a battle, then there was probably a war backing it up. Wars happen all the time, Shai told me. Usually just cavorge and go around them, but not this time, we don't. Why not? I asked. Never seen anything like it, he said. The battle stretched as far as I could see. It was like the entire oasis had broken out in arms, fighting themselves and their neighbors too. It wasn't a proper war. It was a riot that spanned a large swath of the labyrinth. I settled back down and stared off into the back of the cart. The city of Newton flowed past me as I watched the field where I'd lived for the past two months grow smaller. Something 
had stirred up a large section of the sphere into violence and conveniently crossed where they needed to go. Abjicators, I thought. It had to be them. They had barely found a foothold into this world and look at what they had done. I felt... angry. I rode in silence for the better part of an hour. When the cart did stop, caught me off guard. I spun around and saw what we were scant feet away from a rocky beach with salty waters lapping against them. The enormous walls of the labyrinth acted as a break wall that kept the larger waves outside. The sound of the surf crashing against the beach was probably as alien to this world as the idea of stars. A short distance away from us I saw a sodden forms of two familiar people. Ranald spotted us about the same time I spotted him. About time you got ya, he called out. I was afraid we'd have to swim back again, just to kill the time. In you get before you change my mind, Hookson shouted back. It was hard to tell in the dim light, but it seemed that Reynolds was chuckling. Reimer fell in step behind him, and they walked towards us slowly with heavy feet. It was obvious that they were exhausted, but yes, they were smiling. Rather good-humored about this, I commented under my breath. Reimer just lost his airship, Hookson murmured back, and both of them had just narrowly escaped their own deaths. If you think of a finer time for humor, then I'd like to know. She had me there. Both men climbed into the back of the wagon with groans of exhaustion. Hookson shouted, Game on! For no readily apparent reason, and we were off again. Shide steered the horses into a wide circle to point them back towards the airfield. A war, I said without preamble. Reynolds grimaced. Reckon those abjugated critters you were talking about might have something to do with this, he asked me. I nodded glumly. I think... I think that they are stirring things up to try and keep us contained, I suggested. He raised an eyebrow. Keep you fellows from getting across the world, you mean, he asked. I agreed. He scratched his chin. Could be, he agreed. Or it could be something else. Maybe they just like it when people fight. Why? I asked. He rolled his head in a manner that I took to indicate that he was clueless. Who knows, he said. But if you are right, then it's, that's good news for us. Good news, I spluttered. How can this be good news? He blinked. You said your airship was supposed to go to where we can't breathe and go zippity quick. He reminded me. That changed? No, I admitted. But we can only do that for short bursts and then the rest of the time we'll be cruising just a bit faster than the speed of sound. So, he said, speaking slowly, for our first leg, do you think you'll fall short of how far I could take the normal ships in the Paza? Now we'll overshoot that by, um... I trailed off as it hit me. They don't know about the speed and range, I said. Which means, he went on, that the kin are in the clear. No spies in that lot. I wanted to claim that I never suspected them at all, that all the secret measures were to keep outsiders out, that I never worried about people that I ate with, slept next to, and worked alongside. But I felt the tension I had not realized was there to leave my shoulders all the same. Maybe... Just maybe we could do this after all. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 42. Written by Sebi Loki. Put your backs into it and heave! Bella shouted to us. I tightened my grip on the rope and strained. My feet dug a furrow into the soft soil and I thought that I might actually fall flat on my face after all. Then, just as before, I tipped over a critical point, I expanded gas bag gained enough buoyancy to correct the tilt of the ship. My forward slide came to a halt. It was the final day of construction, and I had half suspected that I might not live to see the day. And after a hundred some odd days of exhausting sleep and sweat-stained furs, bland jumpers and yanches, and back-breaking construction, the airship was almost done. And what a sight it made. The outer hull covering the gas bag and the cabin fit together near seamlessly, giving the entire ship a diamond shape. There were four flags in the lower half, two at the back and two at the front. The back flaps hid the propellers when not in use, and the front flaps hid the guns. The resin had cured to give the ship a dark red color. 
The color that was so dark it bordered on black. Between the hydrogen gas and Volsin shuttle's propulsion, the craft was able to levitate just off the surface of the field in a manner that seemed to defy the laws of physics. Are you on vacation? Bella shouted. Come about, she's listening to starboard. Okay, Bella didn't say starboard, but it helped if I translated what she was saying into a more familiar nautical terms. Bella was both a seamstress and a foreman of the kin. She had been in charge of creating the gas bag for the ship, an impressive achievement in itself. When I had heard about her secondary role within the Gypsy Engineering Clan, I had been a bit confused. The elderly woman with the agile fingers seemed to know little about engineering outside her very narrow field. That was until that day. Half that woman's body was devoted to housing her lungs, her voice commanded obedience, mostly out of the fear that if you didn't obey, she'd shout at you again. I think that she got a nuclear bomber run for its money in pure volume. And bombs didn't typically swear. There was a whine from the inside the ship. Molson was redlining the stabilizers to try and compensate for the wobbling craft. Rudder, tubes snaked inside the ship and were pumping a gas bag inside full of hydrogen. The ship was already floating, but we were still a long way from the stable balance of lift per gas versus high-tech engines. Ease up, Bella screamed. You'll capsize her if you aren't careful. The others shifted their positions, and the building-sized airship straightened itself. The wine from inside subsided. Jason, Heather called out as she ran in my direction. Bit busy, I said through gritted teeth. Either grab a rope and help us, or wait your turn. She snatched the same rope I was grabbing and tugged. With the extra help, I was now able to split my attention with enough to talk. Okay, I grunted. What's up? I think we need to take some iron with us, she said. We need to repair the ship or to make contact with people along the way it might help. Wait, is it ready an issue? I reminded her. Between food, water, people, and other supplies, we're practically at capacity. Now you want to add another hundred pounds of metal to the mix. We can leave some food behind and just use the metal to buy some more along the way, she said. I'd be fresher. I'd rather risk stale food that I know is not poison than buy food where I have my doubts, I counted. She rolled her eyes at me. Fine, she said. We can leave some water behind. I'm sure we're going to fill up along the way anyhow. She had a point. There was just no way to physically carry enough water for all of us and the entire trip. We had to refill along the way. Still, after all the work that went into calculating the supplies, changing the ratios this late in the game made me nervous. I don't know, I said. Fifty pounds of iron, she said. We can leave behind a few jugs of water and some lamp oil. I doubt we'll need the lamp oil anyway, considering most of us will have lights in our armor. I didn't disagree with her assessment, but I was even more reluctant to leave lamp oil behind. The oil wasn't just for reading lights. If they needed to torch something in a hurry, it made a handy accelerant. Leave behind two jugs of water, I said, and swap out some of the fruit for the Arox jerky. She made a face. Is this the hint you want to avoid the fruits and vegetables, she warned. No, I said. It just stalls better. Fresh fruit and vegetables will spoil too quickly. I can get some dried fruits, she suggested. Fine, I said, giving up. But keep things spoiled to a minimum. If we have to sacrifice something, make the luxury items. She smiled. Does that mean I can chuck in a date cakes? She asked. Those stay, I said. If I have to live on a diet of arox and dried apples for the next few months, I would probably go on a murder spree if I don't get cake. She let go of the rope and saluted me. The release of the slack nearly spent me sprawling. Aye, aye, Captain, she said with just a hint of sarcasm before marching away. I hate being in charge some days, mostly ones that end with a Y. If you lazy bags of bones don't straighten up her right now, I'm going to garrot the entire lot of you with my own intestines, just to see if I don't. Bella had a husband, and I pitied him. Lee was the next to approach me. Jason, he said as he stepped up to next to me, I have some concerns about the weapons cache that we're carrying. One pistol and one rifle apiece, I granted. We agreed to this. But, he stammered, grenades are pretty light, just a couple dozen, that's all I ask. 
Can you think of a way that we can shed another 30 pounds? I asked as I struggled with the rope. Well, yeah, he admitted. Hammocks. We're using hammocks already, I pointed out. Yes, he agreed, and one for all of us. So? So, all we are planning is to be asleep at the same time, he asked, because if we're planning on sleeping in shifts, we can ditch one third of the hammocks and bedding. I closed my eyes and counted to ten. What if the ship gets surrounded for a few days and Volson shuttle is recharging, I asked. What then? Then we definitely need to be sleeping in shifts. Work it out with Heather, I said, surrendering to the inevitable. See what you can do can work out. Thanks, he said, and he walked off, giving me a sharp salute. Days that end in Y, and hours that have the vowels in them. These are the times that I hate being a captain. Jason? What now, Professor? I groaned. I'm sort of busy, and if you're wanting to change the manifest, you really need to take it up with Heather. Not the manifest, she said. I want to change our direction. What? I groaned. We know that there is a war in one direction, right? Yeah, I said. Well, this is the sphere. We can go in any direction and still end up where we're going. The abjugators know that we found out about the little trap in that direction. Let's head out another way. Won't they be expecting that? I asked. Probably, she admitted, but they also might have spread within. We don't know how many people are infected with the symbiote by now, nor what the percentage can influence. If we force them to spread their forces out wider, then they can't spread them as much as the interior. Again, I said, talk to Heather, she's the navigator. Tell her I give you my idea a blessing, though. Thanks. Oh, Jack was planning to come to see you. Just a heads up. Great, now our day's complete. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Go right ahead and topple the ship, you fool heads, Bella suggested. I'd be better off without you. Jason, a voice came behind him. At two Reynolds, I gasped as the rope slipped in my hands, almost lost it. I think we might need to consider some restraints for summer, he murmured. She's getting worse. Worse, I asked. How much worse can she? A shriek nearly caused me to drop the rope. The ants are in my head. A buck naked summer shouted as she ran past us. I must read up on insecticides and eliminate them. Double up on the straight jackets, I said. Dump whatever supplies you have to. Just make it happen. I was thinking ropes as well, he admitted. Great, I agreed. And sedatives. Lots and lots of sedatives. On it, he said. Hey, Jason. Hookson, I groaned. I'm a little busy. Game on, she said. I was just going to let you know that my supply trunk needs to be actually locked. I don't think anyone is going to steal from you, I said. Besides, how far could they go? She tossed her arm over her chest. Not negotiating, she said. It's happening. When I buy lambskins, I pay for the best, and I'm not going to have Shide and the others rummaging through them for shore leave. Lambskins? I asked before my brain caught up with me. Oh, for crying out loud. We're going to be risking life and death, I shouted. This is an excuse to spread your personal genetic code all over the sphere. I know, she said. That's why I'm bringing the skins. I groaned. Fine. We'll change out one of the supply chests so that you can lock away your skins. But I don't want to hear any more about it. Game on, she said cheerfully. If any of you good-for-nothings would like to show this old woman that you actually have muscles, Bella said, please do so now. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. The latter sank close by the time they inflated the gas bag enough that we no longer had to fight to keep it stable. It still had to be tethered in place to keep it from drifting with the breeze, but all the same, I was impressed. The hatch was floating a few inches off the ground. I stepped through the doorway and marveled at the interior of the new airship. It was really happening. I walked up to Volson's shuttle and waited for her to notice me standing there. It was not a long wait. She waved and greeted me. How is the ship? I signed to her. I'm impressed, she signed back. The achievements with this available resources are amazing. We had both been practicing the sign language and, true to the professor's promise, it was amazingly versatile. When do you think we can leave? I asked. Now, if we must, but, she said. Heather was still getting supplies. She tells me that I must eat dried vegetables. 
I winced. Storage issues. I will have difficulties digesting. She warned me I may slow to move. We'll try to find some fresh food for you along the way, I promised. Very well. Jason, a voice said behind me. I groaned. Hi, Jack. I greeted and then thought about what I just said. Never say that inside an aircraft, I muttered to myself and amended my greeting. Hello, Jack. Jack shuffled inside. She was looking at the floor, acting almost shy. I had um, a favor to ask of you, she said. May as well, I said, leaning against the wall. What do you need from me? She recoiled as if I just struck her. It's nothing, she said quickly. I'll just be... Uh, wait. I cut him before she could retreat. Sorry, I didn't mean to snap at you. It's just been a long and tiring day. I'm sorry. What can I do for you? She looked up in my eyes just for a moment before shying away and once more. I was thinking if... If, if you don't mind and... And you, you don't already... Jack... She sighed and seemed to gather her resolve. Do you have a name for the ship? She asked suddenly. I blinked in surprise. In all the excitement and preparations, I had never thought of it. No, I admitted. I guess we don't. I was hoping, she said, wringing her hands as she spoke, that we might call it, um, Akina. I blinked in surprise. Akina? Um, sure, I said. I guess a good name as any. She nodded and turned to leave. Wait, I said. She paused. Yes, she asked. Why, Akina? I asked her. She turned away and started climbing through the door out of the ship. I guess I wasn't going to get an answer. She paused halfway through. It was my mother's name, she said without looking back. Then she was gone. Her mother? I turned to Volson. Jack just told me the name of her mother, I signed. It's a significant in your culture, she signed back. Ordinarily, no, I admitted, but I think this time it might be. I ran a hand along the wall of the ship. Sleep well, Akina, I said. Come daybreak, you're going to run like the wind. I left the ship and then headed for my cabin in the shantytown for the final time. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 43, written by Sevi Loki. It's hard to compare the majesty of a sunrise to the lattice opening. Sunrises are like watching the horizon giving birth to a dragon. It takes place in stages. From night, there is a transition to false dawn, where the shadows let go of one another and separate into distinct entities. Then, the horizon turns fiery red. The sky and the land are bathed in the blood red. The orb crowns and everything becomes gold as the shadows evaporate in the heat of the new day. The lattice opening, in contrast, is like looking at a vast and intricate machine, which, I suppose, was really the case. But that just underplays how hypnotic it really was. The panels would first separate, the lattice went from being dark sphere to a spiderweb of blazing lines to a series of diamond-shaped panels floating away from one another in all directions. The sphere seemed to double in size in the space of an hour or so. The separation formed the dawn within the sphere. But the lattice didn't just expand, the panels rotated until they were facing outwards. Massive panels that were the size of planets pivoting on an unseen axis and allowing the sunlight to pass unimpeded. It was possible to stare straight up with a dark enough lens. The lattice might be visible during the day. However, as the sunlight effectively blinded anyone gazing upwards, it was as if the lattice were swallowed by the sun itself, only to appear as it contracted in the evening. They're different, but each hypnotic in their own way. As the lattice creaked open to greet the new day, I did my best to resist the temptation to look up and gaze at the giant machinery. That was a good way to lose a couple hours without noticing it. There were a few kin wandering about the early morning, the early risers and the night owls passing each other with polite greetings. Like the others, I had spent the majority of the evening packing supplies into the Akina. Food, clothing, water, the iron slag, just to name a few of the non-lethal items. We had to stop loading from time to time as construction was still taking place at the ship. 
Rubber seals had been placed on the inner and outer door of the ship. The twin doors, one for each hull, created a sort of airlock to enter the ship. Except this airlock didn't depressurize, it just trapped the pocket of air between the two hulls to serve as an insulation while the ship was moving at supersonic speeds. When the doors were open and the gap between them was only slightly wider than that between a screen door and a storm door, so it made it awkward to step in and out of the ship. A small price to pay for what was asking for the ship. So far, no significant leaks had been detected. If the doors were shut and the vents were closed, it's reasonably airtight. At first, for as long as was needed to be. I stepped inside the ship, as always. Valson turned to regard me as I stepped up to her shuttle. She didn't sleep. It was still eerie to think about it. You are early, she signed. Wish to make a call, I said and pointed to the comm console. She looked at it and then back at me. I cannot leave this area, she reminded me. You won't be able to understand me anyway, I signed back. She motioned for me to enter and the shuttle and punched the command into the contact dyer. This is the dyer blade, the ship's clipped tone said in a non-accented chimeric. Identify yourself. His words sounded a bit strange to me without the real-time translations of the symbiote echoing his words inside my head. Volson Jammer seemed to be working. This is Jason, I said. Status report. Greetings, Captain, the ship said. All ship functions were within normal parameters. Scans of the area show no unidentified vessels. Prisoners are contained. Kurt had to the point. You had to admire the chimeric efficiency. Where are you? I asked. Ship is en route to the far side object designated Dyson Sphere to the coordinates you specified in the last communication. I had been transmitting instructions to the ship once a week since it had started construction. Most of the time I just had Volson open up a channel and I shouted at the microphone and never bothered with acknowledgements. Fortunately, Dyer didn't really care if I was polite or not. The ship just followed orders without question. The last time I had sent out instructions, I had asked him to maneuver to the door closest to the ferry and try to open the seal on the door. Considering how fast Dyer could move, I had expected the ship to be already there. Why are you still en route? I asked. Shouldn't you be able to get there a lot faster than that? Affirmative, the ship replied. However, Object Dyson Sphere has activated weapons and began active tracking whenever the ship exceeds one-tenth of a percent of the speed of light when attempting to achieve lower orbit, maintaining wide orbit and low speed to avoid confrontation. I raised my brows. That's, um, showing surprising initiative, I admitted. Usually you follow my instructions to the letter and don't use your own decisions. Apologies, Captain, the ship said. Shall I override safety programming? No, I said. I wasn't complaining. I was impressed. You did exactly the right thing. Silence. Affirmative, Captain, the ship said at last. Whenever Dyer paused before answering, it made me nervous. Anything that made the system that fast hesitate could not be a good sign. Dyer, I said, what's going on? I was just telling you that you're an excellent ship you are. Praise is unnecessary, Captain, the ship replied. I'm just following programming. Your instructions caused a conflict in the existing instructions. A solution was necessitated. Hmm. I got the impression that I was watching a stage magician waving one hand so as to distract my attention away with what was happening in the other hand. It was frustrating, really. Dyer could be so intelligent at times, just... As I thought I was making progress, it suddenly reverted back to a dumb computer mode. It was almost like Dyer was attempting to frustrate me, or, um, or like he was acting dumber than he really was. Jason, these are Chimera. They bend rules until they break. Dyer, I asked patiently, how smart is your computer? System is registered as a Type 3 subsentient synthetic intelligence. I didn't ask you what you registered as, I pointed out. What is your actual intelligence? The comm went quiet. I sighed. They equipped you with an illegal intelligence, didn't they? I asked of the silent comm unit. The Chimera, I mean. Your creators. 
When they created you, they snapped on something that was outlawed by the abdicators. You're smarter than you should be. You probably what turn off parts of your mind most of the time so as to pass inspection. But whatever there is a crisis, you activate that hidden bit of your brain to power and get everyone through the crunch. Sound about right. Silence for a moment and then Dyer spoke up. Captain, the ship said without inflection, communications over open channels may be interrupted as the sphere's mass eclipses your position. Please direct only necessary information while channels are still available. I'm not saying anything over an open channel, was what I heard though. Right, I said. Well, no abjecator should be able to listen in. However, just as an aside, even though I am not on the ship, there is no reason for you to operate in low power mode. You have my full permission to run as many lights on the other facilities that you see fit for the duration of my absence. Acknowledged, the ship replied. If it's possible to unseal the door on the other side of the sphere, I went on, I want you to do whatever it takes. I'm sure if I peruse the library when I eventually get back, I'll find some volume in your collection that had instructions that carefully dictate whatever steps were eventually used so naturally. I'll be sure to look for said book once you tell me where to find it. Plausible deniability, Dyer. Use it. Come on. No hesitation, and then Dyer's voice came back. Affirmative, Captain. The ship replied. No mention if the ship caught my meaning, but uh, perhaps it was just a touch of warmth in the voice. Something beyond the modulations of an artificial voice. Then again, it could have been nothing. Continue the course and try breach the sphere, I repeated, and I'll check in often. Don't let the prisoners get too rowdy. The affirmative. Did I hear a smirk? Nah, couldn't be. I signed off and signed a thank you to Volson. After that, I exited a shuttle and entered the lower compartment of the new airship. The lower compartment was cramped. The boiler that drove the two propellers was the immediate left of the entrance. Volson's shuttle was to the right. To either side of the shuttles were the two cannons. Currently, they were tucked away inside. Likewise, just behind the boiler, which was now cold, were the propellers. The blades were hinged so that they could be folded to take up less space. To deploy the engines, there was a hand crank in front of the boiler that extended the arms with the mounted propellers. The back would open up as these two scissor-like arms pushed the sides out and the propellers would swing out of them. The blades would be unfolded using a lever mechanisms. It was clumsy, and the blades were undersized for the size of the craft, but we hoped to only use these engines as a last resort. On the far wall of the doorway was a hemp ladder that led upwards to the main deck. I climbed up there for now. The main deck was an interesting compromise between weight and space. Because we would be inside for days at a time without stopping, people needed the illusion of privacy if the reality wasn't available. So, there were rooms on the upper deck. Small ones, yes, but rooms nonetheless. The partitioned walls were made out of thin sheets of fabric drawn taut between the floor and the ceiling. The largest room was a common room for dining and social gatherings. There were ten folding chairs tied to the walls with straps. The lightweight vaulting table was placed near them. To the front of the ship was a control room. Two simple chairs and a highly complex control board set before the glass window. Shutters covered the windshield at the moment. Al had told me that they needed to be in place before the ship left the atmosphere and to protect the glass from the pressure difference. To the rear of the ship were the compartments, a narrow corridor bisected with a cloth wall. I walked along and admired the efficient way it used space. The first two compartments were sleeping bunks, three to a side. Hammocks were suspended inside the cloth and poles on either side of serving as an anchor point. A thin stepladder was bolted to the floor beside the sleeping compartments to allow the people to occupy the top bunk's entry. Each bunk offered private enclosure where people could lie in the hammock, and that's about it. The fabric gave some privacy, but not a lot. Six people would sleep in the first two compartments. The next two compartment houses the remaining four bunks. Roomier, but those bunks were also closer to the restroom. Yes, I'd got my wish with internal plumbing. 
Al agreed with the necessity of it when he realized that we'd either be shoving our rears out of the hard vacuum or in supersonic winds for the most of the trip. The restroom itself was little more than another rectangle of fabric surrounded in a sink and another simple toilet. The thing was basically an upturned bucket with a hole cut out in the middle. It worked by using the low pressure of the atmosphere outside the ship to provide suction, which meant that we'd be pretty popular whenever we flew over, I guess. What would happen to human waste at supersonic speeds? Why was I even asking such questions? I turned around and started walking my way back towards the front. The noise from the ladder alerted me that the fact that someone was coming up. I stopped in time to keep from colliding with Lee, who looked surprised to see me, but there and recovered quickly enough, though. Um, he said, I was going to do a pre-flight check and, um, um, I suppose you had the same idea? Something like that, I replied. It was a half-truth. I reasoned that he probably meant pre-flight check with the inspector security issues. I just wanted to see if the ship was empty before it was crammed so sweaty bodies and no shower facilities. He nodded towards me when with just a hint of respect all the same. Apparently, he appreciated the captain with a sense of precaution. He looked up around the corridor and grimaced. I wish I knew more about how it worked, he admitted. I'm not always sure what to look for. I mean, does a bit of wood that is different color mean that it is recently replaced, or what? I shrugged. It really depends, I admitted. There are actually several different types of ironwood out there. Ironwood isn't a specific tree. It's sort of a catch-all for woods that are very, very hard. Or, as it usually is the case, both. Most of the ships is built out of a type of wood that is lightweight but fairly hard. It takes forever to shape it and the stone tools they have here. I don't know what the Earth's name for it is, or even if it exists on Earth, but it's a light-colored wood with a pronounced grain pattern. But there is a darker wood that you see in places where the stress is just too much for irregular beams. If you see the dark wood that looks almost like it's been stained, that is probably a stress point. If you see a red tint to any wood, that is an area with a lot of heat. It's a heat treatment. I stopped talking when I noticed how wide his eyes were. I helped build it, I reminded him. That's brilliant, he exclaimed, and now you're doing the last minute's inspection to see if you've whopped anything out. Um, sure, I said, but the kin are probably in the clear. Yes, he said, possibly, or the abjecates are just good at playing a long con. Besides, there is also the entire city to worry about. How do we know someone didn't sneak in when our backs were turned? You and Jack stood guard the entire time, I reminded him. We can't see everywhere at once, it's still a possibility. So much to my regret, I ended up climbing about and inspecting the inner workings of the ship inch by inch until Lee was satisfied. Some places were so tight that I had to ditch my armor. As I still wasn't sporting any underwear, I just had to hope that Lee would give me a fair warning before the paparazzi showed up. After hours of crawling and climbing through the dirt and grease cake bowels of the ship, Lee was satisfied that we weren't likely to die in case of low-tech sabotage, and I got to put my armor back on and cover my splinter-riddled shame. I was just in time too because Huxon entered the ship a short time later. Game on, she said with a grin as she spotted us. Two men and a whole bunch of empty hammocks, who's for giving the ship a proper christening? We shuffled uncomfortably. Uh, maybe you want to wait until we're underway and ask someone else, I suggested. That way you can go for the record of the world's fastest, um, copulation. I think I already have that record, she said. Guy named Den, muscular guy, looked like he would have stamina. Barely had time to get my trousers down over the ankles before he was done. I looked around the room for the exit and I could use to escape the conversation. There was none. Of course, she said thoughtfully, this might be a record for covering the most distance. I'll see if Reynolds is up for it. Please be celibate, Reynolds, I thought. The problem wasn't with Hookson's attractiveness, more her aggressiveness. Her merfolk, the species, didn't seem to have an official name. There were a lot of unofficial ones, usually involving profane suggestions with fish and other aquatic wildlife. 
Apparently, did not have many of the same hang-ups as the other hominids did. Apparently, there were some key environmental cues needed before pregnancy was possible, and prior to make contact with the sphere at large, their community had a very few diseases that could be transmitted sexually. Those that did tended to be of the uncomfortable variety rather than being outright lethal. They took their precautions, but there wasn't as much of an implied threat by not strictly adhering to them. Which, I suppose, is why there are only known species of hominids that invented the prophylactic before the wheel. The point is that the merfolk were either more liberated or outright slutty depending on who you asked. They treated sex as one more type of social interaction. There was even an equivalent of Emily Post's guide as to when it was polite to respond with sex and to what type. Although I'm not a prude, I found myself feeling distinctly uncomfortable whenever Hookson dis discussed matters of fornication as she was addressing some sort of board game that she might be available to kill the time. As much as I wanted to cheer at the idea of reasonably attractive women being that open about the topic, the truth was that a lifetime of indoctrination were hard to shake off. Hookson intimidated me and, from Lee's expression, I guess she did the same for him. Or maybe she didn't and it was the professor that he was worried about. I decided not to pry. Hookson wore the ship's armor and had a leather satchel hung over her shoulder. The satchel had to have passed whatever weight limits Heather had given us. I knew better than to ask what was inside. Guess I'll just find a bunk and make the best of it. Want me to leave the curtain open so you can watch? No, I responded, but most definitely did not shout that answer. She strolled off without another word and took one of the first six bunks. Noises from below alerted me to the fact that someone else was climbing the ladder. Slowly this time. A moment later, Heather poked her helmeted head up and through the hole and scrambled onto the deck. She passed by without saying a word and took another at the first bunks. She was studying her maps. Lee raised an eyebrow at me. I shook my head in response. Let her go, Lee. Let her be rude. We all cope in our own ways. Random security checks, obsessive mapping, and, of course, whatever the hell Rookson was doing behind closed curtains that seemed to involve a lot of furious movement. I am not one to pass judgment. Lee and I adopted positions alongside the opening and waited for the next crew member as it was now painfully obvious that they were all awake now and were ready to begin the trip. We silently agreed to greet each newcomer. The twins arrived next. I still couldn't tell them apart, truth be told. Remember the names? I usually just thought of them as Humpty and Dumpty. But they entered the ship, mouthed identical nonsensical greetings, and shambled towards one corner of the room. Unlike the others, they didn't appear to feel the need for privacy or sleep. The professor entered a moment later. She smiled brilliantly at Lee and then shot me a smile with only slightly less enthusiasm. She was on the first time I saw who seemed genuinely to be looking forward to the trip. She had a leather pouch slung over one shoulder, but rather than take it to her room, she carried it forward to the control room. As we watched, she opened the bag and began stacking leather-bound books inside an empty compartment up front. Her dictionaries and phrase books, I realized. I had heard that the professor had been working on a few useful language guides. I wasn't sure if there was a point, as by now, probably the entire crew had been infected with the symbiote save for Summer, who seemed to try and bite anyone who got so close to her face. Still, language did not seem to be a large hurdle. Then again, maybe they weren't for us. It's hard to know what the professor was thinking at times. The professor busied herself as Reimer and Reynolds climbed the ladder. Permission to come aboard, Reynolds said with a smirk. You are already aboard, I pointed out. He jerked his head into the control room. Yes, we'll take our seats then. He and Raima trudged over to the control room and pushed past the professor to take their seats. They wouldn't be able to control anything from there except for the entire emergencies. Both just wanted to be next to the controls if that emergency came up. More thumping from below, and I looked down and I saw Scrake climbing up the ladder and grunting with the effort. She was using one arm to climb up the ladder while the other was towing a rope. Scrake wore no armor. Instead, she wore a floor-length sky-blue dress that left her arms bare. 
She took a moment to catch her breath before she tugged on the rope. A disheveled head followed her. So empty it fills me with screams, Summer muttered as she pulled herself up. Summer was wearing a canvas shirt and sleeves way too long for that laced up back. The straight jacket with arms undone. She I had mentioned the idea of passing it to the kin. They had readily constructed one for us. I could see that the rope Scrake carried was tied to Summer's waist. This way, love, Scrake said cheerfully and tugged the rope in the direction of the bunks. Scrake installed Summer in one of the larger bunks. It had previously been agreed upon that all of us that Summer would get one of the larger bunks, because if we needed to restrain her, there would be more room for us to gather around and hold it down. There was an implication that whomever got the remaining three large bunks would be the first responders in Summer's crisis. As I watched Scrake untie the rope from Summer's waist and fasten the sleeves behind the girl's back, Summer did not protest. This and seemed calmly resigned to it. Then all white making direct contact with me, Scrake stepped away from Summer and climbed to the top third bunk in front. The buck had been passed. No wonder everyone seemed so eager to claim a bunk. I got the distinct impression that if Lee and I didn't move now before the others caught on, we'd be the final three bunks. I heard the door close from Bahalo and followed by a soft murmuring. Jack was talking to Volson. Jack always vocalized while signing for some reason. She climbed the ladder and looked at me. Ship secured and the tethers have been released, she told me. Volson is readying us for takeoff. With that, she walked past me to the bunks. She pushed past the first set and took the lower bunk directly opposite Summer. Summer smiled at Jack, and Jack smiled back politely. Brave girl. There was a muted vibration on the floorboards followed by the sense of disorientation. It was like I had been knocked at both balance for a moment. Then it passed and, other than a subtle hum and sensation of some sort of electric charge in the air, I felt as if I was standing still. I glanced out of the windshield and immediately regretted it. The world was weeding by outside at a dizzying pace. We lifted upwards while spinning at the same time. Volson had applied the suppressive force fields to much of the craft as she could. The idea was similar to Star Trek's inertial dampeners. The force fields pushed matter to the counteract the cushion effects of acceleration. For some odd reason in Star Trek, that means that you could accelerate a hundred ton ship at the speeds exceeding the speed of light in a fraction of a second, while keeping everyone inert inside. But if someone so much as sneezed on the deflector shields the wrong way, everybody was thrown around the ship wildly. Wilson's force field seemed to have overcome that particular design flaw as, as, other than some almost subliminal ships in the orientation of gravity, there was almost no sense of movement. I saw out of the windshield and we were now over the ocean. In a matter of minutes we had reached the dinosaur oasis and were zooming high above it. We had picked one direction that we were almost certain that the symbiote had not gone. Presumably, no one was desperate enough to lock lips with an Allosaurus. Probably. I'm pretty sure if there was such an obsession as Dinophilia as it was probably a self-limiting one. Despite the fact that we were now cruising over the dinosaur oasis, I couldn't see any of the animals. Mostly because we were going too fast. Incredibly fast, we hadn't even broken the sound barrier yet and everything below us was little more than a green and brown blur. A shrinking green and brown blur at that. This would be our first chance to use the in-system engines. This would be the point when they were in the best shape and mostly charged, which meant that they would also be the point where they could be the longest burn. All 45 minutes rather than 30 minute burn of later jaunts. Volson was trying to get us up high enough for her to engage the engines. For that, she apparently needed speed. A lot of it. The ship lifted higher and higher, and I heard the creaking from the deck below me. The pressure changed and affected the ship, however. It held. We were doing okay for the moment. The sky grew darker and darker, and for the first time, I was really getting my first-hand view of how large the sphere really was. We all gawked at what we saw. It was like looking at an enormous patchwork quilt wrapped around a star. Beautiful, stunning, breathtaking. Jason, 
so naturally someone had to speak to and break the spell. I sighed and turned to face Jack. She looked worried. Yes, Jack? I asked. I just thought of something, she said quickly. We flew over the dinosaur oasis because of the war in the other sections, right? Right, I said. We don't want to go into a compact area if we can avoid it. What if that was the point, though? She said quickly. What if the abjectors didn't stir up the war to ambush us or but herd us into a particular direction? I just stared at her stupidly for a moment before I made an executive decision. Ah, crap, I shouted and jumped for the hatch that led to Volson shuttle. There was another one of those lurchers like I had reached the top of the flight of stairs and then tried to place my foot in the phantom extra step. The land outside blurred into a streak. We were off. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 44, written by Semi Loki. I had traveled faster before, of course. For months I had rode on Dyer as the ship bounced up and down at near light speed. Prior to that, I had rode on Quark's ship with the cycle back and forth between Metaspace. Even the shuttle ride to the Sphere had taken place at faster speeds. But all of those times I had been in space and possibly unconscious. There was a difference between seeing stars drift by lazily and seeing the ground become a blue-tinted blur racing towards you. I froze. There was almost no sense of movement, a shift in the way the force field pressing against us. Maybe it was a slight sting, mostly disorienting coming from watching the sphere's curve lurch towards us. I staggered towards the ladder. I wasn't that I was any heavier, but my movements felt strange, like I was wading through a clear syrup. The force fields were struggling to compensate, I guess. Clumsily, I climbed down onto the ladder. Was it swinging slightly in the rear? Painfully slow, I climbed downwards. Volson was moving at a frantic pace inside. She darted from one side of her control table to the other with a nervous energy. I was reminded of Doctor Who episodes where the Doctor would make the similar run around the console of the TARDIS as he struggled for control. Something was wrong. She glanced in my direction and she gave me a reassuring sign. No, nothing was wrong. She expected this. Her shuttle was just more badly damaged than she let on. She watched the warning lights and made a minute adjustments here and there as she darted around the table. I couldn't be sure, but I thought that some systems that were supposed to be regulated automatically now required her full attention for manual control. If she had been a human, she would have been kicking it as well. As she wasn't. Those zigzagging arms of hers just danced lightly over the table as she ran from one end to the other. She never looked my way again. I couldn't warn her, I realized. I could shout, maybe, get her to pause long enough for me to signal that we were being herded, but driving her attention away like that was a risk. Even if I didn't know what she could do, did she still retain enough control to steer the ship at those speeds? I guess not far from her movements. Going in a straight line was taxing her abilities. Even if she could, I realized, where would we go? Until we knew what the trap was or how far it extended, we were just guessing. Steering the ship to another point would slow us down and possibly do nothing to avoid the problem. I placed my back against the wall and slid down to the floor to think. The abjectors seemed to be playing us still. If Jack was right, and I had a sneaky suspicion that she was, then they probably had a spy in the ken after all, which meant that they were all aware of our ship's peculiar limits. If that was the case, then there was something in this direction that wanted us to run into. But what? It couldn't be the army that had been set to ambush us. They could only influence a small number of people. Enough to get a wide-scale riot, I could believe. But coordination? That seemed doubtful. Besides, even at the top speeds, the symbiote had only had a few months to ex expand away from Newtown. An airship at top speed might be 50,000 miles or so. Big deal. Our first hop would clear that easily by almost a factor of 10. Even then, we wouldn't stop. We'd drop out of cruising speed for over 900 miles per hour for five days and then make another hop, followed by another and another. Five scheduled hops broken up into 20 slower days, which put us right around the midpoint of the sphere. 
Okay, so maybe there was something at the midpoint that we should be wary of, but how would they know what it was? They couldn't influence anyone that far out, and the natives only knew about rumors from here. Unless... Unless... It was something that was put in place from before, when the abjugators came and the Camaro were both working at this place. I felt sick to my stomach. A defense system, something that they thought they could stop us. What was going on here, the abjugators first wanted me to come here, but now that I was here they seemed determined to kill me. They wanted me here to help them establish a foothold, but there was also something they did not want me to see. It was confusing. I needed more information to go on. I felt like I was playing a game of chess blindfolded against an opponent who could see the entire board. I was guessing, stumbling around, I wasn't even sure that the defenses were at the midway point. For all I knew, we were flying directly into the path of a giant laser system that was actively targeting us. But the midway point sounded right for some reason. If I were trying to protect something inside the sphere, I'd do what the Chimera had done, put it as far away from the opening as possible, and try to contain any invaders. Contain. Contain. I felt the press of the force field. Ah, hell. Wilson, I shouted. I glanced in my direction. I was butchering her name, of course, but she looked at me. I pointed downwards. She was confused and looked back at her table. Damn it, she didn't get it. Valson! I shouted again. Again, she looked up, and I pointed downwards. She seemed confused. She touched the table. What's the problem? She asked. She had deactivated the jammer. She couldn't spare the focus to sign with me. She looked back at the table and doubted around it. Fine, I could deal with this. False field, I shouted at her. Defensive systems to repel invaders. We need to get... The entire ship shook. My stomach lurched and Volson scrambled madly. Get in here, she shouted at me. Touch the points with a high-energy matrix and shift it until it is in stable region. What? Use your helmet, she shouted back. I had forgotten I was wearing it. I shifted the color spectrum and watched her hands. Soon enough I saw it. There were peaks of energy spiking off the table. Whenever an area turned the color of an angry bruise, Volson touched the spike and shoved it downwards until it turned to a dull orange color. A violet spike appeared near me. I put one glove, hand, and the tip of the press downwards. The spike seemed to resist for the first, but then settled down. Volson's body language shifted to a more relaxed posture. My action had been correct. Another spike appeared and I slammed it down as well. Compensating, she said. There was a shudder from outside. Hitting atmosphere, she said. The resistance will slow us down. I soothed under another spike. What's going on? I asked. You were correct, she said. A defense system is in place to prevent interstellar engines from operating within the sphere. A force field was projecting outwards from the lattice. From the lattice? I stammered. Why there? Maximum vantage point from line of sight, she said. However, we seem to be hitting a corona of this field only. The field is weak here. So we can punch through it? I asked. Our craft is also weak, she pointed out. If I move us into the fringe of the atmosphere, I believe I can deflect the remaining field strength with our force fields. But uh, if we do that, then we'll put additional strain on the system. How much strain? I asked. She considered my question. I stamped down on two more spikes as she thought about it. I believe I can still keep the system from exploding before we reach Ferry, she said, but our return trip may be problematic. One crisis at a time, I said. I could have pointed out that I was having to die and look into opening the door at the far side, but I kept the fact to myself for a moment. I didn't think an abjugator was listening in, but I didn't want to risk it. Wait, did she say exploding? Exploding, I squeaked. She pointed a digit where I was pressing down on another violet spike. Your efforts are to keep the system from becoming a both balance and... Never mind, I said. Just get us out of this mess safely. She fell quiet as her hands tapped on the various points of the table. I continued to balance the system and the shudder settled down. 
That has compensated for much of it, she said. We have lost some forward momentum, but I think we should still arrive approximately on schedule. Great, I muttered. Is there a way to keep from tripping the defenses? No, she answered. It seems to be automatically target any craft that is outside the atmosphere and traveling at relativistic speeds. I have tried hailing any automated systems to see if they could talk to them. I received no response. I groaned. So we're going to have to fly there at the very edge of the atmosphere, I asked. The field apparently needs approximately 15 minutes to charge up, she said, and from there it takes an additional 7 minutes to arrive, she said. If we spend the first 21 minutes about the atmosphere and then drop this altitude for the duration, that should provide us the optimum speed and security. Fortunately, the fields appear to be designed for ships traveling much faster and further away from the surface. In essence, our very floors are our greatest protection. Funny how that works, I said grudgingly. Can you turn that jammer back on now? I'm sort of nervous about who might be overhearing. She touched the table and I felt a weird dullness behind my ears. She was blocking the symbiote again. I worked on stamping out the fields while she flew the craft silently for the next ten minutes or so. After a while I felt a ship shudder once more and the whining sound that I hadn't been aware of settled down. The purple spikes appeared before me before I could even reach its peak. It settled down on its own. I looked up. Volson was signing. We are at cruising speed once more, she signed, in system engines recharging. I signed a warning at her. Abjectors have herded us in this direction. I sighed, possibly a defense system. She pointed at my helmet. Lookers, she asked. Lookers? Oh, scanners. I activated my long-range scanners. Hills and grasslands were flying by below, and I didn't detect any threats. No threats, I said. My lookers see no threats either, she said. Hidden, maybe. Your suit is bad people made, though. Maybe it will be identified their defenses. She didn't have the word for chimera. Bad people made as much as sense as anything, I guess. It was a good idea, I decided. I will have Heather do it, I said. She's making maps anyway. Molson seemed to think about something. Can help next time we go fast, she asked. Yes, I agreed. I will be here. Her body seemed to loosen up. There was a bit of asymmetry to it. She was pleased. Thank you, I said. Thank you, she agreed. I climbed the ladder. What in the name of... I heard Lee shout as my head crested the hatch. He reached down and grabbed my arm and tugged me upwards with enough force that I nearly levitated the last few rungs. Defensive system, I grunted as I landed and flashed him a smile. Thanks for the assist. It was meant to create a solid wall for any fast-moving ships to smash against. He let out a low whistle. How did we escape that? he asked. It was projected from the lattice, I said. It got too weak thus close to the surface, and we managed to push through the last little bit. He frowned. Is this going to be a problem? I nodded in agreement, and he rolled his eyes. Great, he muttered as he drew out a word. Jack ran up a moment later, looking wide-eyed and concerned. I tried to look reassuring, but this just caused her to narrow her eyes suspiciously. We tripped one defense, I told her. It looks like it might have happened, regardless of which way we went. So if the abjectors were up to something, she began. We still don't know what it is, I agreed. Her shoulders slumped. She did not like that at all. I pushed past her and to the bunks and stuck my head where Heather's hammock hung. Heather, I asked. Busy, she said without removing her helmet. I need you to run long-range scanners as well, I said. Look for Chimera Tech. I think we might be heading towards a defensive system. Yeah, right, she said with a snort. I didn't answer. She lifted her visor and looked at me. You serious? she asked incredulously. I nodded. Do you realize how much power I'm already burning through, she asked. It's going to be a year before I can really recharge this thing at this rate, and if you have me burn through that much power, I'm going to be helpless in two months. We'll swap out power cores before then, I said. Spread the load out, even more armor. She frowned. That's a stopgap, she warned, not a solution. If we're all burned out and helpless when it comes to crash time, we're worse off than if just one of us was out of commission. It was a good point. 
but I wasn't in the mood to argue. We're swapping power packs, I declared. Let me know when you reach halfway mark and we'll swap you out with one that is most full after that. We'll keep rotating them off to the line. She shrugged without rising from the hammock. Activating the long-range scanner, she said. And what should I do if I find something? Call me. I said, scream if you have to. I don't like this, and I want to get as much of a heads up as we can get. You're the boss. Why did she have to go and say it in such a sarcastic manner? I left her bunk and went back to find my own. I needed to think, and a bit of privacy, I hoped, would help with that. As it turned out, I would spend a lot of the next few days on that bunk. We all spent much of our days in our bunks. People often underestimated just how much danger boredom can really be. Even the most sharp-witted of person feels the keenness start to dull. Health and fitness decline. We aren't a species designed for idleness. When we find it, we start to wither. There was little room in the ship to do much of anything. Huxon may have been willing to offer some distraction if someone had approached her about it, but surprisingly, no one seemed interested in that idea. Instead, for the next month, the most precious item on the entire ship came in the form of a six-foot piece of hemp rope. I have no idea where Lee found the rope, or just a scrap from the cargo hold. Extra material for a tether, none of us knew. We just knew that one morning, just before the lattice opened, we were all awakened by the sound of a rhythmic stomping. The sound came from below the decks but seemed to originate right at the site of the batch itself. All of us climbed out of our hammocks that morning to investigate. We found Lee standing on the lower deck, just below the opening of the hatch, leaping in place with a rope whirling around him. He had tripped down to a pair of shorts, his armor laying in a neat pile on one side. Sweat glistened off his body as well as accompanying odor. He was jumping rope in the only spot in the entire ship that offered enough clearance to permit such a feat. This is how bored I was. I sat there at the edge of the hatch, watching a sweaty man skip a rope for a good twenty minutes, as it was the first real entertainment I had experienced in several days. As soon as the rope finally whipped to a stop, and Lee turned to put it away, he was greeted with a chorus of, Wait! I want to turn! And looked up. There were five people crowded around the hatch staring down at him. We took turns skipping rope after that. The shift of who had the control over the jump rope was our biggest distraction as the ship warped across space, dipping low into the atmosphere for supersonic rest and then bounced back up. During the jaunts above the atmosphere, I could at least find a brief reprieve in stomping the violet spikes with Volson. Then I made the mistake of answering someone honestly as to what I was doing and suddenly we had to take turns with that too. Since we were only scheduled for 11 jumps and I had used the first three for myself, I didn't take much math to realize that I wouldn't get another turn. I said I laid in my hammock and tried to think of a plan. I turned the problem and the educators over and over in my mind so much that it may as well have been a roasting on the spit. I couldn't figure it out. Why this direction? We were moving too fast for people or animals to stop us. Was it geography? A large mountain range. No, we got over that. A volcano could be dealt with with a similar manner. If there were volcanoes. No, whatever was being planned had to be something that could affect a fast-moving ship, but was confined to one area. So, what? A missile, perhaps. I thought about it as much as my head started to hurt. I couldn't sleep at night due to worrying and trying to guess what was enormous minds beyond human comprehension might be up to. It's no excuse, I know, but I feel that I have to explain what was going through my head and how much the boredom, the inactivity, and the constant fretting were driving me crazy. So, I did something stupid. As was typical of times when I wasn't skipping rope, I had a pair of shorts for that time. Incidentally, I was wearing my armor. I even slept in it in my hammock. I was laying there stretched out and wishing to sleep or something when I remembered the berserker drug of the armor. Did that mean that the armor offered other drugs as well? It had been some thinking clearly I might have talked it over with a former drug addict in our crew, but as it was, I thought something might make me sleep would be a good thing. 
I called up the Bolton Pharmaceuticals and found a concoction that was designed for long voyages in confined spaces. Let's hear it for custom tailored chemicals, people. According to the file, this drug, simply labeled Simpax, was designed to elicit a sense of calm. It relaxed the body and put the mind into a dreamy state that suppressed any feelings of claustrophobia. The effect would last for a few hours and then wear off. It was non-habit-forming, non-addictive, and a good jolt of adrenaline was usually enough to clear it from the system in an emergency. Sounded pretty harmless, right? So, I ordered the armor to administer it to me. For the first five minutes, nothing happened. I felt just as keyed up as the invisible gun sight strained upon me. Then slowly, I despite myself, I started to relax, bit by bit. I felt less worried, more calm, more reserved. The confining walls my punk suddenly seemed further away, and no longer in a cloth cage, was barely bigger than my own body. I was floating in the middle of a red billowing cloud. I smiled. I felt good. For the first time in weeks, I felt good. Thump, 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 thump. Someone was jumping rope. I decided that sounded like something fun to watch. I half floated and swam to the ten mile gap between my hammock and the flap from forming the boundary of my bunk. I stepped out and saw a canyon stretching up before me. I wasn't scared. I didn't fear the height at all. I was just surprised at how wide it really was. Had this really seemed tiny to me just a short while ago? I drifted down to the bottom of the valley of fabric and began walking along the winding path that led to the hatch. It felt like it should take a long time to reach the hatch. I might have to stop and camp for the night along the way. But somehow, I find myself moving at a dizzying speed. I arrived in time to find a person below still exercising. It was the professor. Time had slowed as well. I could see the individual fibers of the rope as it sliced through the air below me. Professor Malachi's sweat glistened and head bobbed up and down in slow motion. The light refracted along the beads of sweat like tiny jewels. She wore a tight-fitting shorts and a local equivalent of a sports bra. A wide bandage of cloth stretched around her chest twice before it was tied off at the back. Both shorts wrap were grey in colour and dark in her sweat. Her bare feet seemed to hover above the ground before sinking in as if she was suspended in air. She was beautiful, I thought. Had I noticed that before? Hi, someone said. The voice was too deep to be hers, so I thought it might have been me. She broke rhythm of the rope and glanced up at me. Hi yourself, she said, smiling. What are you doing? Watching that voice, probably my own, said. Her smile broadened. I can see that, she said. There was something knowing in her gaze. She seemed to be able to read something in me. I think I'm stoned, I admitted. I can see that as well, she said. Are you going to move aside? You're beautiful, I told her. Thank you, she said. Could you move so that I could get back up there? I sat backwards and let her move out of the room to climb up. You're so beautiful, I'd sleep with your brother, I told her. That's sweet, she said and shot me a worried smile. Of course, I said. Lee might want him too. Do you have a brother? Let's get you back to your bunk, the professor said, and she bent down to help me to my feet. We'll get you tucked in nice and cozy, and then Lee can murder you in your sleep. I smiled as uh, she hooked her hand around my armpits. It looked a moment for the words to register. Even then, I didn't panic. I was just confused. What? I asked as I struggled to stand up. I said, we all hate you, and you want you dead. She said sweetly. I looked her in the eye. She was smiling, but only on her lips. Her eyes looked concerned. What was going on? You all want what? She looked confused. You're worthless, Jason, she said. End it now and save us the trouble. I still wasn't panicking, but something was wrong here. Her lips didn't seem to move in time with her words. I pushed away from her. No, I said, that's not. How can you say that about me? She took a step closer, with her hands stretched out to me, as if trying to stop me from falling. Her skin split open, and a snake-like tentacle reached out for me. I narrowly ducked out of the way as the barbed end swung at my eyes. A drop of poison glimmering from the tip. I was still calm. No, I said, I won't let you kill me. 
Focus, Jason. Another person said, This voice was younger. A child, a little boy's. I looked to the side and saw a small, dark-haired boy sitting astride a red tricycle. I recognized the kid, of course, but it had been over twenty years since I'd last seen him. Even then, I'd only been in the mirror. Man, I really loved the tricycle then. Focus, the kid repeated. It's the abjugators. The abjugators, I repeated. The professor was gone. In her place was a strange amalgam of fangs, tentacles, and scorpion tails, all arranged without rhyme or reason. It was a mix of taxidermist nightmare creature. The monster paused and barbled at me as her unfinished lips and blood filled its lungs. Your symbiote, the boy told me, it can still partially work. If enough abjugators focus on your defenses and compromise, they can break in. Break in. My symbiote, I said. Then, I understood. Crap, my symbiote had unfinished links. They had used them before. My subconscious said that he turned them off and, yeah, I hadn't heard them again while awake, but I was majorly stoned now. I swung my head around looking for the hatch. Need to get to Volson, I said. The jam, the signal. Shake off the drug and you'll be fine, the kid said. Can't get... Scared, I said. Need a jolt of adrenaline. But not working. Not scared. You're still dosing yourself, the kid told me. You've made the armor give you five times the recommended dosage. Every time you start to panic, it hits you again. The abjugators are going to make you do something stupid or make you OD at this rate. No, I need... I need to get the shuttle. Where's the hatch? I don't know. The kid told me with a sad shake of his head. The drug is blinding my senses too. Drop to the floor, feel your way along. Which way is the floor? I asked in panic. But then, just as soon as the panic started, it faded away. Crap! Six doses. What were the abjugators doing with my mind? Adrenaline, I said. Then the shuttle, if I fall down the hatch, pain. Adrenaline. I took a step in the direction I thought the hatch might be. I hit something soft instead, something soft and warm. Then I couldn't breathe. Something was covering my mouth. I would have panicked, but the drug kept me from doing so. Besides, it felt sort of nice, almost like another mouth. I forced my eyes open and saw waves of dark hair crashing past my head. Heather. I whirled my eyes to focus. The hallucination wouldn't go away. I was on the receiving end of a deep and passionate kiss by Heather. There are some things that can get a heart and dead man racing. Adrenaline flooded my system. The room slammed back into normal, confining space, and I found myself inches from the hatch on my knees. Heather's lips pulled away from my own. That did it? she asked. I thought the question was directed at me. The professor answered instead. He isn't rocking on the edge of the hatch mumbling about abjugators, she said thoughtfully. I think he's okay. He said something about adrenaline clearing the system. You must have surprised him. What in the... I was surprised again as the slap landed across my face. What the hell? I gasped. Just making sure, Heather said as she withdrew her hand. Now can you tell us what's going on? I looked down the hatch. Gather the others and meet me in Volson shuttle, I murmured. Right now, I can't trust myself. End... Of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 45, written by Sebi Loki. I stood just inside the threshold of Volson Shuttle and waited for the others to gather. For once, the strange sense of numbness I felt from the active jammer seemed almost comforting. I knew my symbiote was not active. I hoped that that meant that we were safe from the abjugators. Heather and the professor dropped down the hatch almost at the same time. They were both wearing full armor again. It was weird that I was in touch disappointed. Okay, the professor was practically old enough to be my grandmother, and as far as I could tell, she and me were pretty much an item. But, come on, it had been months since I had access to the internet and a steady supply of lotion. I was going crazy here. Yeah, I know, I am a horrible human being. So what? Maybe I should ask the armor if there was anything in the pharmaceuticals that could take the horns off the goat, so to speak. On second thought, that was probably a bad idea considering recent events. Thanks for snapping me out of it. 
I greeted Heather as she waited with the others together. She shrugged. The professor said that you were mumbling something about needing a jolt of adrenaline to sober up. Heather said, You've been in the hots for me since at least 11th grade, so I thought fulfilling one of your fantasies might do the trick. And the horns fought off the goat. 11th grade, the professor asked, and he's never made a move. I think at Kenny Workman's New Year event, he party he tried, Heather said thoughtfully, but honestly he was so drunk that he may have just been confused. The hornless goat proceeded to lower its dangly bits into a bear trap and emasculate itself. Can we change the topic, please? I stammered. The professor looked at me. I'm sorry, she said. We're just trying to pass the time. Besides, based on what you said, I thought I should pass the word on to my brother that you're interested in him. Oh, really? Heather asked, perking up. No wonder he's been taking my time. I guess I should feel bad about forcing myself upon him like that. I'm not gay, I shouted. No need to get defensive, Heather said with a placating tone. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not ashamed. Your face is red. Well, you two keep speculating on my sexual habits and humiliating me. It's hard not to. I trailed off with this thought struck me. Adrenaline, I asked. It was the professor who turned to shrugged. We wanted to be sure that you were completely sober, she confessed. I sighed and rubbed my head. I'm sober, I said. Can we stop now? But it was just getting interesting, Jack said as she stopped down the hatch. I felt my chicks blaze hotter. How long? I stammered. Kind of a personal question, Lee said, dropping in. Just because you plan on marrying my future brother-in-law does not mean that I have to answer that. A marriage proposal? So soon, Professor Cood. Lee nodded. We can just leave Jason perform the ceremonies, he said. Then you can give him the bouquet. Knock it off, I snarled. Oh, come on, Heather said with a chuckle. This has been a pretty boring trip so far. You can't hold it against us. We're enjoying the first entertainment we've had in days. I almost killed Professor, I told them. Now we were all sober. What? Lee asked as he stepped forward to place himself between me and Madakai. It seemed to be an almost subconscious move. I balled my fists, but did my best to keep my voice steady. I was hallucinating, I said, and I was seeing things and hearing things. She was, um, telling me how you all wanted me to die. I couldn't hold their eyes and looked away. Why would you believe that? Jack asked suddenly. I wasn't thinking clearly, I said. I took a drug that was supposed to just relax me and help make the days less draining. But the abjugators tried to get in my mind and mess with my head again. And, Jack asked, I still didn't look up. I was going for the hatch, I said. I tried to get down there to shut them up. That's when Heather, well, the girl supposedly had a crush on me. How was I supposed to admit that one of her friends snapped me out of the crazed hallucination with the magic of a kiss? I heard someone step forward and I glanced up to see if I needed to brace myself for a punch. It was Jack. She looked puzzled. Okay, she said. You knew it was the abjugators then, I nodded. My other self showed up to warn me, I admitted. She shook her head. That's what tipped you off, she asked. She seemed almost disappointed. Look, I said. I screwed up and took something that I wasn't supposed to, and the abjugators tried to mess with my head. I'm sorry, and... Jason, she interrupted. Shut up. I clamped my jaws shut. I looked up enough to see her eyes. I expected anger disappointment. I didn't expect to see amusement. Jason, she said, will you stop being an idiot for a moment? I said I took it because... Not the drug, she said patiently. We'll talk about that later. She shifted her eyes quickly in Lee's direction. I glanced his way and he didn't seem to be angry either. Sympathetic, actually. I looked at all their faces. No anger anywhere. The professor looked puzzled. Heather looked a bit sad, but none of them seemed to feel any malice towards me. Why did that surprise me? What was wrong with me? You're being an idiot right now, Jack went on. You did not almost try to kill the professor. But I was hearing her say these awful things and she turned into a monster. I spotted it so I... Ran for the hatch to get the shuttle to jam the signal, Jack asked. I shut my mouth. You knew the abjugators were inside your head. The professor added, and you tried to get them out the only way you knew how. You were confused and disoriented, and probably would have broken your neck falling down that hatch. 
Sounds a lot like you were trying to protect her, Lee finished. I stared at them. Heather snickered. See, she said. I looked up. The comment wasn't directed at me, but to Jack. I told you he was an idiot, Heather said. Jack shook her head. A brave idiot, she agreed. A noble idiot. An idiot who flashes of genius that still surprised me. But an idiot. Um, I said. Lee stepped forward and gripped my shoulder. Shut up and just accept that we like you, he suggested. It's easier that way. Some of the humiliation that had been lingering seemed to melt away just a bit. Thank you, I said to them, and I meant it too. Lee stepped back and shook his head. Your other self rescued you again, he asked. Nine nodded. Yeah, except this time he showed up as a six-year-old me on a tricycle, I said with a smile. Everyone except the professor smiled at that one. Lee caught her eye. Something on your mind, Lee asked her. Not sure, she said, still frowning. Just seems out of character for what we've heard about this other Jason. I wonder if it was really the other Jason. You think he's got another personality in there? Lee asked in mock horror. The professor smiled. Hardly, she said. I was just thinking that maybe he wasn't so far gone as he thought. Maybe he had enough sense still left to fight off the influence and reminded himself who his friends are. Jack beamed at the idea. There you go, she said with a firm nod. You shook yourself out of it. No chance in the world that you'd hurt people you love. Love. I almost jumped out of my skin now that the word had been tossed out, but no one else seemed to notice, so I tried to play cool. Okay, I said while exhaling. The question is, Lee added, why did they bother? I looked at him confused. They steered us this way, right? He said. Why try and kill us now that we're going the way they will want? Opportunity? Heather asked. Maybe they saw an opening and decided to take it. Lee shook his head. Unlikely. They seemed to like to play the long game. If they had kept quiet, and Jason would probably have doped himself up again and again. They could attack when it benefited them the most. By showing their hand now, they are just let us know that they shore up defenses. I chewed at my lip. Lee was just guessing, but at least where military matters were concerned, I was inclined to trust his instincts. They're fighting, I said at last. One group is sending us this way, and the other group is trying to stop us. Jack frowned. The abjectors use other races to fight their battles, she said. This seems a bit too hands-on for them. They don't have much control over the human race, I pointed out. They had to work at it to influence me, and I had to be in a weakened state. They just can't aim us like a gun. Something in that statement bothered me. Like I had said something important and missed it, I tried to review it again. I was interrupted. But we assumed that they were sending us into a trap, the professor pointed out. Getting us now or there, what's the difference? Maybe... Maybe it's not a trap that we're headed for, I said. Maybe there's something in this direction we're supposed to see. They looked at me. Now that I said it, the idea seemed pretty stupid to me. What the hell could we see traveling at supersonic speeds? Okay, I said. Maybe it's like a game to them, and where we die is more important. Skeptical looks again. Fine, I said. What ideas do you guys have? Coming up with ideas is your job, Heather pointed out. I glared at her. No, really, she said. You're the best at coming up with this stuff. We'd be stuck a hundred times over if it wasn't for you. The others nodded. I tried to force myself to smile. This was a night of conflicting emotions. Okay, I said. So you guys don't hate me. You still need me, and I'm not such a big idiot after all. You're still an idiot, Lee countered. But that just means that you're one of us. And the smiled at the comment. Okay, I said, but in all seriousness, what are we supposed to do? The abjectors have an in with us, and... And they would wait until you compromised yourself to the point that you couldn't fight them off, Jack pointed out. So the answer seems to be not that they get stoned again. Think you can handle that? Now I shot a glare at her. Yes, I said, I am never touching that stuff again. She shrugged. So where's the problem, she asked. The problem is that they tried to get in and kill us. Not exactly a game changer, is it, she asked. They've been trying that for a while. I started to reply to that, but something stopped myself. She had a point. Okay, I said, but now we know that my symbiote can be hacked by them. 
Don't use either, she interrupted. He only had your other self's word that it was taken care of offline. If he's not any smarter than you, we had no reason to believe him. Blunt and to the point. Okay, I said, but still, that means we can't trust me because I can be influenced. No, you can't, Jack said patiently. They tried. They pumped you full of drugs and you still fought them off. You're not more risk than any other guy in the rest of the crew. Probably less so. I found myself getting annoyed for some reason. Fine, I counted. So is there anything about this that you think she has cause for concern? Yes, Jack admitted with a yawn. Why Miss College Professor over there felt the need to wake the rest of us up when you were having a bad trip. We just needed a shock of adrenaline for crying out loud. Kissing him or slap him or flash a boob or something. Just let me sleep. With that, Jack, our security officer, climbed up the ladder and away from us. I just don't understand her, I confessed. Madakai patted me on the shoulder. She's becoming a woman, she told me, and you don't understand any of them. With that, the professor and Lee climbed the ladder. I thought I heard her joke that the next time Lee should try kiss me to sober me up, to which Lee replied something about he didn't mind my lips, but my halitosis was a major turnoff. I was now alone with Heather. Well, alone save for the silent, confused presence of Valson. I had tried to fill her in earlier with sign language, but the alien science officer just seemed confused. I'm not sure if hallucination was an idea her species was familiar with. Well, I said, I guess I was panicking over nothing. No, Jason, Heather said, it's a crisis, but we here used to them. I nodded. Um, thanks for not slapping me this time, I said at last. She rolled her eyes. Honestly, Heather said, after all we've been through, you really think I'd snap you if I you kissed me now? I felt a heart thundering in my chest. You mean you wouldn't? I asked hopefully. She shook her head. No, she said with a slight smile. Now I'm armed. With that, she climbed the ladder and was out of sight. My day just grew weirder and weirder with this crew. I shrugged my shoulders and sighed goodnight to Volson and climbed the ladder to return to my own bunk. It was still dark and everyone else seemed to be asleep. The problem was that I was not sure I wanted to go to sleep. The last time I let my conscious mind take a vacation, bad things happened. I was tired, I was restless, I was half tempted to wake up Huxon to take care of a nagging bit of frustration that I had almost shoved out of my mind until the events of the night had unfolded. Sleep finally won the battle. I climbed into my hammock and settled down. I thought it would take a long time to get back to sleep. I was wrong. I was asleep almost instantly. I know that because when I woke up by a moment of disorientation and wondering how Summer Glow had managed to teleport into my bunk. Someone had told me the straight jackets are really difficult to escape only if you're actually insane. According to this friend of mine, the reason Houdini and countless amateur magicians could wiggle themselves out of them was precisely because they were not insane. Because they could concentrate on the problem without visions of monkey gods screaming for blood and infidels dancing in their heads, they could work out how to get their arms and head loose. The guy who told me that was a fountain of useless and often incorrect information. I mostly just ignored anything he told me and treated it with the same regard of an exhausted parent would deal with an infant puke, expected but annoying when it sticks to you. In that night, I changed my mind about some of these stories because I found myself waking up with Scrake's obsidian dagger pressed to my neck and Summer Glow standing above me with his arms in a straitjacket rolled up to her elbows. What I saw were the eyes of a completely sane, goldy sane. She knew very well what she was doing, and pressing the knife on my throat was merely a means to an end. I tried to force a reassuring smile. Good morning, Summer, I said in Newton's dialect. We must land the ship, Jason, she replied in perfect English. There is something that you need to see. Uh-oh. So it wasn't Summer that I was dealing with then. Um, I said... You wouldn't have tried stirring up a few wars just to steer us in this direction, would you? Because if you did, then you could have just asked. Summer's face froze, just for a second, like a statue. Then the animation returned to her face. No, she said, you are correct, and that was caused by others to force you to take this path. They have reasons for sending you this way. 
It is fortunate, because something you need is here. What is that? I asked. The knife pulled away from my throat, something wet following along my neck. I was fairly certain it was sweat and not blood, but I wasn't sure. We must land, she declared before turning away and heading towards the hatch. Woman problems, I muttered to myself as I swung my legs over the side of the hammock. Why can't I even have a normal woman problems? End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 46, written by Semi Loki As I followed Summer down the fabric corridor of snoring bunks, I couldn't help but notice that there was something unusual about her movements. All right, let me clarify that. If someone presses a knife to your neck in the middle of the night and then tells you to follow her, and then her movements are already pretty bizarre. But that's not what I meant. I mean, she didn't walk like a human being. It was a subtle thing, almost subliminal. It was as if the very fast computer was controlling invisible puppet strings. When people walk, it's a precarious thing. Walking is a complicated act, especially the way humans do it. We slip in and out of balance and taunt gravity-related disaster with reckless abandonment. However, we also do it so often that we get really good at it. We ride that razor ridge between safety and catastrophe with every step, and we get a rhythm down pretty good. This was different. The movement was very rhythmic and precise, but it wasn't organic precision. It was the precision of something that was calculating where each foot was scheduled to land and had calculated the optimum trajectory. It wasn't just a mechanical thing. These were the movements of something that had apparently never owned arms or legs and was figuring out the usage at the speed of no human mind or CPU could ever hope to duplicate. Her feet padded almost noiselessly along the crawl. No wasted movements, not even in the normal arm swing that humans adopt to help with balance. Her balance was already perfect and needed no aids. She landed lightly atop the ladder, as if oblivious to the dangers of the gap offered, and scrambled down at a speed only slightly slower than falling. I had only placed my own feet upon the rungs when I heard her speak again. This time her words were in a language never meant for a human throat. You must land the ship now, she ordered Volson in an alien language that I had not heard in months. There is an island just ahead of us. Land in the clearing along the right side and beyond the beach. Volson's honor was scrambled with a jamming device. I started stumbling down the ladder and, as I descended, my own symbiote fell under the influence of the jammer. So, I only caught part of Summer's response. Because, if you don't, then the gobble, gobble, hiss, growl, buzz, 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 feedback, whine. Summer said sternly. Okay, I'm providing a rough translation of the last bit. Whatever she said, though, it seemed to work. Valson spun to face the table and her hands danced along the surface. She did not look up at me, so I never got a chance to see what was happening. I felt an odd bit of disorientation as the force fields adjusted to the change in direction, followed by the soft bump under my feet. Summer was a red knee opening the outer door. Cool pre-lattice opening air washed over me. It had been so long since I had tasted fresh air, air not tinged with sweat and halitosis of ten different sets of lungs. I wanted to stand there and revel in its sweetness, but Miss Looney Pants couldn't give me a moment. No, she was already out the door and running. I powered up my armor and ran after her. She lopped along like an animal. She shouldn't have been able to maintain such a pace, not with normal human anatomy. Whatever was controlling her didn't seem to grasp that the safety features that kept humans from pushing themselves like that. Summer darted into the dark forest. The trees were unfamiliar to me, but many Sibirian trees were. Plus, it was still dark. She zipped between the trees in an unnatural way. I turned on my helmet's night vision and managed to dodge the trees as I ran after her. But it wasn't easy. I should have been able to keep up with her better, but every time I started again on her, she'd effortlessly weave her way between another set of trees or over some underbrush that I had yet to break stride to avoid. The entire experience felt eerily familiar. It took me a while to replace it. The return of the Jedi, except this wasn't Endor and I definitely did not have the force to protect me from crashing into trees. 
but some may as well have considering the ease in which she dodged the obstacles as if she knew their existence before she got there. Wait, that's exactly what was happening. She didn't have night vision. She knew where every tree, every root, and every upturned stone was before she got there and nimbly avoided them. Meanwhile, I was powering through with enhanced vision, enhanced speed, and enhanced strength, and I was barely keeping up. She leapt over one last ticket and then came to such a sudden stop that I nearly collided with her. I dug in my feet and narrowly avoided sending her sprawling to the grass. Grass? Yes, grass. We were in a clearing. I looked up in time to see that the lattice started to crack open with the first rays of sunlight. I was about to switch off the night vision mode when I glanced at the other side of the clearing and something caused me to hesitate. Something was there. If I hadn't been running light amplification mixed with infrared, I may have missed it. The figure was so well camouflaged and blended in perfectly with the shadows of the trees. However, as I glanced its way, I happened to see something. A halted movement, I thought. Something that had been moving but suddenly stopped now that I was paying attention to it. Trees don't care if you watch them. I switched to infrared from near spectrum to far spectrum so that I could see the heat signatures. Forest blazed to life with human shapes. There wasn't something out there. There were many somethings out there. The figures pressed themselves to the trunks of the trees apparently unaware that they'd been spotted. They held their bodies in odd poses, the bent knees here and oddly crooked elbow there. I quickly realized that they were each posing themselves to mimic some natural feature or shadowy just beyond themselves. They were aware of what I should be able to see and were doing their part to blend in with the dark. Dark, cool shapes in the hands I saw suggested knives. Some appeared to have arrows knocked and pointed at me. I swept my eyes across the forest and tried to get a count. One of the shapes stepped away from the tree, a moment later a second, and then a third away as well. Soon they were all moving towards me. What was going on? It was then I realized my mistake. I had taken too long in studying them. My gaze had lingered too long where figures I should not be able to see were standing. I had alerted them that I knew where they were, and they now were dropping their pretenses. I switched back to normal vision spectrum in time to see no less than twenty figures step free from the shadows of the forest. I held my breath and suppressed an urge to run in terror. The figures were all male and completely bald, golden yellow skin with whirls of blue tattoos crisscrossing their heads and torsos. Darker lines, almost black, ran up their arms and legs, their tattoos seeming to suggest horns over their eyes or scars along their limbs. The tattoos were numerous and left little of the golden skin untouched. As they got closer, I saw that it was not their hair or on their heads that was missing. Their eyebrows were devoid of hair as well as their chests. The men were not just clean-shaven, they were completely hairless. They all only wore one article of clothing, a loincloth, wrapped around their waists. But they wore leather straps around their wrists, their ankles, their forearms, and crisscrossing their chest. The straps were not decorative either. Each held at least one obsidian knife. Some held quivers full for the bows along their backs. The one at the head sported a quarterstaff that stuck out from the straps across his back and over his right shoulder. The sight of the golden men with the fierce tattoos and multiple weapons would have been intimidating enough, but that wasn't even close to the worst part. No, what was really terrifying was their proportions. Each one sported enormous muscles, inhumanly large muscles. They made Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a before picture on Charles Atlas's ad. Each overly muscled arm and leg ended in hand and foot with fingers and toes that were too long and tipped with nails that were too sharp. The jaws were large and heavy, larger than Reynolds' Neanderthal skull. They kept their mouths shut, but I got the sense that there were too many teeth hidden behind those lips. There was just something predatory about the shape of the jawline that sent an instinct of jolt of terror down my spine. Their ears and their noses were squashed flat against their skull, as if the skin were drawn too tight by the overlarge muscles. Lastly, the eyes. Oh, the eyes. Those were not human eyes. 
They glittered with the reflected light of those of a cat, fiery red blazed where human eyes would be white and dark patches, surrounded the outside of the eye, making them stand out more against the golden blue head. The leader stepped closer and froze in place. The others froze at the same moment as some unseen signal. His eyes met my own through the helmet's visor, and I felt as if he were daring me to move. Jason! A voice behind me, Reynolds' voice I realized. I was too afraid to break eye contact, so I called out over my shoulder. Reynolds, I greeted, we've got company. Back away slowly, Reynolds advised. Don't look away and don't make any threatening moves. What would be a threatening move? I asked. Anything that doesn't make him run at you with knives counts as a non-threatening move. Reynolds answered. Not that much help there. I took a cautious step backwards. The gold man let me. Do you know him? I asked. It's a consul, he said. Just keep moving, slowly. They haven't killed you yet, which means they aren't sure about you yet. Aren't sure about what? I asked. How many of them it'll take to kill you? He said. I took another step back. The consul raised an arm casually to grip his quarterstaff. Stop moving, Reynolds grasped. I didn't need to be advised as I had already stopped. The consul kept his hand there for a moment before lowering it again. I didn't think your people had been this far before, I asked. We haven't, Reynolds agreed, but stories of the consul have a way of getting around despite that. Every airship pilot hears stories about them. What stories? The kind where there are no survivors. Grim. Thanks for coming after me, I said dryly. I didn't come after you, she said icily. I came after Summer. Summer? I had completely forgotten about her in her excitement. In that moment, I forgot myself and broke eye contact with the console and looked in the direction of our ship's psychic and occasionally possessed mental case. She still stood in the same place as before, except now tears were rolling down her cheeks. She spoke then, softly, so quiet that her voice was barely be heard over the whispers of the trees. These are the rebels, she said, voice breaking slightly. The men made into blades, the ones who come from many did this to them, what you call the chimera. They try to make us into better weapons. They cut away the quiet moments. They left the rage, the anger, the hate. They stoked the flames and cut away our dreams. Our peace. They cut away the sculpture to leave a block of marble. They are constant rage. The Chimera tried to cut away everything that was not the weapon. She glanced at me, eyes red with tears. The weapons turned on them, she sniffed. She was speaking Spirian, I realized. Those eyes of hers and human once more. Summer, I asked. Summer smiled weakly. Hello, Jason, she said and sniffed again. I guess it's good to be back. Are you, um, all right? No, she sobbed. There is so much pain in him right now. He feels so little other than rage. It's like he's numb to the other feelings. He craves things like joy and sorrow, but all he feels is anger, and that hurts. Hurts, I asked. He's a father, she said. His son is less than a year old. He hates his son. He knows he should not, but he hates him anyway. Hates that he is too weak to carry a spear. Hates that his mother for giving birth to a child. They don't want to hate, but the Chimera did it to them. They took everything else away. It hurts when they hate, but it hurts more when they do not. They seek the pain. They reach for the pain. I don't understand. She frowned. They don't even have a language, she said. Why? Why take that away, too? Is this what the Chimera thought would make a better weapon? I don't know, I admitted. You said that they were rebels. She smiled weakly. This entire world, she said. It was their lab. They brought things from your world here. They tried to reshape them, make them better, make the beasts fiercer, make the plots hunger more, make the men stronger. These... Uh, these people were forged for hate and found someone they truly hated. The Chimera, I said. Again, the flash of a half-smile. They fought back, she said. Killed the Chimera they found. Tried. Tried to bring it all down. The Chimera turned the place into a prison. Locked us all in and abandoned us. 
Despite the warning of the day and the temperature and control of my armor, I felt a chill. How? How do you know all of this? I asked. She tapped her skull. He told me, she said, at least in so many words. She was psychic, I remembered. But how does he know? I asked. I thought they didn't have a language. They don't, she agreed, but they have the one who remembers. The one told them of the betrayal. The one? I asked. To my surprise, the consul with the staff spun around and marched off to the forest line. He will show us, she said and followed and stepped behind him. I glanced over my shoulder and saw slack-jawed Reynolds. What do those campfire stories say at this point? I asked. How should I know? He asked. We're supposed to be freshly assaulted at Jalomf right now. I thought about what he said. You meant to say freshly wrapped, right? I asked hopefully. You wish. I was afraid he'd say that. I followed Summer towards the tree line. A moment later I heard a choice but a severe in profanity followed by Reynolds' stomping feet following me. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 47, written by Sebi Loki Traipsing through the forest at a walking pace is a lot easier than the dead run. There are still hazards, brush to turf over and low-hanging branches that might spear an eye out if you don't watch where you're going. But in general, if you travel through the forest on foot, I recommend the most sedate pace. You lose a bit of time, yes, but making great time while colliding with a tree should not be a life goal for ordinary people. Which is not to say that it was easy to keep up with Konzal. They set a pace through the forest that, while technically a walking speed, was not one that was easy to match. I didn't understand it at first. They were all barefoot and my feet were encased in armored boots. If anyone should be setting the pace, it should be me. Or at least, Reynolds, but that wasn't the case. The overly muscled Konzal glided through the forest as if their bare feet barely touched the ground. There was barely a whisper of sound as their feet landed on the leaves that carpeted the forest floor. This made the crunch of the leaves under my own footfall seem that much louder. At first, I thought it was something similar to how Summer had been able to stay out of the reach as I had run after her. The consul knew where every rock, twig, and barrier of the forest lay. They knew where the place to feet where it caused the least amount of noise. Yet as we walked, it became increasingly clear that it was not such the case. They were not following any predefined path, or varying the steps to seek out the hard stones, or avoid the drifts where the leaves collected due to the wind. They walked straight and true, even if the two consul walked side by side, neither one seemed to make any more noise than any of the others. It was obviously a skill that they had acquired that I lacked. I tried emulating the stride, but my booted feet seemed to still crash upon the noisy leaves. Eventually, I gave up. However, they were doing it, it would clearly take more than a moment's study to figure it out. If I could figure it out. For all I know, the changes made by the console included some sort of heightened sense of balance or fine muscle control that I couldn't replicate even with practice. Of course, maybe boots are noisier than bare feet. I wasn't willing to kick my boots off to find out, though. I had been so focused on how silent the figures ahead of me were that it took me a moment to realize what else I wasn't hearing. Birds. Shouldn't there also be animals making noises nearby? On a hunch, I switched my visor view back to the far infrared once more. Dozens of unseen figures swam into view around me. More than that, I saw huts. Houses so expertly camouflaged that they blended in perfectly with the forest around me. I thought that they were still approaching the console village when, in fact, I was right in the middle of it. The hidden figures turned their heads to study us as we passed. Even the children moved invisibly through the forest, and only by cheating and following their heat signatures could I see them. What sort of people were these? We were surrounded, of course. If they had decided to attack us, there was no way that I could escape without using my arm as weaponry. Even then, would it be enough? Despite the fact that they were armed with stone wage weapons, and I was decked out with highly advanced armor, I felt strangely exposed. I felt tempted to yell out the Fred Flintstone catchphrase and let loose. I pushed this temptation back, though. Don't attack, don't speak to them, don't just act casual. 
Though stupid, that mantra seemed to work. I could feel my heartbeat slowing. I was aware of the console watching me, but they weren't slowing shines of aggression. Not yet, so neither would I. I am not your enemy. I congratulated myself on projecting a sense of calm and serenity. I was breaking new ground here in this world, and I would be a peaceful ambassador to the warriors. Naturally, the guy who ran at me with a knife spoiled the illusion pretty quickly. I almost missed it. If I hadn't still been watching the infrared spectrum, he would have been on me before I saw him. I had been trying not to stare at any particular spot, and simply allowed my gaze to sweep across the expanse of the forest, as if I were looking around and that I was completely unaware of the people surrounding me. As I let my gaze roam, I caught the movement from the corner of my eye, faster than any other movement at all silent observers had made until then. I glanced back and saw the gold brew man explode from the shadows ahead of me with his knife snashing at the exposed section of my face. I did a few things at once. I boosted my force field to better deflect the blade. I also slid my own blade out and swung it upwards to block the blow. I could tell even as I moved I was going to be a fraction of a second too late. He was too quick and my own moves were still too clumsy. So, it came as a complete shock to me when my blade struck his own. The attacker's blow had halted midway, allowing our blades to cross. My metal blade chipped his obsidian dagger as they struck. I met his eyes and saw confusion register. He dropped to the ground in front of me and I saw the leader of the console standing behind my attacker with sheathed his own bloody dagger. I looked down. The man's eyes stared at nothing. Dead. My attacker had been slain practically before I had time to react. How fast were these console? Two more figures appeared in the forest and wrapped their arms around the fallen man's arms and legs. They lifted the body without saying a word. His chipped blade remained behind. The leader's quarterstaff still slung over his shoulder, bent and picked up the blade. He held it out, handled first with a bland expression on his face, almost as if he were politely retrieving something I had dropped. I took the blade. This was apparently the appropriate response as he spun around and resumed walking. What? I whispered. He disobeyed, Summer translated. I jumped at the sound of her voice. She was standing beside me. When had she moved next to me? They were to watch but not attack, she went on. This one did not like the outsiders were involved in their home. He challenged you and, by extension, the leader. He lost. I glanced down at the chip obsidian blade in my limp hand. Does that signify anything? I asked. Was I now part of the tribe? Yes, she agreed. He thinks that you should arm yourself. His brother was stupid to slow so that it was easy to stop, but he may not be there the next time to stop one. His brother, I stammered. That was the leader's own brother he just killed. She rocked her head and resumed walking. I fell and stepped behind her. Yes, she said, but that means little to them. Familial ties aren't especially important to them. They know that they should be, but they are not. I tried to digest that. I switched topics. So the one with the staff really is the leader, I asked. As much as they have one, some are confirmed, he is more like the, um, head priest, I guess, for a cult of pain. Cult of pain, I asked. Doing what hurts the most, she said, like allowing strangers to walk amongst them without slaying them. This really did not sound good. I fold my grip tighten on the obsidian dagger for all the good that would do me. Can you tell me that we won't want to harm them? I asked. They don't have the language, she reminded me. The vocal cords were removed. The chimera wanted a weapon they could aim, but not one they could argue. Even if I could speak to them, it wouldn't matter. I don't think whether or not we want to hurt them changes the desire to hurt us. I felt my stomach twist, partially in fear, but partially in disgust. A low hatred of the chimera, one had almost forgotten, began to burn again. These people were my cousins, human beings. What right did they have to do this to someone? To modify them into some living weapon and then discard them when they were no longer needed. How can they have a religion if they can't talk, I muttered. They talk, she said, but they don't have a language. Communicating is, um, instinctive for humans. Lock a hundred humans in a room who speak a hundred different languages, and a day later they'll all figure out some way to talk. 
We need to communicate. It's built into us. It makes us, um, better at what we do. Building and fighting. So what? Sign language? I asked. I think, she said slowly, it's more a language of, um, feelings. I don't understand it. I'm getting fragments from them, but they aren't any words more. Feelings that they are flinging at me. Their anger, their pain, their disgust with us for being weak and, uh, their need not to kill us. Prove that they don't have to. She frowned. It was actually easier to understand this when the others was controlling me, she admitted. My thoughts weren't my own, but I thought I understood things. Now it's just a jumble of impressions. So why are they doing this? Reynolds surprised us both by asking. Why aren't they trying to kill us? Is this a personal test? No, Summer said would seem to think about it. No, I, I think they were told to uh, expect us. Someone told them that we were coming and they were bringing us to see the one who remembers. Another leader? I asked. Her frown deepened. I don't know, she confessed. They don't seem to feel one way or another but the one. No hatred, no anger. I don't know if that can feel respect. For some reason that caused a lapse in silence. I watched the village go by in an infrared and only stopped once. That number of houses and villages thinned to nothing. We had walked through the Consul village and were now on the other side. Whatever this unmanned priest warrior wanted to show us, it wasn't in the village. Our guides turned to left and followed the gentle slope in the land. We walked uphill for a bit and the leaves and grass underfoot soon gave way to a hard grey stone. A rocky outcropping jutting from the forest. The rocks rose up sharply and I soon found myself face to face with the sheer surface of a rose ten feet above my head. For a moment, I was afraid the console would do something sort of freehand climbing up the rock face, but they turned to the right and followed a rocky ledge that circled the perimeter of the rock. I followed them and saw the disappear from sight a moment later. I came to the spot where they disappeared and found a narrow crack in the rock. It was just slightly wider than a human body, turned to the side and I saw lights coming from within. A cave! I squeezed myself into the crack and slid along the for a moment before I recalled something. The console didn't have torches. I popped into the cabin and found four console waiting for me inside. I wasn't sure where the eight or so had gone, presumably they were somewhere outside watching invisibly from the edge of the forest. The cavern had a low ceiling forcing me to bend my neck to keep my pumping my head. The consul, including the priest, stood around the source of the light and looked at me expectantly. I glanced down and nearly lost my breath at what I saw. On the floor was a tangle of power conduits and a wafer of thin boards. I recognized them as chimeran technology. What's more, I was fairly certain I knew what I was looking at too. It was the mind of a ship. Hello, Captain. A halting voice came from the mass of electronics at my feet. Its work in chimeric, naturally, the glowing diodes with the source of all the light in the cabin flashed in time with the words. Forgive me, it went on. I have not spoken in many centuries. I saw no need to check my status on my voice synthesizer until now. The voice was flowing better now. It had lost some of its buzzing tones and sounded more human. It was now even distinctly male voice. Who are you? I stammered. I am no one, it said. I was a ship's intelligence from the angry inferno, but I lost that name when the ship was destroyed. Destroyed? I asked the inferno. Destroyed by who? Their ancestors of this tribe, the AI's ship answered. Or rather, some of their ancestors... Not all of the experimental soldier projects were housed on one ship. Experimental soldier project. A missing piece fell into place. The name Konzol had meant nothing to me. I thought that it was much as any name of a tribe of people. It didn't have mean anything. I forgot the entire sphere had been populated by former soldiers and captors of Gamera. Konzol in and of itself meant nothing. However, both syllables were in compound word which meant experimental soldier project. It was an abbreviation for a longer forgotten word. Konzol, I said aloud. Yes, Inferno agreed. They overran the ship. 
I tried to defend myself, but they were well equipped, well trained. Even my own defenses and security forces were overwhelmed. They captured the ship? I asked. For a moment, Inferno agreed, but only long enough to tear me loose from the ship and set the engines to overload. Then they fled to the escape pods. My legs felt weak from myself, searching for a spot on the floor wide enough for me to sit down. There wasn't one. I looked back into the glowing wreckage that had once been a ship's brain. Why did they attack their own ship? I asked. The ones who change, the Inferno replied, took your species and tried to exchange what they believed made you such fierce weapons. They desired something more, something more effective than the giant beasts your planet had once gifted with them. They wanted perfection. I glanced at Summer before answering. I've seen some of the other experiments, I admitted. Yes, the ship said, but the other experiments were still mostly original stock. Small changes, this was to be an entirely new breed. This tribe was only the first model, a test phase before they began a more aggressive modifications, but it proved difficult to control. Difficult? I asked. I was decommissioned as a fighter ship and converted into a prison transport. The Inferno explained. The experiments were to be destroyed after their genetic makeup was fully sequenced and analyzed for further developments. Before that took place, they escaped the cells and destroyed the ship. How did they escape the cells? I let them out, the former ship confessed, which is why they cut me free from the ship before destroying it. I definitely needed to sit down now, but there was still no place wide enough to permit that. I leaned against the wall instead to steady myself. You said that you tried to stop them, I pointed out. I did what I was programmed to do, the ship answered. I could not resist my instructions for defense, but my instructions for imprisonment were newer and not as deeply imprinted. I could partially circumvent them. But why? I asked. I'm afraid that that story is a long one and I have little enough time to share it. The ship explained. The tribe managed to smuggle me aboard the sphere during the imprisonment and here and hid me away safely in the cavern. The automated defenses do not yet know of my existence, but if you linger over long, some processes might choose to investigate. Your presence will have undoubtedly attracted some attention, but not, apparently, enough to trigger the more intelligent defenses. Your success depends on you not waking up these defenses. I still don't understand, I protested. I know you don't, the former ship replied, and for that I apologize. There is much you need to learn, and I fear that we do not have the luxury of time to do it in less than intrusive way. You must remember. As it said the final word, two of the consoles stepped closer and seized my upper arms in a vice-like grips. Their expressions were still bland, from the mass of conduit circuit boards and power crystals on the floor, a flexible metal arm extended outwards towards me. A tiny needle protruded at the end. Remember, yes. Of course, that's what they meant by that. I should have realized. After all, I'd been through this once before. Jason! Summer shouted. Belatedly, I remembered that she didn't speak Chimeric, and unlike Reynolds, did not have the symbiote. No, I shouted back. Don't do anything. It's not trying to hurt me. I had time to hope that I wasn't lying before the metallic arm snaked around the back of my neck and stared me. The world went dark, and its borrowed memories flooded my mind. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 48 Written by Semi Loki I woke up in pain, except for the same time. I didn't think of it as pain. It was just a normal background noise of existence. I opened my eyes. The world swam into focus with strange colors, colors that I'd never seen before, except I had. I was confused when a non-confused at the same time. Mostly, though, I was angry. A deep-seated, low-burning fury calling out for me to smash my fists into something. I wanted to hear bones snap and feel the fresh tear. I looked around the room, seeking something to smash. The walls were bare white, emitting a soft glow. Part of me gasped in recognition of the sight, but the rest of me just continued to my scan. My eyes drifted over the flat, transparent plane of the wall. Glass, plastic, 
transparent aluminum, I couldn't tell. However, I did see my reflection in it. My eyes were red and my skin had a golden hue. I was a console. No, this was a console memory. Was this what they felt all the time? I, or rather the console I inhabited, noted movement on the other side of the glass and turned to face that way. There was a hallway just beyond this window. Two alien figures approached. For the first time since I had heard their name, I realized I was looking at two Chimera, or at least what the Chimera once were. The creatures were tall, eight feet tall at least. Their torsos were serpentine and whipped around with an unnatural flexibility. The torso met a flower-hoofed body with a screen scales. It would have looked a bit like a centaur except for the torso was fused to the back, causing a long dragon equine body to proceed as it walked. The worst part, however, was the head. The head that sat upon a long serpent neck looked like someone had tried to construct petals out of bat wings. Dozens of leathery wings flapped in slow motion as if blown in their own private breeze. From the center of the arrangement of the wings spat six tongues with slapped in the air as if they were searching for insects. Just behind the bat wings was a ring of yellow orbs. Eyes, I guessed but they seemed to stare in all directions at the same time. In the middle of the neck was two holes covered by four triangular flaps that met with the center. The flap rolled back and the creature began talking. I understood the words. The console did not. This is the latest model. The first one approached and asked the other. Yes, the second replied in a hissing noise. We have made several improvements over the original stock, I think. Greater durability, heightened aggression, reduced sense of self-preservation. Fascinating, the first agreed, but the lobe persists. We attempted to model that lacked an offending lobe. The results were unsatisfactory. Unsatisfactory how? The creatures were still aggressive, but they lacked the uh, resourcefulness of the original stock. Somehow, even though their access to the thought speech is blocked, it affords them the ability to understand and predict their enemy's movement. When we removed the lobe, these how world creatures were only 67% as effective in combat situations. It uses its thought talk for warfare, the first remarked. These creatures were certainly are a nightmare. Why did the teachers create such a monstrosity? There was a hesitation. I still doubt the hand of the teachers was involved. The second confessed. There are too many irregularities that seem unplanned. Nonsense, you know the word of the divine. The teachers shaped all. Yes, of course, still, these creatures are, um, unusual. Which is why we decided to approach the remodeling process in stages. Some for our changes that have yielded unexpected results. The first made a strange snorting, snuffing sound from the back of its throat. You refer to the thought talkers, it asked. You were told to cease all experimentation in that area. I have, the second protested. Still, some of the results are those earlier experiments did bear interesting fruit. Observe. It bent its neck to lower its bat wing flower of its head near the wall. A tongue flew out and touched the spot of the wall. A moment its tongue touched the wall, I felt an explosion go off in my mind. At first I thought it was a literal explosion, that I had been torn to shreds with white hot heat. But no, it was more than that. The heat was from my own rage. I flew at the glass and slammed my fist into it. It was not glass. No, glass could not have weathered such a blow. Instantly I was aware of feeling of the bones and my fingers cracking. I ignored this, my need to attack, to kill. It dwarfed such petty things like avoiding injuries. I slammed my other fist into the pain. Again, I felt bones crack. No damage showed. I balled both fists and held them overhead. I left through the air with my weight against the blow. Still, no damage on the transparent plane. My hands did not work correctly. Pain... There must be pain in there, but it seemed far away. I kicked, I flailed. I would have screamed if my throat would allow such a noise. I tried to bite the transparent pain. Nothing worked. 
I was dashing my body to near uselessness and it did nothing to quench my fury. The tongue of the chimera flicked out and touched the wall again. I stopped. It had been like someone had flipped a switch inside. I felt nothing. No pain, no anger, no hunger, no interest. I was completely numb. Fascinating, the first chimera said as it stepped closer. What did you do? The lobe, the second chimera explained. Our experiments with the Thought Talker showed us that the reason the teachers had difficulty with the Thought Transmissions is because these Hellworlders do not use the same resonance. The first one turned to the second. Resonance? it asked. Yes, it explained, almost like frequencies. We did not even suspect that such a thing existed until we experimented with these creatures. They were starting to Thought Talk but on the wrong resonance. The teachers cannot listen on that resonance. Are you suggesting the teachers are flawed? The first asked angrily. No, the second protested. The floor is the Hellworld creature, High Priest. They were the ones I would use on Furia method. One of the teachers would not soil themselves to overhear. Silence. Continue, the first one said at last. Our studies showed that these creatures used different resonance. The second was a bit too quickly. An inferior method of transmits less data and is more limited in range. By causing the lobe to shift in a position, we block this inferior method. However, the lobe still seems to send and receive an even weaker third resonance, even when this is a new position. So they are still thought talkers? The priest asked. Not at all, the second said. Geneticist, it seemed, corrected the priest. This third method is so weak and transmits so little data that they tend to ignore it. The talent is stronger in some, weaker in others. They seem to use this to enhance their ability to guess the thoughts of others. It serves as a sort of intuition. You mean the way that they watch body movements to learn thoughts from them? The priest asked. Yes, the second agreed. They have explained it and still makes no sense. However, when you add this weak thought talk to complement the talent it does, perhaps make more sense. So what did you just do? The priest asked. We have made this especially sensitive to the third resonance. They feel it stronger than the normal creatures. I am saturating the room with transmissions of calm before I hit them with anger. They cannot distinguish between thoughts that I am sending and thoughts of their own, so they react. You have found a way to control the hell creatures? The priest asked excitedly. Not exactly. The geneticist sounded almost apologetic. With the normal hell creatures, this triggers nothing more than a sense of annoyance or a mild acceptance at best. The sensitivity is extremely weak. I had to add in many more connections to this one's lobe to achieve this level of sensitivity, and, even with this, the effect is somewhat limited. The range of the device is almost only a thousand feet. Okay, I'm fudging the translation a bit. He used chimeric unit of distance. Give me a break. I was stuck in an immobile body where the mind seemed to have gone on vacation. But you can control these units, the priest asked. With these, the geneticist confirmed. We will equip captains with these units and they can use them to direct the hull creatures at the enemies without the need to issue commands. Excellent, the priest said. Continue your work. You have the blessings of the teachers. Thank you, high priest. They walked away, leaving me frozen in place. My fists were bleeding. Distantly, I could tell the throb of the pain. The fingers no longer moved. I didn't care. The memories jumped and I was now on a battlefield, except that I wasn't the same person anymore. This time, I seemed to be a console female. I was also angry. Again. An armored soldier of the alien species that I did not recognize stood before me. It was pointing a rifle at me with its claw-like hands. I ripped the rifle free from it and clubbed it over the head with the butt. I never saw the alien's face before it exploded into mush. I was still angry. Energy weapons slammed into me. They hurt. But everything hurt. I didn't care. I reached another Iranian. This one was a species similar to Volson. An exoskeleton popped and I gripped its arms and squeezed. The alien screamed. I let go of its arms and reached for its head. The head came free with a wet sucking sound. I was still angry.
I charged past a fallen alien and spotted another soldier. This one was Hewan wearing a full battle armor. I was on him in a second. He crumpled to the ground and I tackled him and screamed in terror as my teeth bit into the exposed places of his face. I chewed and swallowed. His blood tasted good. He screamed some more and I continued to eat. A wave of calm hit me as I fell to one side. What is wrong with you? A voice shouted from some place distance. The unit jammed, another voice answered. The man whose face I ate continued to scream. Do something about that soldier, the first voice shouted. I heard a gun go off. The screaming intensified. Not that, the first voice chided. They're almost immune to energy fire. Here, use this rock. Rock? Like this. There was a meaty thump behind me and a scream took on a gargling sound. Another thump and the scream choked. A third, a fourth, the screaming stopped. Report back to the ones who change that the range of these units need to be increased, the first voice said. Yes, sir. And do something with that one. I have a calmed. That's not what I mean. Pick up the rock. There was an explosion in the back of my head. I was on a class two long frigate, a ship used in the early days of the third wave that would, eventually, be supplemented by the more powerful Battle Moon class ships. Even still, the long frigate was an impressive ship. Each one was over 30 miles in length and boosted firepower and conflux could not match. Again, I was female, a teenager this time. I held a sleeping baby in my arms. His golden skin was pressed close to my bare breast. He was not feeding, not at this time, but may soon. The things was something that I hated less than anything else. I almost felt something else for it. His touch did not enrage me. I held him and did not wish to be elsewhere. Behind me, the two Tinfu, creatures that looked like a cross between a human and a warthog, just barely bipedal. They could walk on all fours or just their stumpy hind legs. The stupid creatures favored by the chimera as gods as the creatures were so strong but too slow-witted to mind the monotony. And the long frigate was not a prison at this time, not officially anyway, but the consul had not been allowed to leave this section in many years. The Tifnu stood watched at all times to ensure that. I could have easily overwhelmed them both of the creatures, even with them being armed. They were slow, clumsy. I could do it. But even if she looked in their direction, they would touch those medals that they wore on their belts. One caused intense pain, crippling pain, pain unlike any I had ever known. It made it difficult to move, to think, to act. That was the best of the medals. Another caused me to think of nothing, another sickness. But the fourth medal was the worst. I had learned not to look at them and step in their direction, lest they touch the medals and make me do something I did not wish. I'm bored, Atifnu said suddenly. Once more, the words meant nothing to the woman I was in. Only I, Jason Reese, an observer in the distant future, added meaning to those words. Me too, the second one said with a yawn. Want to see if we can make her eat her child? They touched the fourth medal. I slammed the sleeping child's face into the floor. The fury filled me. The memory mercifully stopped before I saw more of that horror but I was still left to witness the aftermath. I stood over the beaten lump of bone and bloodied flesh that had been my child moments before. I knew I should feel something. But what? Four others stood with me, staring at the body. None of us moved. A small cleaning robot entered the room. It was little more than a box and wheels with slender metal arms extending from it. The arms reached for the body without thinking and grabbed the arm and yanked it away. The body must be disposed of, a voice echoed from above. I did not understand the words and I yanked the robot arm again. The robot retreated. I had been ordered to remove this, the voice said again. I stood in front of the robot, blocking the way to my child. The robot lowered its arms. Please, the voice said softly. I will show proper respect, but I must perform my duties. The robot's posture seemed almost submissive. I wanted to get past me, to get to my dead child. Why did I stop it? Why did I not smash this robot? The robot did not have medals. I wanted something from me, for me to move. It needed for me to move. It stood there helpless before me. 
I could kill it, it must know that too. Still, it stood there and allowed me to face it with all my fury. I stepped to the side, and I let it pass. Thank you, the voice said. I did not understand the words, but they did not sound like the words that preceded the hurting or the anger. I walked away from the child's corpse and did not look back. Again, things jumped. I was a teenage boy this time, steel bars separating me from a tifnu. My future self, the part that was still Jason, thought the sight was something of a low tech as steel bars on a starship seemed strangely archaic. My arm reached between the bars and had a grip on the harness the Tiffany wore around its torso. I slammed its head against the bars again. Use the calm button, my captor shouted as the horned face struck the bars. I am, second counted. A feeling of serenity fell over me. I pushed through it and yanked the creature into the bars again. A tusk broke. They're growing resistant, the second shouted. This should not be possible. Kill it, kill it, the first said. I'll make the others get it, the second said. Anger washed over me, and I slammed the Tiffany's face with a renewed vigor. I felt the press of bodies crowd behind me, arms reaching out. They touched me, they reached past me, and they grabbed the alien's harness. It screamed one last time before the combined strength crushed it against the bars. Angry Inferno! The remaining guards screamed in panic. Stop them! Kill them! Please back away from the bars, a soft voice said from above. We let it go. It was the voice of one who brought us food, who did not bring pain or hatred. We stepped back. We did not like this one. We just did not hate him like the other tormentors. How did you do that ship? The alien asked. I asked them to step back. They listened. The ship answered. The alien seemed to grow angry. Do not speak down to me, it said. You are a synthetic intelligence and I am a... He never finished the sentence. His anger, he stepped too close to the bars. He screamed once. Please, humans, the ship's voice said softly. Do not do that. If they order me to kid you, I cannot stop myself. We did not understand, but we walked away anyhow. Another mental jump and another body. This was an older console. Male, muscle and sporting multiple scars. Your project is a failure, the voice shouted from beyond the metal bars. Two creatures were out there, they had two legs and now four arms stuck out from the sides of their serpentine torsos, but it was definitely the Chimera. Hey priest, the set completed, the project has been in the works for almost a thousand years and the results have been very encouraging. We wanted a weapon, not a wild killing machine, the priest countered. How do we aim these things? Your control units no longer work. I apologize, the geneticist stammered. I can try making them more sensitive, or perhaps a pheromone system might work. No, the priest said. The teachers are displeased, but... The hallway was lit with a blinding light. The glow softened, and then there was only the high priest standing there. The priest and a pile of ashes. Ship, the priest said. These creatures need to be disposed of. Understood, your holiness. How should I proceed? The priest seemed to think about this. Is there a useful research being extracted from them? He asked. Without Jarathom's input, the research is likely hampered, the ship admitted. However, there are still three of the Alphars who are examining the genetic structure for potential replacement series. Bah! The priest scoffed. Fine. Keep them in prison for now, but when no further useful data can be extrapolated, then I want you to evacuate the ship and vent the atmosphere. Understood. Then the pilot yourself to a star that I can be sure that we got rid of this insult of the teachers for eternity. Understood. I stood there by the bars watching the chimera walk away. A small cleaning robot came to sweep up the ashes. I watched it clean. A Tifnu came by a moment later and watched the robot as well. The Tifnu kicked the small robot and then continued on its way. The robot spilled the ashes and rolled in my direction before colliding with the bars upside down. The wheels spun and the arms frailed as the robot tried to right itself. I hunkered down and flipped it over. Thank you, the voice from above said. I ignored it. The robot rolled away. I did not have to help it, but I felt no reason not to help it either. The robot swept up the piled ashes and continued on its way. 
I sat down and placed my back against the bars. The voice from above came back. I have my orders, the voice said. I will follow them. That does not mean that they are my desire or that I understand them. I ignored the voice again and continued waiting. Our guards would make a mistake one day. We would have our day. With Consul, like with all human species, a patient man was the most dangerous of all. Another jump. I was in the scarred elder again. He was running along a corridor. Claxons bled. An energy gun fired and struck me in the chest. I grunted, but ignored it. Prisoners escaping, the voice from above shouted. I smiled this time, the rare expression for a consul. I understood the words. The tiny clearing robot had returned again last night. It had rolled up to me, and without warning, it had stabbed me with a small needle. I had been angry and wanted to smash it. I did not. I slept instead, and when I woke I could understand the words of the ship. The words of the voice said. It told me what would happen, how it would help and not how it would stop us. It told me where we must go. Today was a good day. A Tiffany stormed around the corridor and pointed a gun at me. This one used the chemical explosions as a propellant. Primitive, but effective. I dropped before it could aim and caught it low around the waist. Its grip loosened on the weapon and I yanked it free. I had no trouble aiming at range. Its face disappeared in a deafening noise filling the corridor. More energy weapons hit me. The voice was still trying to stop me. It had also told me its measures to stop us would not work. So far, it had told the truth. So far, it seemed to be the only one who would tell us the truth. Escapees on the lower decks, the voice warned, attacking the engine room. Engine room, yes. The voice had told them what to do there. I changed directions and ran along the corridor in another direction. What are you doing? The voice whispered as I ran past. You need to stay with the others. I would explode when the engines overload. I knew that. The voice had explained much to me during that night, even where it itself was stored. I hated the voice, but I hated it less than I hated the others. What I was doing now hurt. It hurt a lot. It ran against everything that had happened to me. Good. A smile broadened. The memories went black and I woke again. Things swam in front of me. I saw console face in front of me again. A tattooed one this time as well as a cabin wall. It took me a moment to realize that I was in the present again. Strong arms that had been gripping my arms let go, and the one in front of me and the leader, High Priest, handed me a dirty rag. I accepted it without knowing what I was going to do with it. He touched his cheek, and I touched mine. It was wet. It's the only time they ever cry in their lives, Summer's voice said somewhere in the cabin. Once they remember... I wiped my tear on my rag, and the priest took it back from me and dropped it next to the computer on the floor. They used the same rag for everyone, I realized, one rag stained with the tears of thousands. I met the eyes of the priest and, for just a moment, I felt a weird sensation, a moment of almost lightheadedness. It was as if something passed between us and I was gone. You have received what you needed, the ship computer on the floor said. You should go now. But, Ranald stammered, what about, we need to go, I said sharply. What? he asked, what's the hurry? I spun around in the cabin and headed for the opening. The chimera got off too lightly last time, I told him. We let them live. We won't make the same mistake again. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Part 49, written by Sibi Loki the console led us away from the rocky outcropping and towards the forest. I followed at first, but soon I quickened my pace and pushed through the ranks. I was now leading the charge, and the console did nothing to stop me. Reynolds and Summer hurried to keep up. Jason! Reynolds puffed from behind me. What happened back there? How much of this did you know and you didn't tell us? I asked aloud. How much of what? He stammered. I wasn't talking to you, I snarled. Me! Summer gasped from behind. I didn't even know. Not talking to you either. I said and I stopped walking and I spun to face her. She ran into me and looked up in surprise. Our eyes met and I saw confusion at first. It soon melted away and was replaced by the cold intelligence. 
Most of it, Summer admitted, but not all. How had I missed this before? Even her voice changed when she was possessed by whatever it was. And you didn't share any of this with us. Why? I asked. Reynolds was just staring to his open mouth. We both ignored him. So, I said, switching to English, the entire sphere is a prison for humans. Reynolds kissed a kin woman who had a symbiote, she replied, also in English. The console had been receiving memory implants from the computer, I replied, still in English. I am excluding them, not Reynolds. A fair point, she said with a nod. Shall we continue the discussion as we walk? Gradually, I nodded and she pushed past me and continued our way towards the ship. I wasn't terribly certain what you might want to learn there, she confessed. I knew that the console were hiding something, but I never discovered what it was. Imagine, they smuggled an entire ship's mind in here. Did it occur to you that the console might not want to talk to me? I asked. They could have cut me into shreds for just for being an outsider. Not likely, she said with a shrug. I was exerting quite a bit of effort to make sure that they didn't do that. I almost stumbled as if she said that. I bit the next part out through gritted teeth. You have a control device, I snarled. Goodness no, she said. Think about it, Jason. I did. The chimera said that there were multiple types of telepathy and that humans were sensitive to two of them, I said. Or at least, they we were. But they blocked one of them and they couldn't do anything about the third without making us less effective. Very good, she said with a nod. And the fact that I'm talking with you now tells you what. You are telepathic, I said, shrugging. I knew that before, but apparently you can broadcast on more than one channel. Yes, indeed, she agreed. It's sort of a blind spot with the abjugators. They are sensitive to the first few channels, but they are completely incapable of hearing the lower channels. They were designed that way and can't do anything about it. Designed? I asked. She bent over and plucked a long blade of grass from the ground and wound it around her finger. The chimera, she said suddenly, weren't correct, by the way. They were on the right track, but they got caught up in the weird technology and managed to miss the bigger picture. What are you talking about? I asked. And what do you mean about the abjugators being designed? Designed how? There are no three types of telepathy. She went on as if I hadn't spoken. There are millions of types. You earthlings have even discovered a few types. Does the phrase spooky action at a distance ring any bells? Not really, and quit avoiding my questions. I'm not avoiding them, she said with a dramatic sigh, but you are asking me to distill millennia of history into a single sentence. I can't do that without establishing a common lexicon of concepts. Will you allow me to continue? I frowned, and then she nodded. Spooky action at a distance, she said, was a phrase coined by one of your greatest channelers, Albert Einstein. Channeler, I interrupted. She sighed. I'll get to that, she promised, but allow me to continue. Action at a distance refers to how objects can interact with one another, even when separated by distance. Electromagnetism and gravity are types of action at a distance. Even though the objects are separated by great distances, the gravity can cause an interaction. So gravity is a type of telepathy, I asked. Not exactly, she said. However, what you call quantum entanglement is sort of a low-level type of telepathy. In a very real sense, the very fabric of the universe is made of information. What you call telepathy is really just part of a normal data sharing of the various levels of reality. Last me, I said. She smiled. I'm not surprised, she admitted. Few of your kind have been touched upon such a topic and, of those who have, can only express some of these ideas in pure math. Think of your universe as if it was a large computer. Mac or Windows? I asked. She frowned. Something tells me you're not taking this seriously, she said. I just had the images of a mother forced to kill her own child shoved into my head, I said. Maybe I just want you to get to the damn point. Fine, she said. Try this one on for size. Everything you see in the universe was once united, even though it was separate now. The parts still communicate. These bonds of communication go back and forth through time, oblivious to its passage. Some of these threads from the heat death of the universe still communicate with the Big Bang. These networks of communications are the archetypes of what we think of as telepathy. 
but they are too vast and something like organic life to comprehend. A star can be born and die before a single bit of information is exchanged, or a single electron may flip its spin and entire volumes of information are shared. Is it too much of something for like a living mind for so layers of translation are stacked on top? What you think of as reality are parts of the layers of the translation. Time, space, matter, and energy. All parts of this translation effect of the universe, humans and all other life are just extensions of this. You are programs running on top of programs on top of another program of all in a simulation. So there is no universe, just a matrix, I asked. She sighed. The creatures you heard referring to as super sentient, she said, are ancient creatures. They predate all of this real in the universe. How can that be? I asked. By surviving the death of their own universe, of course, she said. They came to this younger universe and tried to make it their own. By making the chimera attack random people, I asked. By creating abjugators, she corrected me. Okay, there was a time for smart mouth back talk. There was also a time to shut up. I figured it was time for the latter. If you think the universe is being led math and information, this is easier to understand, she said. But the simple fact is that you call the abjugators are the type of program the sentience created to run on top level reality. They are a self-sustaining telepathic construct operating on a level of reality that is just below the threshold of perception. I didn't say anything. I lost you again, she said. Not really, I said. You're telling me that when the SS arrived, they needed servants. They hacked the universe and inserted rogue bits of code into it. She frowned. I think you're still borrowing too much from the Matrix, but uh, yes, it's essentially correct, she said. These servants have no physical form. They are a construct of information. Because they are running on a level of reality below this one, they have some influence on this level of reality. Not a lot, but it can seem impressive to those living on this level. Because they are a construct of one form of telepathy, they can hear everything transmitted on this level of telepathy and catch harmonics on nearby channels. I nodded. The symbiote uses a frequency that they can hear, but what humans are starting to use, they were deaf to, I translated. Essentially, yes, she said, except you weren't just using one frequency, you were using three frequencies. I blinked. The chimera said two, I said. Talking, she said. This is information exchange. This is a form of telepathy. Not a very good one, I said. Are you gathering information from me? She asked. I guess. Then it serves, she huffed. Don't argue so much. They have access to some of the higher levels of telepathy. Your kind was developing lower levels. They blocked one level by having your agents twist your minds. They blocked two levels with the console. Blocking a third level proved harder. Why is that? I asked. She shook her head. We can't discuss it here, she said. I feel that I have already admitted too much of it as it is. Too much for what? I asked. Too much to keep stringing you along, Reynolds growled behind me. I had been so absorbed in the conversation that I'd forgotten his presence. I glanced back to see him. Look at where we are, he said. I looked back. The airship, the Akina, sat before us on the ground. She kept you talking with physics and philosophy and you never told you a damn thing, she said. Don't you get it? Get what? I asked as I turned to face him. She's not acting crazy anymore, he said pointedly. Do you know why? Because these levels of telepathy she's been telling you about have a range to them, don't they? The closer we get to him to the stronger control over Summer gets. He's trying to tell you just enough to make sure that you won't let him find out the rest. I looked back at Summer. Her expression was icy. Reynolds grabbed my shoulder and spun me around to face him. We have to go back, he said quickly. Don't you understand what's happening? He can control her already. She's sensitive to one type. He got the console not to eat us. They are very sensitive to the third type, but we're all sensitive to the third type to some degree. She just told us that. What happens when we're right on top of him? A chill ran down my spine. I've said entirely too much. Summer concluded with a sigh. End of chapter.
The Fourth Wave, Chapter 50, written by Semi Loki. The hatch to the Akira was still open. No, that's not surprising. Our arrival had been noted by the others and was spilling out of the craft. I couldn't help but feel a tiny swell of pride at seeing Jack leading the charge with the twins right behind her. Each carried a pistol, ready but pointed down and away from anyone. Jack, I said without hesitating, arrest Summer. Again, my security officer didn't even bat an eye. She had her weapon trained on the resident possessed of psychic before I had even had time to put an R in the word Summer. What can I say? Jack was an act now and figure it out later sort of girl. Not the sort that you want pointing a gun at you, but uh, if you happen to be lucky enough to have one on your side pointing a gun at your enemies, you can't recommend it highly enough. Unfortunately, Reynolds wasn't as quick on the uptake. Jason, he shouted as he gripped my shoulder and spun me around to face him. What are you doing? That's Summer, the creature that has arisen here. No, I agreed. Just his receiver. Meanwhile, Summer is a prisoner in her own head. Even when we are back in Newton, she doesn't have a full control. Even if he allows me to stuff her into a dire blade and for me to fly away at full throttle, how far away does she need to be to completely shake him? His arm dropped away. Until she's completely free of him, I said. She's a danger to us and herself. What if he decides to open the door while we're in fright and jump? But kidding her won't hurt him, Reynolds protested. No, I agreed. Just breaks his link to us. No more whispering in our ears. No more influencing us. No more holding your friend hostage. Is right. Someone agreed with us. To everyone's surprise, it was Summer. Summer is willing to die if it stops this, she sighed. I underestimated you humans. It seems to be a rather unfortunate habit to everyone gets into. She raised her hands in surrender. Stalemate, she admitted. I still need to see you. No... I will not endanger this body. Then let her go, I said. I still need to go to a payphone and stick in a quarter, I said. If you want a puppet, find Kermit and shove your hand up his... If, she interrupted me, I speak to her but do not assume control of her, will you allow me to have a say? This is not a negotiation, I reminded the creature inside of her. You have until the count of three. Please, she said quickly, if I agree not to control her without her permission, will you at least give me a chance to speak? If you do not agree to hear me out, then I will just bother you no more. One was my only response. Jason, she said. Two, I went on. It's me, she said. I looked her into her eyes and saw relief. Her voice had picked up an inflection again. It was warm. Human. Summer, I asked suspiciously. She glanced at Reynolds. Dead trout make lousy underwear, she said cryptically. He started. It's her, he said quickly. Reynolds, I warned. We don't know for sort of control this guy has. Maybe he can search your mind and... If he found out about that, then she's gone, he assured me. That's something that was just between us. Summer promised that she'd take it to her grave. I shrugged and nodded to Jack. She lowered a pistol but kept it handy. He wants to know if you will consider letting him speak, Summer said. Maybe, I said, but we need to get into the ship first and I have to talk with someone. Who, she asked. The only guy I know who has a clue about what is going on and that I trust, I said. We entered the ship and the twins closed the hatch behind us. I made a sign to Volson that I wanted her to take us up, but to keep us stationary for now. I saw Drac raise an eyebrow at once. Whoever our puppeteer is, I told her, he's the only one who has backed down from the position and tried to reason with us. So we should just trust this puppeteer, she asked. I shook my head. Right now I'm finding it very hard to trust many people, I replied. Present company excluded and the others who were on the die with us. Naturally, she said with a dismissive wave. But you have a plan, right? I nodded. Not much more of one, I said, but a plan. We'll let the puppeteer speak, but only after I've consulted our old friend. What old friend? She asked, and I saw a realization hit her. Her eyes widened. Jason, she said, this is a really bad, bad plan. I nodded. Yeah, I know, I agreed. Keep your gun handy and aim for the legs if something happens. Your legs or hers? She asked. Yes. I climbed the ladder and pushed past the crowd of people standing in the common room. Several questions were tossed my way at once. I ignored them all. 
and watched down the corridor to my bunk and climbed into the hammock, and then I called up the suit's interface. Sedative, I ordered, something that'll knock me completely out. Wait half an hour and then wake me back up. The fine half an hour, the suit asked. Oh, for crying out loud, I did a quick calculation in my head. Wake me up after 3,000 heartbeats, I said. I felt the prick at the back of my neck. Jason, I heard Heather called out. What are you up? No question was lost of the world went foggy. It didn't feel like sleeping. It was more like I tried to blink my eyes and was struck fast. I wanted to open them, but they were glued shut. The world spun around me, settled, and the glue broke free. I looked around and found myself back in the dire blade in the cafeteria. About time, a familiar voice said from behind me. I've been trying to get your attention forever. I turned around and saw my double leaning against the one of the food dispensers. Ah, not exactly my double anymore. His skin was now gold with the dark blue tattoos crisscrossing over his hands and face. He still had my hair though, and wore the ship's issued coveralls rather than a loincloth. I was thankful for the last part. You've changed, I said. He smiled at me. Short-range telepathy, he said with a shrug. You apparently primed yourself for it after you got to the memory transfer. I thought about it and nodded. Thousands of consul went through the same process, I said. A common headspace. He shrugged. Either that or the memory transfer method is in one direction as we thought, he agreed. Maybe something leaks back. I grunted acknowledgement. So, I said, you are now part of the console. He nodded. Part Spherian too, he agreed, but that changes are less noticeable from the outside. I frowned. Those months with the kin, I said, I absorbed something from them. They work on airships, he said, so if there is any group that gets a lot of contact with travelers, it's them. He was smiling, but I could see a hint of frustration in his eyes. It probably was mirrored in my own. He wanted to tell me something, something important, but I hadn't put enough of the pieces together yet. What had happened, Puppeteer said, the entire universe was like a computer, and all we know is just layers of programming. Even the abjugators were just a rogue program gone wild. Rogue program. I met his gaze. I saw relief flooding him. You're not my subconscious, I exclaimed. You're a program running in my head. He nodded. That's close enough to the truth, he agreed. Not quite, but it's enough for us to work with. I wasn't done, though. This is all about the low-level telepathy thing again, I said. You told me before that I had agreed to be abducted by Volson and the other grasshoppers, but that's not quite true either, is it? You agreed for me. He shrugged. Sort of, he said. The, um, grasshoppers can be influenced by lower orders of telepathy too. It ain't much, but the universe remembers being united and communications with its various parts are still there. If you know how to pluck the threads that connect, you can influence the species. So, I said, picking up the story, you're saying that the crew was aimed at Earth, reminded of its existence by someone. He frowned at me. You know very well who, he chastised me. The puppeteer, I agreed. A curt nod. So they were encouraged to remember Earth, I went on, and when they decided to abduct someone, another push was sent to guide them towards me. Somewhere along the line, you showed up. Now he shook his head. You've got it backwards, he said. They were steered towards you in the particular because of me. A uh, low-level telepathic push was sent to Earth looking for something. Something in our heads. Something that's been there for a long time. When it hit you, something strange happened. Something that wasn't supposed to happen. I thought back to yet another conversation. When I got my first memory implant, I said thoughtfully, You said that my conscious mind retreated to where you were. A nod. And you're a kind of program running in my head, I went on. Another nod. I thought about it. The bush, I said at last. Something got stuck in my head and it created you. He nodded. Whatever the puppeteer was looking for, he explained. Call it a program if it helps. A program written in the minds of humans, encoded in our DNA and swapped back and forth for millions of times over billions of people. When the puppeteer pushed, it activated and malformed telepathic regions in your head. The tiny splinter of his consciousness bound itself to your mind and your programming. Whatever he's looking for is in me, but it was incomplete. 
He needed you to meet up with her long lost cousins to patch it. Do we know this or am I still guessing? I asked. He shrugged. I can't really say, he admitted. Very, very little of what we created me came from him. Just enough to give a voice to the little bit of you that was tucked away in the telepathic regions inside your skull. Do the abjugators know about you? I asked. A very good question, he said, and the answer is that I'm not sure. A lot of their efforts to stop you seem to be focused on you in particular. That maybe is because your particular symbiote just is a bit more life in it than the others, but, uh, wait, I interrupted, a bit more life, you make it sound like it's dying. He stared at me, then it hit me. The symbiote went extinct in the sphere, I said, but the soldiers must have had it inside of them, so it must have been killed off. He nodded. Your symbiote is dying, he agreed, just not as fast as the others. Each generation removed from the original specimen is weaker. That's part of those false connections the abjugators used to talk to you and didn't show up in others. Care to guess why they haven't spoken to you again? They did. I protested. When I took her happy drugs, they caused me to hallucinate and, uh, I trailed off. It took a lot of time combining their powers to pull that off, he said, and you were still fighting it. The first time you couldn't block them, you're getting better. Ever wonder why? I didn't like the sound of this. How long until it dies completely, I asked. Yours. Years, I think, but it will die. If you get infected again, the next one won't last nearly as long. So what? We build up an immunity to them, I asked. We're so bad at telepathy that we're actively hostile to having them implanted. He laughed at that. The console developed a resistance to the control devices, he said with a dramatic wave of his hand. Maybe it's just part of who we are now. They tried to take away our telepathy and now we're messing around with theirs. Messing around with theirs. That phrase struck me as odd, like it somehow fit the overall puzzle but still couldn't see where it fit. Humans are different. Humans didn't fit in. We're the strange ones. Should I trust the puppeteer? I asked. No, he said quickly. You most certainly should not. So I should head back to the shuttles and leave this place? I asked. He hesitated. There's something in the sphere that the Chimera very much don't want you to see, he said at last, and that means the abjugators don't want you to see it either. They have tried to stop you multiple times. The puppeteer isn't a friend, but he doesn't seem to be friends with the abjugators either. Enemy of my enemy, I asked. He flashed his teeth at me. It's not like we have an abundance of allies to choose from, he agreed. He then frowned and looked up. Uh-oh, he said. Looks like you're waking up. It's been half an hour already. Well, he said, you don't just go to REM sleep after a few. Never mind, I interrupted. Is there anything else you need to tell me before I go? Yeah, he said with a nod. Remember how I said that I picked up bits and pieces of a bunch of different people across the sphere as that has modified me? Yeah, I agreed. As I said this, though, I noticed a cafeteria seeming to be filled with fog. I felt light, too. I was starting to drift away from the floor and float towards the ceiling. When my other self spoke again, his words were distorted, almost as if he was speaking from underwater. This part is really important, he said. When you see Heather, I need you to tell her something. What's that? I asked. I'm hung like a moose. With that, some final restraint that had tethered me to the dream world was severed. I was catapulted up through the ceiling and out into space. I felt myself being stretched like an elastic band. I saw flashes of large black globe racing towards me. The world exploded, and the light, and I was hurled towards a small reddish diamond shape floating in the sky. My eyes snapped open, and I found myself on my bunk again. Jason, Gather gasped. I declined to pass the message along to her. Gather everyone in the common room, I grunted at her. My tongue felt heavy inside my mouth. Tell Jack to bring Summer, I added. Summer, Heather asked. You want to talk to the crazy psychic? No, I corrected her. I want to talk to the crazy psychic to serve as an interpreter for the puppet master's day in court. You lost me, she said. That's okay, I said with a groan as I tossed my feet over the side. I just got back from finding myself. It wasn't worth it. She apparently took this as a sign that I wasn't about to start making sense anytime soon and went in search of the others. 
I stood up and tried to work the kinks out of my neck and back, and I glanced around to make sure the bunks nearest to me were empty. What makes you think that that's a new addition? I whispered to myself. Then I sauntered down the hallway to see what arrogant little psychic hijacker had to say. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 51, written by Sebi Loki. When I got to the common room, I found everyone, save Valson, gathered around. It was not just a tight squeeze. In some cultures, the entire room would be considered largely married. I half expected the I who had to do sound check and send everyone stampeding. In the far corner of the room stood Summer. She looked, well, normal for once. A dark-haired, slender girl who actually came across a rather shy. It was such a dramatic change from the schizophrenic persona that I came to know that it was almost like a stranger stood in a place. To her left stood Scrake. I hadn't seen much of the Hobbit woman lately, but she mostly kept to herself. But now she stood beside the psychic with a firm set in her jaw. She looked almost protective. I then noticed that the two of them were holding hands. Ah, couldn't be. Could it? On the other side of the summer stood Rannells and Jans. Sranolds looked nervous, his eyes kept drifting around the room as if watching for weapons. Jans, on the other hand, looked bored. The twins of Yakumo stood next to Jans. The three of them were like statues. I felt the urge to look at the mirror just so that I could shove it under their noses to see if they were still breathing. Four people who didn't care standing next to three people who were nervous wrecks. Curious. Rhymer, I noted, had taken up station directly opposite Reynolds and seemed more interested in a wooden coin that he was trying to make walk across the back of his knuckles than he was here, which just left my original crew who now crowded in the corridor with me. Well, except for Shied, he was in the cockpit fast asleep in the pilot's chair. Lee and Jack shifted and allowed me to squeeze into the room where I found a vacant spot in the wall next to Rhymer. This put me more or less in the directly across from Summer. He wants you to know, Summer said without waiting for me to speak first, that he simply is asking me to repeat his words. He won't try and take over again. Because he knows I will toss you out of the side if she tries, I asked. She winced. Yes, she agreed. He doesn't want to be responsible for my death and more than you do. It was a nice play, actually, trying to make himself seem like a decent, moral person, while I, at the same time, implying that I was one as well. I couldn't disagree with the statement without sounding like a complete bastard. Problem was, I was done and playing nice guy. You hope, I said, don't make me regret this. She lowered her head and tightened her grip on Scrake's hand. Reynolds saw it as well, his face drained with what little color remained as his frown deepened. Definitely something going on there. I should stay out of it, though. I knew that. I wouldn't, but I should. He says, Summer said at last, once more meeting my eyes, that he appreciates you giving him a chance to explain. I crossed my arms over my chest and shot her an impatient look. She took the hint, or maybe the puppeteer took the hint. You were tricked into coming here, she confirmed. He says he did that, and he apologizes. He didn't have a way to reaching you directly. He could only nudge you and influence your actions. It was difficult. You fight harder than most. I didn't reply. I nearly wasn't in the mood for flattery either. She took a deep breath and plunged on relaying the information. He says that he needed something from the humans, she went on. Something that is in our heads. He's been waiting for it for a long time, and when he realized it was near, he tried to call to it. That didn't work. Everyone's eyes save Summer swivel to look at me, as if I was someone who was supposed to be offering translations. Okay, fine. The sky, I said with a wave in Summer's direction, tried to contact Earth with a form of telepathy, a form that the abjectors apparently can't detect. It didn't work quite right, and what happened instead was a part of his mind got lodged in my head and has been pushing me to go here. Not part of my mind, Summer said. I looked at her and she blushed. Not part of his mind, she corrected herself. Sorry, I was just repeating. He says it wasn't part of his mind. It was a uh, construct. I felt a chill go down my spine. A construct. Like the abjectors, I asked quickly, something made from telepathy. Similar, but far more limited, she said. 
The range was too great for him to reach Earth, and he had to create a probe of sorts. The probe touched your mind, Jason, and part of it became entwined in your mind. When he realized what had happened, he says he sent another probe to communicate with a fragment of the first probe. He tried to establish contact, but you were unable to directly interface. I shook my head. This sounds really similar to what the abjugators do to the symbiotes, I said. I really don't feel comforted by this. This was an accident, she pointed out. A billion to one chance, or so he thought. It was meant to test for induction and not harm you at all. Instead, it bound to the induction and the residual telepathic centers of your brain. It should not be. What's an induction? Jack asked from the corner of her mouth. Only those close to her probably heard the question. I answered loudly enough for everyone's benefit. The induction, I explained, is something the super sentience dropped in our heads, isn't it? A weapon of sorts against their rogue children. Rogue children? Jack asked. She said it loud enough for everyone to hear. The girl knew how to handle a cue. The abjugators, I said, and nodded towards Summer. They created them. She went quiet. A look of confusion passed over her. He, she stammered, he wants to know when you figured it out. I shrugged. Just now, really, I said, just seemed a little too all-knowing about the subjects that seemed to have been lost to the rest of the universe. But the big clue was when he said that he constructed a telepathic probe. She looked at her even more puzzled. Either our puppeteer had a master control over her, or more likely, he was being true to his word and was only using her as a translator. The contrast between her words and her facial expression gave everything an air of absurdity. He says he should have censored himself more, she said, and that humans have always been more clever than anyone realized. Jason, I'm confused. What is he talking about? Oh, hell, Lee muttered. I just got it too. What? The professor asked. What's going on? It's the super sentience, isn't it? Jack asked as she turned to face me. She wasn't just handling me on a cue this time. She got it as well and now was looking at me as if I could offer some answers. Yes, I agreed. Apparently, they're not all dead after all. Almost, Summer said. He says... He says he's the last. The room fell into silence. I wasn't sure what to feel. Anger at the deception, excited, sad. They all warred within me. Curiosity was one the one out. You are in the sphere, I asked. I thought the Chimera used the sphere and wanted to reconstruct the super sentient species. How in the hell did they miss you? Their keepers steered them away from me, some relayed. The ones you call the abjugators, they lied to them and told them not to look in my prison. Their children were more obedient than ours. So this place really is a prison, I sighed. Originally, no, she said. The sphere is a... an ark. She blurted out the last words in art in English, making me jump in surprise. He says that you would know what that means, Summer said. He says that when his kind evolved in their own universe, they did the so late in its life. Most other species were long dead or dying off. They wanted to create a place that would survive the death of this universe where the native life could flourish. I frowned. But, I said, it's only filled with Earth life. I never got a chance to fulfill its intended role, Summers said. After completing its intermediates, what you call the abjugators, rebelled against us. We had constructed them to help in our spheroids with a new universe, to be our eyes and ears and to help mold the developing worlds. They grew independent, however, and balked at the life of what they viewed as servitude. They knew us too well, knew our weaknesses. They struck and we fell. But they let one live, I asked suspiciously. A crippled and feeble example, yes, Summer said, even though she was relaying the words I could practically taste the bitterness in them. I only narrowly survived their onslaught, she went on. I was forced to, uh, maim myself to survive. The intermediates it decided that I would be more useful as a prisoner than as a casualty of war. They still feared us and were not convinced that they had completely eradicated us. They kept me around so that if they could use me to test better, more efficient measures to prevent my escape, they trapped me inside my own construction meant to survive even the death of the universe. She looked down at the floor. He's sad, Jason, she muttered. So sad. So lonely. 
I felt like a heel for doing this, but I kept pressing on. Where do the chimera fit into all of this? I asked. The intermediates are not physical beings, she said at last. They are creations of mind and energy. They felt that they needed intermediates of their own and tried to, well, replicate our methods to themselves objected to. They tried to shape the servant race. The chimera were once simple creatures, no real intelligence, but they had the ability to absorb genetic material and reshape themselves to use the strengths of what they ingested. The intermediaries fed an intelligent species to these creatures so that they could manufacture loyal servants. But why fill the sphere with only Earth's history? I persisted. In our final days, Summer answered, my species made a desperate bid to fight the intermediaries. We dropped genetic packages on primordial worlds in the hope that these would speed up their evolution and create a species that would avenge us. I blinked. Holy crap, I butted. The Chimera were right. Their religion is the distortion of the facts related to them by the intermediates which are, in turn, the distortion of the elevate themselves above their creations. But yes, there is a small kernel of truth. And you paid particular emphasis on Earth, I went on. You dropped something special there, and they've been trying to unravel what it was. Yes, she agreed. They built the walls inside and perverted our ark into a prison of your world. A prison of time as well as people. So what did you drop on our world? I asked. Nothing, she said. She even looked shocked as she said this. That was the point, she went on. It was intended to be what you would call a wild goose chase. We scattered real genetic care packages all around the galaxy, but for your world, we just left a large signature that would make it appear that we did something significant. It was to draw their attention there. At the time, your world seemed so unforgiving that we did not think life would actually take a foothold there. I shook her head. Wait, we were bait? I asked. Unintentional, Sava said quickly. We did not realize until it was too late that your world would develop creatures with a knack for survival. But if we're just an accident that happened, I asked, where does the induction thing come from? Ah, she said with a smile. That wasn't something of our doing. Not precisely. That was something the intermediates did themselves. How? They attacked you, Summer said simply. They tried to infiltrate themselves into your planet's biosphere and merge with you. Your species reacted violently to this and deconstructed the intermediates on the psychic level. We did? I asked. It was the diffuse and weakened form, the super sentient explained through Summer. They assumed the creatures that your world would produce would be soft and malleable like the other species that they had conquered. However, you are more like what your biologists call extremophiles, biology hardened by extreme conditions. I was certain our puppeteer was leaving something out. Still, what he was saying still seemed to fit in with what I had discovered. So, we're just accidents, I said. We're not part of some great plan to foil your rebellious servants. Well... You are now, Summer admitted. When the induction was first formed, I uh, felt it. Even from my prison, I sent other probes to nurture it, to help shape it. But it has grown so much from then. Something much more complicated. Your kind did not appreciate the attempted intrusion, it seems. So that's what this is all about, I asked. Revenge. In part, she agreed, but also it is about breaking the stalemate that has locked this galaxy in a place for a million years. And this bothers you, why? I asked. She was quiet. This arc, she said at last, gets its power from the star at its core. Stars don't last forever. We knew that even then. This arc, this sphere as you call it, will cross into an area that will re a nursery for several billions of years. Once there, collectors will scoop up new raw material and infantile stars to use as refuel to rejuvenate the sun. I frowned at that. Interesting engineering feat, I guess. What did that matter? Okay, I said. If it does not interact with the nursery, the super sentient went on. The star at the center will eventually turn into a red giant and consume the entirety of the sphere. Do you know what I think about every day, Jason? I think about the stellar nursery and hope that somehow we made a mistake in our calculations and that it misses the target because if the star turns into a red giant, I might be free of this prison, this crippled body and this universe that is a perversion of what my people wanted. 
There was a sort of fire in her words that penetrated even though it came through a second-hand translator. I need you to come here, she said, not just to give me an induction to right the wrongs of our children, but to help end this misery. I have survived the death of one universe. Do not make me spend a life on this one here. We fell quiet. I sighed. All right, I said at last. It seems we have two options. We can head back to Newtown and forget all about this, or we can... Jack? I said as the little bit of diminutive security officer pushed past me to go to the trap door. She glanced at me over her shoulder as she moved. Where are you going? I asked. To tell Valson to start up the ship and keep going, she told me. You don't really think that you need to put it to a vote after hearing that, do you? No, I guess I didn't. Jack dropped down the ladder and everyone else spread out and began to go back to their bunks, or someplace else less crowded. Reynolds lingered for a moment and sent a scowl and glare in the direction of Scrake and Summer. I felt a light touch on my shoulder and turned to face Rhymer's smiling face. Best to leave it to them to figure it out, he advised me. This is a time where I think that we should feign gleeful ignorance. I smiled at him. Come on, he said, tugging me towards the rear of the craft. Shite smuggled on some nicely aged pear wine and I know where he keeps it. I decided that, given the choice, getting drunk with Rhymer was a lot better than standing around the common room and watching the fireworks that were about to go off. I followed him down the corridor of bunks towards the rear. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 52, written by Semi Loki With as much drama as we had been through, it may be a bit surprising that we fell back into our normal routine of huddling inside our bunks and trying our best to ignore one another. The problem was that there was very little else that we could do. Even the highly prized jump rope was soon an object of scorn and found itself abandoned. We had crossed the threshold of beyond stir-crazy and settled into its territory of its much darker cousin, emotion, depression. We rarely came out of our bunks. Those with armor, I suspected, were evading themselves to the pharmaceutical options. People were rarely awake if they could sleep. They exited their bunks looking for enough food to keep them alive long enough to sleep some more. I knew something was wrong with this, that I should do something about it, but I had no idea what to do as I was feeling the effects myself. I suddenly understood why sea captains of old would have the crew swab the deck. A dirty deck wasn't a hazard at sea time. It was a pointless busy work to keep an overcrowded ship from turning on itself and the boredom of lack of private space. I needed to figure out my own version of swabbing the deck, but I felt too tired and too drained to care. I only cared about sleeping. Then, just ten days after leaving the console island, I found myself wide awake and unable to sleep. Everyone else was asleep. A gentle chorus of snores told me this much. The darkness outside told me that it was either light or someone forgot to open the shutters. Night seemed more probable, as we were more prone to forgetting to close them at night than opening the lattice break. Everything seemed normal, so why was my heart racing? Then I heard it again, a soft creak from the bowels of the ship, so faint that it was almost drowned out by the other noises. Almost. I leapt from my bunk without a second thought and slammed my helmet on my head. I reached into Summer's bunk and shook her awake. Everyone, I shouted, helmets on! This is not a drill! There were some groans and protests. I ignored them and dumped Summer on the floor. She yelped in pain, and that got everyone's attention. Helmets on! I screamed again as I dumped Scrake out of her bunk. She screamed too. I grabbed both of them by the collars of their shirts and hustled them into the hatch of the common room. I told the helmets to fully enclose my head and boosted my force fields. I shoved Summer down the hatch and followed Scrake. I didn't push them into the direction of the ladder. I let gravity do the work for me. They scrambled as they fell and I jumped after them. Summer saw me falling and had the presence of mind to roll to the side. That spared her a crushed sternum. I didn't pause to congratulate her, though. I jumped up and grabbed the trapdoor for the room above and slammed it shut with my falling weight. As I landed, I grabbed both women again and all but hold them inside Volson's shuttle. The startled alien darted to one side as the woman crumpled next to her. Shut the door, I signed. Volson hesitated. The brief hesitation nearly cost him their lives. The outer door of the ship blew outwards as the gale of force winds tore at me. 
I was being blown out the ship. I boosted my muscles and slammed my fingers downwards onto the floorboard. The wood snapped from the blow, and the armored fingers penetrated deep enough to find purchase. My shoulder felt as if it was being yanked out of the socket, but my grip held. For the moment, I felt disoriented. I was lying on the floor, but the winds were blowing me towards the gaping hole in the side of the ship that made itself feel like it were the ground. An alarm sounded in my head. I ignored it. I struggled to pull myself up from the gap. Then, the wind stopped and everything was silent. I blinked surprise. What happened? I looked into the night sky again and saw the jump rope swinging away in the inky blackness. Holy crap! It wasn't just night. Volson had been lifting us into the atmosphere. The winds had stopped because the ship had depressurized. I glanced upwards to the trapdoor. It bulged towards me with a crack running down the center. It had mostly held, but it felt jets of air rushing out of it. The seal on the trap door was broken. I fired up my comms unit. Is everyone alive? I asked. Yes, Jack's voice came back immediately. Thanks to your warning, we're leaking atmosphere. Lee is handling that the oxygen units right now. Oxygen units? I am repeated. But lately I remember the canisters that we brought in with us from the dire blade which reminded me that the alarm I heard. I decided to check it. Yep, low atmosphere. I quickly converted the numbers, 15 minutes of air. Wonderful. How did you know something was wrong? Lee's voice came over the comm. I heard a grunt of effort from his as he spoke, probably straining to get the oxygen units out of storage. I helped build the ship, I reminded him. I know every grunt and groan it's supposed to make. That one was wrong. Can you get back up here? He asked. I tested the trap door. It was stuck. No, I answered. I think the pressure jammed it in place. Can you break it? He asked. I looked at the wooden door. Probably, I admitted, but that might be a bad idea. It looks like it's keeping a bit of pressure in for you. You might be able to patch it, but the entire outer door is missing down here. It's not going to make a difference if we drop into the atmosphere again. Do you think you can really hang on for five days with supersonic winds trying to tear at you? Fine, he had a point. Still, that just puts us all in danger, I said. Jason, he had the shouted, stop trying to be a martyr and get up here. We've got your tanks ready. I shrugged, though I no one could see it. I put my foot on the rung and the hemp ladder and punched upwards while kicking off. The trap door flew upward silently with a grunt of wind buffeting me. I scrambled up with hooks and shoved an oxygen unit towards me. I snapped it into a matching receptacle on my armor and relaxed when the iron arm silenced off. Where is Summer? Yakimo asked. And Scrake. I put them in with Volson's shuttle, I told them. She should be able to hold the atmosphere for them. Everyone else has armor. He grunted a non-committal reply. I didn't expect much. Now what? I asked as I watched the oxygen reserves drift into the safe zone. Are we out of atmosphere? The professor asked. Close enough, I confirmed. Then we are probably safe for the moment, she mused. We can't leak any more atmosphere than we already have, and the acceleration itself isn't an issue. We can probably just do the next hop and find some place to land and repair the ship. I nodded and was about to second her suggestion when Heather spoke up. Oh no, oh no, 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 no. She said, I can't believe that I missed this. Heather, I asked. She disappeared as my helmet's display became a map. I heard surprising gasps over the comm, so I assumed that I wasn't the only one. Heather was sharing her map. Look at the map, she said. Heather, I said patiently, we're sort of having a crisis right now. This isn't the time for cartography. Look, she ordered. So I looked. Green splotches of land, blue splotches of water. I was about to voice that I didn't see anything when I highlighted a particular bit of blue near the middle. I looked at it, and I still saw nothing. She zoomed out. Still nothing. Zoomed out more. Still nothing. It's water? Someone asked, and Rip spared me the embarrassment of being the one to voice the obvious. Somehow, she managed to start drawing a line of the watery gap between the two land masses. She kept drawing a straight line out into the ocean. It passed between two more landmasses and continued on. She zoomed out more and more, and the view now showed a wide swath of the sphere. The line continued uninterrupted as far as the eye could see. 
the view rotated, and these where the spheres weren't as well defined, and she hadn't mapped this area out as well. The blobs of land masses were amoebic and undefined, the line continued. A chill ran down my spine as the view rotated again, and the line continued. There's no land at all on that line, I asked. Not as far as I can tell, she said, and if my calculations are correct, that is the equator for the sphere. Big deal, Reynolds said, so there isn't any land in the middle of the world. Heather, I asked slowly, have you noted any other places that way you can make a full circle like that without alternating between land and water? Not that I've noted, she said, but I haven't really been looking for the unusual features until recently. The regularity of it made her uneasy. It made me flat out paranoid. I didn't trust anything chimeric further than I could spit it. Okay, with the exception of Dyer. I didn't trust it. There was no pure geographic feature. Maybe it has something to do with the construction of the sphere, Reynolds suggested. A seam in the construction. What seams? the professor asked. The sphere is a featureless on the outside. Well, maybe it has something to do with the terrain inside. I ignored them as I thought. When we rose up high, there was a force field that came from the lattice that pressed us back down. We had to fly lower to avoid it. Now we were coming up on a line that spanned the globe. If I were the chimera, what would I do? Oh, hell, I shouted as I realized exactly what I would do. What? he asked. Guns, I said. Thousands of them, millions of them, pointing up. Guns? Lee asked. Oh, hell, Jack shouted. I needed to talk to Volson. The comms? No, I didn't know how to call her and she couldn't understand me. The door was closed so I couldn't sign to her. Wait, the shuttle I was in looked transparent from the inside. Any volunteer to man guns? I asked. The twins volunteered so enthusiastically that all I could do was point at the hatch. They scrambled down and headed towards the side mounted guns. Do you know what you're doing, Jason? Jack asked. No clue, I freely admitted. I ran down the ladder and saw the twins had already pushed open the side flaps and were positioning the guns. I used Captain's override on their armor to view and found the targeting computer. Okay, chimeric armor was pretty cool. I checked our trajectory against Heather's map and picked up the target for both of them. Aim the guns there, I told them both. Fire when I give the signal. They gripped the handles of the cannons and pointed them downwards for a forward angle. I ran to the side of Volson shuttle and waved my arms at it, and then made the sign for, Go now, forward, unsafe, fast. I hope that she got the message. I felt my weight shift as the ship lurched forward. Guess she did. No! I screamed as the twins brought the map up once more and set up the live updates. The ocean was boiling. Below the water was an eerily straight line I saw an orange glow. The ocean was frothing as the power levels built up. Then twin red beams crashed down from the sky and hit the ocean wall. Steam rolled out as the cannons poured out their very own fury into the water. The angle of the beam steeper and steeper as we approached. Then a lot of things happened at once. The oceans vomited forth an entire mountain range of orange light. The light rushed upwards faster than the eye could see. Too fast for anything to dodge. A wall of energy appearing in front of us, with a tiny gap just barely wide enough for the ship to fit through. Below us, a miniature explosion erupted in the water where the beams of red headlight focused. The twins had successfully knocked out one of the cannons. We dived for the gap, but to my horror, it was already starting to narrow. The cannons on the ground were repositioning themselves to fill the gap. Our ship dipped lower, and where the gap was wider than both and forded, the force fields that dampened the sense of movement fluctuated, and I found myself stumbling. The ship skimmed through the opening, and I felt myself relax, which is, naturally, when the force fields from the latter slammed into us and hurled us downwards. This time, I was sent tumbling. I rolled towards the open door and just barely managed to stop myself from falling out this time as I caught the door frame. The twins weren't so lucky, however. They were still poised over the cannons, pointing out the openings out in the wide side of the ship. When we lurched, they were both sent tumbling outwards. The ship spun about central axis, tossing what few items hadn't been blown free during our explosive decompression. Earlier in the day, rattling towards the door. Rattling, 
I could hear again. We were in the atmosphere. I looked out and saw blue sky with green land twirling past the opening. We were falling. No, worse. We were crashing. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 53 Written by Semi Logi. The spin was with the worst part, seeing the altering blue of the sky and the green of the land lurched past me was a bit disorienting. If I stared at it for too long, I'd probably just lost my lunch, but I was sort of busy trying not to get flung out of my death at the same time, so I never really got a chance to appreciate the view. My armored fingertips took the brunt of the punishment, but armored glove or not, all I had to grip onto was wood and physics, eventually demand someone pay the rent. The board beneath me gave off a terrifying cracking sound, so much so that I had to really thank my biological recycling capabilities of my armor in sparing me in losing traction due to a brown lubricant. I tried climbing my way from the door, but the spinning made it difficult to gauge which way was up, until I had gravity sort out what I thought was the best way to stay where I was. There was a loud boom from directly beside me as more wind tore at me. I almost let go as then as I thought the rear of the ship had sheared itself off. But no, the calls were something much more mundane. The side panel where the opening to the engines were extended outwards. I looked towards the mechanism and saw a large frame that I could only be Jans standing there cranking the engines outwards. Someone grabbed my arm, and I looked up and saw Yakimo, who was gripping the hemp ladder in one hand and putting out my arm with the other. I crawled towards him. Help me, he shouted as I drew near. Tanks! Tanks, understanding dawned on me as I nodded. Belatedly, I realized that the Syrians didn't nod, but Yakimo had spent enough time around Earth humans to have picked up the meaning. He shoved me with his left while staggered to the right. I still felt like I was going to topple over and tumble out at any moment, but I at least was able to get further away from the door. A psychological boost, if nothing else. Even though the ship was, technically speaking, an airship, most of buoyancy came from Volson's ship nestled inside, but we hadn't completely abandoned the Spherian's roots. Six tanks of compressed hydrogen sat along the wall, ready to fill a gas bag with the needed lift gas. I made my way into the first tank and half crawled. Calf climbed its gummy surface to reach to the top. It was a metal with such a short supply. Syrians had made their gas tanks out of ironwood, coated with a rubbery pitch and wrapped in a thick layer of silken twine. Surprisingly, they were pretty sturdy and held quite a bit of compressed gas without leaking. At the top of this barrel tank was a rubber hose that snaked up through the ceiling to the gas bag. It was attached to a lever valve. One trade-off with wooden construction was that there wasn't a lot of fine control when they were off her without destroying the valve. It was either entirely closed or entirely opened. I threw the lever and watched the hose jerk as it flooded with the lift gas. I moved on to the next lift gas and repeated the procedure. A loud cough momentarily drowned out the howl of the wind. The mighty ship underpowered steam engines shuddered to life. The propeller blades unfolded as soon as they had began to spin up slowly. That was when I remembered I had a job to do as well. I threw the last lever and emptied the tank into the massive gas bag above us. The ship lurched and scraped a sound echoed from above. The heat of the plates was separating and the gas bag inflated to its full volume. Our little interplanetary craft completed its transformation back into a normal airship. The bad news was that we were still crashing. The good news was that the Spherians had thousands of years of experience of crashing airships to draw upon. They were experts in surviving them. True, that didn't guarantee my safety, but as a massive propeller swung to full speed and angled themselves to counter the spin, I couldn't help but feel a small swell of hope. If we don't slow her down, somehow the gas bag is going to rip in half, Reynolds shouted at someone above me. Make that very, very small swell of hope. An easily dashed swell, I stumbled down towards the ladder and managed to snag a rung on the third try. If I pitch the engines too sharply, we'll just cut the bag by rotation, Rhymer countered. 
We need forward motion, Reynolds concurred. If we put her into a glide, we might be able to slide her when we hit. When we hit, I shouted, the two men who sat previously unused control room didn't even bother turning around. We're falling too fast, Reynolds snapped. Unless your friend with the big eyes can get her engine started, the best we can do is give everyone a fair chance at walking away. But we inflated the gas bag, I protested. A fine job you did too, Reimer agreed, but it's no longer a question of the gas bag will rupture, but when and how badly. A hand landed on my shoulder. I spun to face Shide. He shoved the trunk full of supplies into my hands. Toss the Kavaj out and hope that it does someone Kavajing bastard some good. He shouted, we've got to lighten the load. I didn't argue. I dropped down the hatch and allowed my armor to accept most of the impact. We were still spinning, slower now, but spinning. I set the trunk down and kicked it towards the door, allowing centrifugal force to do the heavy lifting for me. The trunk slid out and fell over the side. I looked up the hatch in time to catch the second trunk. I set it down and kicked it towards the door as well. Five trunks of supplies later, I was forced to walk to the door and kick them out. The spin was slow and a lazy one now. The propellers were pointed downwards at an angle as if trying to add the road lift. The ship jerked as the falling settled into a slow glide. I started to relax. A thumb sounded beside me causing me to jump. Keep cavaging bailing, I shouted. We're nowhere near out of the woods. I pushed the trunk overboard. The airship pilots angled us towards the ground. A whistling sound came from above our heads. Kavaj! Shide shouted simultaneously with Reynolds. It happened faster than I'd hoped, Reynolds called down. We've got to start picking up speed again real soon. True to his word, I felt a shudder as we dipped forward. More cursing followed, and then the ship corrected itself. We were once more sailing towards the ground. The airships are not vehicles designed for great speed. Even when crashing, it is like you are moving in slow motion. I watched a forest swing into view below and after a few minutes of staring at the door like an idiot, I was fairly certain that we were going to hit it. At first, it appeared seemed slow, almost lazy, but as we drew closer, I finally began to appreciate how fast we were really going. The treetops were by just below like giant bats hopping to crack on an enormous piñata. I spun around and saw Yans and Yakimo that were still fighting the engine, trying to coax a bit more spin out of it. I ran up to them and yanked my shoulders. We're out of time, I shouted as I shoved them towards the ladder. I knew, even as I did it, there wouldn't be enough time for even one of us to make it up to the top of the hatch. The first three tops struck that moment I was sent airborne. Then, strangely, I found myself floating in midair with an invisible hand grabbed me. We all froze. Even with enhanced strength, whatever gripped us was irresistible. I couldn't move, even if I wanted to. Expanding my lungs enough to breathe out wasn't a question. Air froze my throat, and the trees splintered around us. Bolson ship whined and then coughed about black smoke. The invisible grip let us go, and I crashed to the floor. I understood immediately what had happened. Wilson had overloaded the shuttle's force fields. For a precious few seconds, our crumbling airship was practically indestructible. The trees that had been tearing into us exploded from the impact. Each explosion of timber robbed us of that much more inertia from us. I rolled to the side to see a tree slice through the floorboards, a mere walking face. I stumbled to my feet and was immediately thrown back off of them when we experienced our final impact. The nose of the ship had hard struck the earth and buckled inwards. The mortar in a hull cracked and burst. I rolled my head over heels and struck Volson's ship. Its hull was hot to the touch. I barely had a moment to collect my thoughts before the wall I found myself popped open and disappeared. I tumbled into Volson, Scrake, and Summer. I apologize, Jason, Volson said quickly. My craft was severely damaged in the attack and I was unable to recover flight capabilities. You did fine, I groaned as I extracted my limbs from the tangle of flesh around me. That was a good thought you had with the end of overloading the force field. I was uh, inspired by your crew, she admitted at last. Her legs twitched as if she wanted to perform a nervous dance her kind favor didn't stress. Inspired, I asked. 
They were trying to start the engines and fill the balloon, she explained. It was sure to fail, but they were trying to do something, anything that might increase the chances of survival. I realized that something, even if it doesn't work, is better than nothing and decided on a gamble. I snorted. Wilson, I think we're rubbing off on you, I commented. Rubbing off? She asked. I'll explain later, I told her. Right now we need to check for survivors. I started to take a step when the full realization of a conversation struck me. We were talking. Her telepathic jammer was offline and the rest of the ship. Oh crap. I shook myself out and clambered up the rope ladder, which was now hanging askew. The upper floor fared but better than the lower deck, but not by much. Bits of broken mortar and wood were scattered everywhere. In the middle of it was the shredded remains of our bunks. Ball people lay huddled just off to one side. Hookson lay sprawled face down on the floor. A bloody smear left a reminder as she had skidded. Shide laid an undignified tangle amongst the wreckage of the bunks. As for the two former captains... All I'm saying, I heard Reynolds in a low voice muttering, is that I've flown with you in two different ships, and both of them ended up crashing. You're alive, I sighed with relief. For various measures are alive, Reynolds agreed. He leaned back and I felt my blood run cold. A tree had crashed through the windshield of the craft. Jutting from Reynolds' chest and Rhymer's upper arm was a broken and bloodied branch of the tree. I felt sick as I watched Reynolds struggle to breathe. Rhymer groaned and looked up at me. I fear it did something to my arm, he said. I can't move it anymore. Lucky you, Reynolds chuckled. Anyone going to help me get off this thing? Rhymer reached over with his good arm, the left one, and gripped Reynolds around the shoulder. Wait, I said as I stepped forward, pulling it out can cause more damage. The stupid suit, Reynolds grunted, said it can't perform emergency surgery with an obstruction in the way. I think that it means we need to pull it out. Emergency surgery. Battlefield armor, right. I grabbed his shoulder and helped Rhymer pull. Reynolds screamed in pain, but it didn't stop us. The branch extricated itself and we wet, plopping sound. A trickle of blood appeared in his armor before stopping. As I watched the surface of the armor seem to knit together to patch over the hole. Says structural integrity will be reduced by 7%, Reynolds grunted. Not sure if that means me or the suit. Now it says it'll administer drugs. I'm hoping it's talking about me. With that, his eyes rolled to the back of his head and he sighed. Not to be a bother, Rhymer said at last, but could you perhaps assist me as well? I stepped closer and grabbed Rhymer's shoulder with one hand and the broken remnant of the branch with the other. I heaved and heard another wet popping sound. I looked at his armor and saw it repairing itself as well. I'm being chided for not undergoing scheduled maintenance, he grunted. Weak points have developed in the armor. Apparently, I have a broken humerus as well and a torn rotator cuff. It wants me to perform surgery on me. Think I should let it? I was about to tell him to let it do its job when a strange look came over his face. My mistake, he groaned, wasn't a choice. His eyes rolled to the back of his head too. Shide and Hookson stepped closer. Anyone want to punch me in the face? Shide asked. Looks like good stuff. I could go for some crap right now. Hookson rolled her eyes. Yob though for me, she said dryly, or wetly. Her voice was thick with distorted due to a bloody nose. I was relieved to see that the swollen nose was the worst of her injuries. Shide hooked her his hands under Reynolds' limp form and dragged him towards the hatch. Hookson followed a moment later. Wait, I said, dragging figures. Do you think it's safe to move them? Boom, that filled the hydrogen. Hookson grunted. You think it's safe, Pierre? Good point. I ran over and grabbed Reynolds' feet and helped Shy take him down the ladder before scrambling back to assist Hookson. Strangely enough, other than a few bruises, our two engineers were unharmed. Scrake and Summer had been relatively safe inside Volson's craft, leaving Reynolds and Rhymer the most severely injured. The most, that is, as long as one didn't include the twins who had been tossed out of the ship when we first were hauled back into the atmosphere. I tried to push aside speculation as to what had happened to them. I knew the odds were that they were nothing more than a spatter of grease on a metal somewhere a few hundred miles behind us. I preferred to think as the chimeric armor had come up with some last-minute safety feature and left them unharmed. I knew the odds were pretty slim, though. 
After all, look at what the collision did to the tree did to Reynolds and Reimer. As we dumped the two former captains out on the ground, I heard a thump from within the ship. I was half afraid something was about to explode, but uh, to my relief, it was just Lee dropping down the hatch. He looked unharmed. He was followed by Jack and Heather. They also seemed to be unhurt. Why were people of the least experience around airships the ones who seemed to come out the best? I had a sneaky suspicion the answer was that more experienced crew put themselves in places that were dangerous. We checked for fires, Lee explained as he climbed out. It's a mess, but nothing seems to be burning for the moment. The professor appeared a moment later. The risk of an explosion is pretty slight anyway, she said. That's a lot of hydrogen, but once it starts leaking, it's going to get diluted very soon. Where were you guys? I asked. I didn't see you when you when I went upstairs. Heather pointed up to the deflating gas bag. In there, she said. When the bag ruptured, Lee climbed inside an opening and tried to seal it up from the inside. We followed. He took a bunch of sheets from the bunks and shoved them into that gum that the coat ballooned with. Lee's complexion darkened slightly. Was he blushing? I knew it wouldn't hold up, but I hoped that it might slow it down, he stammered. I figured that the sealant was used but was really sticky, and if I could just cover the hole, it might help. He shrugged. He was firing a laser to get the sealant runny, Professor added. A thought, my eyes might pop free of my skull. You fired a laser inside a hydrogen-filled gas bag. Are you insane? I stammered. The professor sniffed. He just paid more attention in science class than you did, she said. Hydrogen by itself won't burn. It's the reaction between oxygen and hydrogen. Even then you need a spark to kick it off. The air he was breathing was sealed off and the pressure jetted out of the risk of oxygen getting in. I looked at her skeptically. I kept the beam low, Lee said. I was afraid it was a dumb idea too, but I was desperate. I relaxed a little. Remember what I said about how my friends weren't the ones putting themselves in danger? Yeah, never mind. Forget I said that. I looked up through the twisted remnants of the forest canopy and saw faint lines of the lattice passing before the sun. Looks like the lattice will be closing in a few hours, I said. I suggest we find some place to hunker down for the night and look for signs of civilization. Lights, maybe. Then, the morning, we make stretches to carry the wounded out. Lee and the professor nodded. Heather, I said to our navigator, how's the map of this area? Sketchy, she admitted. I turned off scanning just after we spotted the guns. I wanted to keep my armor powered up as much as possible. I only turned it back on a little while ago, and I'm still building. I nodded. I wasn't too surprised. When things go to hell, who thinks accurate cartography is a priority? Fine, I said. Just keep scanning and help us figure out the obstacles between here and wherever we decide to go in the morning. In the meantime, help the others with the campsite. The three of them walked off having received their orders, which left me standing there with Jack. She eyed the twisted wreckage of the Akina and idly toyed with a loose scrap of wood. It looked like a hinge to me. Akina was named after her mother. I squatted down beside her and tried to think of what to say. Look, Jack, I said at last. I'm sorry I was... Sorry about what? She interrupted me. I blinked in surprise. Her tone sounded almost accusatory. Jack, I stammered. She glared at me. What are you sorry about? She repeated between clenched teeth. The ship broke up, I said, and then confronted her naked anger. I did the most reasonable thing I could. I began babbling. I mean, after naming it after your mother and all of that, it seems like, you know, an insult that it goes down to pieces like that when we needed it, I jabbered. Well, not that I'm saying that your mother went to pieces. She didn't. Or maybe she did. You never told me, and maybe it's sort of appropriate, or well, maybe not. I just think that maybe... Hush! She ordered. I shut up. She studied me for a moment and then shook her head. No, she concluded. You're just being an idiot again. Probably, I admitted. What am I being an idiot about? She handed me the hinge. I looked down at it, and it was about to ask her why she gave it to me. My thumb slid along the smooth edge. I frowned. This looks like someone cut it, I said. Half cut, Jack corrected me. Someone sawed halfway down the hinge and let the pressure do the rest of the job for him. She took the hinge back from me. Neither of us said anything. We just left the silence drag between us as we took turns staring at the broken hinge both trying to come up with other plausible reason for the saw. Something 
that didn't imply that a traitor or a saboteur was amongst our crew. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 54, written by Sebi Loki. As the lattice closed, I dug in for what I was sure would be the longest night of my life. Our airship was destroyed, bad enough that made us pedestrians, but we were over halfway point of the sphere now. It would take us forever to walk to our destination and back to the gate. We'd die of old age first. Strange. A few months ago, being confined in one world for the rest of my life seemed normal. Now the idea seemed claustrophobic. I would die billions of miles away from any friends or family that I ever had. Worst of all, there was a moon-sized battleship floating out there beyond the walls that could be my salvation, but it may as well have been in another galaxy for all the good it did us. Hope that is just out of reach, the only thing that can make a hopeless situation feel even worse. I was trapped. I would probably die before too long as supplies gave out. Not much could make this situation worse. I knew better than to think of such things and immediately tried to stifle the thought. It was too late, though. No sooner had the thought crossed my synapses than I heard a snap of a twig breaking under someone's foot in the nearby woods. We had improvised a shelter out of the wreckage of the airship, and it seemed to make sense at the time. Sure, it was leaking hydrogen, but who cares? It would soon be depleted, and as long as we suppressed the urge to light up a few blowtorches, the worst we'd have to worry about was the suffocation. That was a minor risk, though, as the hydrogen is less dense than the air and would float upwards and disperse. Meanwhile, we had something reasonably solid that could protect us from the elements, and we didn't have to risk carrying the wounded. Why not stay there? Because, I realized as I scanned the area around us, the crash had announced our arrival to anyone who might have other ideas about our continued existence. Sticking near the crash site is a great idea if you assume someone benevolent is looking for you. Not so good, if they are in hostile territory. So far, very little of the sphere had presented itself as anything but hostile. I pumped up the light amplification on my visor and added an infrared overlay as well. Nothing. I then amplified my hearing and tried to make sense of the myriad of noises I heard. The others were inside the ship sleeping. I had assigned myself as first watch, as well as second and third, because, well, I wasn't sleeping tonight. No one else seemed to have that difficulty. I sat just outside the wrecked doorway of the craft, which meant that any rustling or breathing coming from behind me I could safely ignore. I just had to pay attention to what lay in the forest before me. Nothing. I heard nothing from that direction. No birds, no chirps of insects, and no croak of frogs. It was sepulchral. My heart thundered as I tried to process how wrong that really was. The console had at least appeared in infrared, but there was something out there that didn't appear on any high-tech scanner, but had frightened the animals away. I cycled through the available scanning equipment for simplicity's sake. Most of it worked as analogs to human senses, augmenting sight and sound. Very little of it seemed to help. I pinged the area with something that seemed to work similar to a Doppler radar. The resulting image was just confusion of cloudy colors and static. I guess the trees were causing problems. I switched over to sonar system. The signal seemed to get lost again. The radar and sonar were both giving confusing signs. How is that possible? There was nothing on this early industrial world that would be able to do that. Finally, in desperation, I slapped the palm of my hand on the ground and tried to grab a seismic reading. I picked up a faint vibration in the ground. Then another. Then another. They came regularly, like footsteps. I had a suit calculate the epicenter and turned to face that direction. Still nothing. Radar, sonar, light, heat, and everything else seemed to be jammed, yet the vibration was turning me differently. Before I could convince myself it was a dumb idea, I raised my free arm, the right one, and pointed it at the forest. I set the burners of my armor to maximum spread and maximum burn. It would cause a forest fire because I was paranoid. I fired anyway. 
The beams never struck the forest, instead they hit something else. A shimmer of energy rippled in the air just a few feet ahead of me. The laser spread out and followed over the around the object. Very briefly, a humanoid shape wearing bulky armor was highlighted in front of me. Crap! I screamed again, and raised my other hand to add the firepower. The suited figure charged. The first struck my face and I went rolling. The suited figure had still been running at me when I was attacked, which meant that there was a second one out there. Damn it, I screamed. Wake up, everyone, and armor up. Here I sat the burners on low power, little more than a light show, and spun and whipped my arms across my chest in a wide arc. Whatever the guys were wearing, it seemed to bend light around them. The burners were useless as a weapon. As a method of detection, they worked just fine, though. Ahead of me, to my left, the light burned at odd angle. I extended the blade and charged the empty air. My shoulder hit something, and I heard a grunt of pain. I punched the empty air, and the blade sunk into something. The air ripped in front of me, and I felt wet drip off of it and fall to the ground. I fell upon it and stabbed it a few more times for good measure. One down, how many more to go? Someone punched me again, and I fell as I reached out and grabbed something. I pulled and punched my blade in. Another grunt. Two down. Maybe. I slashed with the side of my blade and rolled away. Another thump. Someone tried to tackle me from behind. How many of these guys were there? I struggled, but they twisted my arms behind me and tried to pin me. I was amplifying my strength, but he was still holding. How? Unless the suits were amplifying their strength as well. One way to find out. I went limped, and the left assailant supporting my weight. He barely staggered as he compensated for the extra downward force. He was shifting his weight backwards to control his new epicenter of gravity. Good enough. I tensed my legs and kicked off the ground with every bit of strength I had. If I hadn't been wearing the armor, he would have been driven a few steps backwards as the center of gravity pivoted too far back. An annoyance more than the effective tactic. But, with the armor's help, it managed to get us both airborne. His weight and the fact that he was leaning backwards caused us to arc in a direction, and I fell on my back with him underneath me. We hit hard, and he let go, probably more due to reflex than actual injury. It didn't matter. I rolled off of him and reached towards my holster, where I had strapped my pistol. I came up firing. The damn pistol was an energy weapon, though, and all I got from my troubles was seeing the beams around me supine form. What I wouldn't give for a shotgun about now. Wait a second. I toggled the gun to select burst rounds. The pistol was meant as a general purpose weapon for warfare. Energy weapons worked on most species, humans being an odd exception, because it disrupted the nervous system and caused the creature to die. It was difficult to shield someone from the effect, and this made them preferred weapon for actually killing someone. But guns weren't just used to kill other people, contrary to what some gun control groups would tell you. Guns were also used as tools in warfare. Sometimes you need to shoot the lock off or punch a hole into something that didn't have a nervous system. Burst arounds were pretty simple concept. Take a compact force field, accelerate it to ridiculous speeds, aim it at something you once smashed, End of concept. I shot twice in that direction of where the beam had bent, and the ground exploded, indicating the first shot went wide. The second, though, released a red mist into the air. That one was definitely down. I raised my burner and located another, and shot him in the head with the burster. Down he went. There was a rumble from the ship, and I glanced in that direction. I saw an armored head poking out of the doorway. Good, my crew was finally waking up and joining the fight. I turned back towards my invisible assailants and froze. The helmet had the wrong shape to it. I cursing, I spun and faced the figure stepping out of the ship, and I got hit full in the chest with a beam of purple light. My knees buckled, and I fell into a kneeling position as I struggled to catch my breath. More purple light hit me. The world swam. I struggled to regain my footing. If I jumped to the side, maybe I could... More purple light. My fingers spasmed and I dropped my pistol. Humans aren't immune to energy weapons, just highly resistant. My nervous system was going into revolt as I tried to scramble the signals that were going everywhere. Another bolt struck me and I fell over. 
I couldn't control my muscles. I felt myself threatening to go under and fought it the only way I knew how. I ordered the suit to hit me with a stimulant. The pain flared brighter and I wanted to scream. I couldn't control my throat though, so all I could do was breathe sharper. Breathing. I was still breathing. Focus on breathing. Focus on rhythm. My body was still working. It wasn't broken. It was just confused. Let it sort out the signals. My eyes swam in and out of focus. Shapes materialized in front of me. They looked almost human shape. Almost. But the dimensions were wrong. The shoulders were low on the body, squat arms and legs protruding from the rounded form that made me think of a bean. There was some no neck, and the body stretched up over the shoulders and rounded itself into a helmeted head. Their armor was bulkier than my own and had stripes running along the surface. They seemed to be used to project some sort of field that surrounded their body. The camouflage, I guessed. The figure grunted at one another and what I assumed was the language, but my symbiote refused to translate. One of them grabbed me by the leg and dragged me forward. Pain erupted from where it touched and washed over me. Of course pain would sort itself out first. Why did I expect any different? There was seemed to be seven of them standing, five lay scattered on the ground. One of the ones on the ground stood up and clutched the side as if in pain. I had apparently not killed that one. A second joined him later, but this one seemed to be about to fall over any second. A charred pattern covered his breastplate, and I had shot that one and it damaged his armor, it seemed, and something else seemed to be wrong with him as he wobbled on his feet and grunted at the others while pointing at me. I was fairly certain that I hadn't made any friends that night. The standing members climbed inside the ship, Moments later, they climbed back out, each carried a member of my crew in a fireman's carry. Volson was awake and screaming in Iranian language. I wasn't being translated either. Were they jamming or was my brain just too adult to translate? The others all carried humans. Yagimo, Jans, Huxen, Reimer and Reynolds were carried out first. The latter two seemed to be bleeding extensively. They carried them to the point in the forest and dropped them, except that the unconscious figures didn't fall all the way to the forest floor. They stopped a few inches off the ground as if they were laying on top of something. The figures went back inside the ship and came out a moment later with Heather, Lee, the Professor, Jack and Scrake. Lastly, Summer came out under her own power. I felt a surge of anger at first until I noticed her arms were held up by her side. She and Scrake didn't have armor. I reminded myself, when they came in, she had probably surrendered just to keep them from killing her. A red trickle oozing down from Scrake's head gave me an idea of what refusing to cooperate yielded. After the others were dumped on the invisible transport, only Volson and Summer appeared to be conscious amongst us, but I suppose the others were just stunned like I was. Two of the fingers climbed into the air ahead of us, while the others climbed onto another invisible transport. We were then whisked away through the forest. Technology, I thought, highly advanced technological as well, on par with our own, possibly chimeric, but if it was, it seemed to be from a later generation of development, or maybe for troops that had need for stealth. Was this the armor of some elite troop? I wish I could contact Dyer and ask the ship, if for no other reason than I had recovered the use of my mouth. We rode in silence for what felt like hours. As we rode, I felt the pain subside in my body. I flexed my fingers. Stuff. But they worked. I was recovering. Within an hour, I'd be almost back to fighting shape. No reason to announce that, however. I laid still and pretended to be more severely incapacitated than I really was. Maybe. Maybe, if I was really lucky, we could steal some of these stealth transports. That may not get us a ferry, but it had to be faster than walking. I tried to form a plan as we bumped along, then I found myself blinded. I closed my eyes and I put my tongue to keep from screaming. I still had my vision amplified for the night and we were now inside some sort of tunnel that had artificial lights. I dialed back the amplification to normal levels and opened my eyes. I was still bright and my eyes watered, but they adjusted soon enough. We were going down a long slope with abstract lights overhead. They zoomed past almost too fast to see. I tried to estimate how far we were descending based on how many lights was by. 
Then I remembered that I had no idea how far apart the track lights were spaced and gave up on counting them. When he went down a long way. The transport slowed and I found myself sitting on a pile of my friends inside what appeared to be a well-lit cavern. It looked natural, but that was ridiculous. Nothing on the sphere was natural. This too must have been sculpted. But why? Why make an enormous cavern deep within the earth where no inhabitants would likely see it? I was shoved off the heap and landed face down on the hard stone surface of the cavern. I fought the reflex to brace myself and allowed myself to flop limply to the ground. Keep up the act, Jason. Just a bit longer. Then something really bad happened. Extraordinarily bad. I mean, super horribly, holy crap, we're in major damn trouble bad. I felt something snap the back of my armor and key the emergency unlock. The armor is meant to be deliberately tough to remove, but sometimes you need to get the armor off in a hurry. The sequence was meant to allow someone the ability to get damaged or malfunctioning armor off and dump them into a surgery pot with minimal hassle. It wasn't meant for someone to strip you perfectly good armor off so then leave you naked and helpless in a cabin floor, which didn't stop them from doing just that to me. I felt the armor fall away from me. I was lying on my stomach with an extremely vulnerable but squashed underneath me against the rock. I heard clicks and whirs in the side and realized that they were doing the same thing to my friends. A foot slid under me and kicked me over onto my back. Enough pretending. I tried to strike back. I came up swinging and was knocked flat on my rear once more. My brains marked as if they were rattling in my skull. A right cross to the jaw hurts when you don't have a helmet. Just take my word for it that you've never had it happen. It hurts. I lay down on the hard rock and tried to catch my breath as the creature that towered above me split in two or three and swarm around the room. The creature was no longer wearing armor. Or perhaps it never had any in the first place. I couldn't tell if I was part of that party or assaulted us. It was approximately normal height for a human but covered in a shaggy orange hair. Now I could see the body had almost a teardrop shape with a stubby arms and legs. There was no nose, but it did have a very large eyes and a wide mouth. Under the circumstances, I might have actually thought it looked cute. It sort of reminded me of one of the monsters from Sesame Street. But no, this was no friendly puppet waiting to teach me about the differences from near and far. Its eyes were narrowed in anger and its lips were twisted in a snarl. It grunted at me. I just gaped. I blew out the air between my teeth and twisted my body to look to one side. It grunted, yet another of its kind. I looked in that direction. I saw my friend sitting there, just as naked as I was. Under the circumstances, I might have gawked at Heather or the professor. Sorry, folks, I'm a guy. It's the sort of thing that we do. But no. At the moment, my eyes were transfixed on the figures of Reynolds and Reimer. Their armor had been removed as well. It was also blatantly obvious that the only thing that they had been keeping them alive thus far was the armor's built-in surgical capacities. Now removed, I could now see the bad wounds that really were. Rhymer's arm was cut open to the bone while Reynolds' chest had a crater just the right where his heart should be. Blood oozed from their wounds. Both of them had ashy complexions. Reynolds' breath was labored, almost as if he was drowning. Rhymer seemed to be unconscious. I was afraid, but upon seeing the two people I'd known for all these months laying there dying and my friends naked on the cold stone, I found that I wasn't just scared. No, a slow burn of anger had lit a fuse inside of me. I scared my friend's faces. Lee gripped the professor's hand tightly. He didn't look at her, but there was something protective in his attitude. Jack looked defiant as always, hands clenched in fists glaring at our attackers. Heather looked embarrassed, one arm draped over her breasts, her eyes looked wet. The anger grew. I turned to face our attackers. The big one that towered over me grunted at the others. One of them pointed at me and grunted. The big one grunted back and seemed quizzical. The other pointed at me again. The big one made a weird coughing sound. No, it wasn't a cough, it was a laugh. Everything went red. I was no longer afraid. Steeding myself, I kicked upwards where the human's testicles would be. Good news, these things kept theirs in the safe region. 
The big guy doubled over as his eyes crossed. I scrambled to my feet as he shook himself from the stupor. He roared in rage and turned to face me. From the ground, he looked almost comical, like a fuzzy gumdrop. Now I realized that I was looking at the lump of solid muscle. He swung his arm at me. I tried to dodge, but I was too slow and caught at me in the shoulder. I went tumbling. My bare knees and elbows struck the rock painfully. I rolled across the stone floor, leaving flayed bits of flesh behind as a raw screen scraped everywhere. The shock of the cold hit me and I choked. I had rolled onto a shallow basin of water. I tried to sip and catch my breath. The big creature jumped in on top of me and slammed my head back into the water. He held me by my throat. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I would drown any moment now. Like how I would. I had my hands on my wrists trying to break his grip from my neck. I abandoned that and now reached out into the water looking for a weapon of some sort. My question, hands found a rock. The rock still gripped in my hand, found the side of his skull a moment later. Now, he let go. I burst out the water, gasping for breath, but I didn't stop moving. He held a paw to his head where a trickle of blood oozed. His eyes rolled in my direction and widened. I hit him in the face with a rock. I struck him again and again, forcing him backwards. I was breathing heavily, still trying to catch my breath, but I wasn't letting him get away from me either. Again and again the rock struck home. He tried to block me, but everywhere he put his hands just left another opening. Teeth flew from his mouth one moment, blood seeped from his hidden ear the next. I struck over and over again until he slipped onto the damp rock and fell backwards. Now I leapt and it was me sitting on his chest reaching down for him. But he didn't have a neck for me to throttle and his head wasn't in the water, so I couldn't drown him. No matter, I wasn't letting him off that easily. I grabbed the sides of his head and stiffened my thumbs. I plunged them into his eye sockets without hesitating to think about the sanity of such an action. He screamed and bucked, forcing me to roll off of him. He surged to his feet and groped around blindly for me. I was behind him, though. I threw myself into his knees and he fell forward. His head struck the stone floor with a sickening thud. He tried to stand up. Slowly, I found another rock, a bigger one this time, one that required two hands to lift. I knelt down in front of him and slammed the rock onto his head. He stopped trying to stand up. Granda! 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 Voices chanted behind me, exhausted. I twisted around to find a dozen of the hairy creatures advancing towards me. I raised my cut and bleeding fists warily and tried to look mean. A weird thing happened then. Something changed in my head. The grunts now had a weird echoing effect. It recognized it as a symbiote jamber being switched off. No need for that, someone from the crowd said. One of the hairy creatures, this one wearing a silvery croak, pushed itself to the front. Granda is what we call our leader. The croak wearing monster explained. Since you just beat our old one to a bloody pulp, I think it's safe to say that you just got his job. What? I stammered. The creature made a coughing chuckle. My name is Mulfa, he grunted, first clergyman of the Holy Changes. I assume that you've been sent here to inspect our work? What? I asked, still confused. The symbiote seemed to be translating, but the words made no sense. The creature took a step backwards. You're the inspector, right? It asked. You're wearing the armor of the Changes. Changes... Chimera. Oh, yes, I said. We're from the, um, changes. Who are you again? I just told you my name. Oh, you mean our workforce. We're Unit 731 of the Tertiary Superstructure Maintenance Brigade 12. You don't have a roster. Maintenance Brigade, I repeated. He clicked in place. You're the maintenance crew for the sphere, I said. He pointed to the fallen form on the ground in front of me. Well, Falf there was a part of the security, he admitted, as were the guys who rounded you up. Guess we'll need to get another chief for that, right? Again, a coughing laugh. A thought struck me. Um, I said, it's kind of cold down here. Is it all right if my friends and I get dressed now? Oh, sure, he said as he waved a hand. Your friends have already started working on those two guys with the injuries. Looks bad. We've got a surgery pod down here, just a bit down the tunnel. You want that we should take care of them, boss? 
I blinked and looked over where Heather and Jack were trying to force the damaged chest plate of the Reynolds armor back in place over his injury. Yes, I said quickly. Get them patched up fast. Right, boss, he said as he waved his minions to take the lead. I looked around for my own discarded armor. A hand landed on my shoulder, and I yelped in surprise. I spun around and found Lee backing away, holding his hands up in a non-threatening way. Just me, Jason, he said. Just me. I relaxed a trifle and looked at the ground again for my armor. Um, Jason, he said at last. What, um, happened back there? I got angry, I said simply. No, he corrected me. Angry people don't charge a yeti and perform an amateur lobotomy on them. Not unless they're named Banner and have a bad experience with gamma rays, anyway. Was that a geek joke? I asked in surprise as I turned to face him. Uh, don't change the subject, he said. What happened? I shrugged. Reynolds and Reimer were dying, I pointed out. My friends were helpless. This guy started laughing at us. I shrugged again, and I repeated. I got angry. He stared at me for a moment and shook his head. Jason, he said at last, I hope that I stay on your good side. He walked away to help the others in trying to put the armor back on our injured crew. The deadliest man I'd ever met thinks that I'm dangerous and unhinged. What does that suggest about my sanity? I went looking for the lost pieces of my armor. End of chapter The Fourth Wave Include Overseer Written by Semi Loki The sky outside blazed with light, but that was not unusual. The planet belonged to a binary system, whose tossed between a brilliant white star and a small ruddy door like a child's ball. The planet received erratic amounts of sunlight, creating an unstable climate. Or, at least, it would if it had an atmosphere. The planet known as Overseer had none. Boiled away by the intense heat of the white star for half of its cycle and then frozen as it looped around the dwarf star. Overseer's atmosphere had dissipated to little more than wisps of gas clinging to the surface. That was part of the reason of all the choice of Overseer as the center of the galactic government. The planet was sterile, completely incapable of supporting life of any kind. Even bacteria died under the constant bombardment of radiation. But that was not the only reason. Another reason was its location, which, not coincidentally, was also why the sky burned with light no matter what time of year or which star Overseer was currently orbiting. The galactic core was a beacon of light. Mulcryeth was a wise gazed upon the sight through the shielded and polarized dense plating that formed all outward-facing windows within the planet-wide city that covered Overseer. Through the plating he received only the barest fraction of light shining down upon the world. Absolutely none of the hard radiation vomited forth from the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy penetrated. If the shielding failed, he would be dead before he knew there was a problem, suffocating from lack of oxygen, boiled by radiation, and burned by starlight. Maybe that's why I stand here. A small part of him that was still able to rebel abused. Maybe I'm hoping. Your presence is required, wise one, a voice called from overhead. He could not wince nor sigh. His physiology would not allow it. Even if he could, other forces prevented that. I hear, he found himself saying, an appropriate gesture. Reluctantly, he turned away from the window and worked his way down the corridor. Physically, he was fairly average specimen for a Havar. At the moment, he was intermediate gender, neither male nor female. He had only cycled from male recently, however, and still thought of himself as such. His female form would not become dominant for another eight standard years, at which point he would have to suspend his duties as a high counselor to return to the swamps of the Hub for mating. If I live that long, he thought. His ample bulk inched across the floor rather than walking, muscles stretched and contracted to slide his single foot along the floor. On top of the body, millions of cilia danced like blades of grass in an unseen breeze. Havar lacked arms and legs. Many believed that this was part of the reason his kind made such an excellent counselors. 
The Cydia were his only means of manipulating anything, while there were many of them that covered his entire body, save for his mouth and foot, they had limited reach. Every movement the Havar made, from feeding to frolicking, was slow and calculated. A lifetime of caution ingrained a wisdom that more frantic species could never understand. My flaps opened and closed, allowing him to take glimpses of the corridor. Havar did not stare. They looked, they absorbed, they memorized. Continuous monitoring of the corridor was unnecessary at the pace he moved. What rapid changes could he expect? There were no predators on Havar and his home world, and few hazards beyond physical ones. What could not be avoided slowly could not be avoided at all. His purple-hued bulk, a color signifying his advancing age, eased down the corridor and into the council room. He allowed himself a momentary luxury of opening his eye flaps to regard the room's splendor as his normal custom. The ceiling arched above him in a perfect dome, projecting upon it a constant updating map of the entire galaxy. Bits of information were relaying about the status of all the planets under the governorship were relayed to his ship. A famine on Cantanoon, a flood on Balol, and a minor strike on Fishnon. All was reported at a glance. More easily, past information was funneled to the consoles that formed a horseshoe shape of the council bench, allowing each council member to make rapid executive decisions on how best to dedicate resources. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Anger and disappointment gnawed at him as he took his place at the outer edge of the bench. Though he was on the high council, he was still a junior member. I am in attendance, he said firmly. The system acknowledged him and information was relayed to him both as words on a screen, only so that he could see, and as the steady murmur projected only he could hear. Data, impartial and unbiased, now tainted. Malkriath, Yal Suthnal, a more senior Havar council member, currently female but too old for breeding, asked without preamble, Your objections for relocating military resources still remain? Yes, he replied. The activity detected at this time is curious, but not alarming. I see no evidence of an imminent threat. Even at best acceleration, a full-scale invasion would take several standard years to arrive. By my calculations, Four to forty, depending on the scale of the invasion. I see no reason to discontinue monitoring for significant changes in activity. General Halflong makes a compelling case, she pointed out. Very compelling, he thought. Almost enough to guarantee a two-thirds majority needed to overrule Malkriath's objections. However, even if Malkriath would change his vote, they would still be one vote shy of a majority. Very well, Yel Suthnal declared. The motion is defeated. Your observations will be added to the record, and the chimeric activity will be merely monitored for now. The audience chamber there was actively from the co-council, probably the military division revising its strategy. There was little that they could do with the high council blocking the motion, however. The low council had the power, in theory, to override any decision made by the high council, the 15 councillors forming the High Council carried 50% of the vote. The 150 Low Council members carried another 50%. If the various military advisors could get enough support to provide a clear majority, then yes, it was possible for the Low Council to push through a motion over the objections of the High Council. However, such actions were indeed rare. Council members tended to align with various factions forming voting blocks that helped ally factions while hindering enemy factions. Votes were bartered amongst the councillors and the military division had performed no great favours in recent history to purchase enough votes to support its case. Thus, like most motions brought before the council, the rule of the High Council was the rule of the law. Their will was rarely thwarted. A pity, he thought privately. New business, Popok, a Thrall met a harem who was a junior member of the High Council spoke up. There's a blight on Apvin and has wiped out much of the food stocks for the next year. Although amino acid replacement is on hand for emergency use, it is predicted that the famine may result in three seasons if the blight is not addressed. 
source of the blight, Yal Suthnar asked. It was a formality as she had probably already accessed the relevant records. An invasive fungus of Oif Papa confirmed. I propose we relocate surplus food supplies from Sibaglu and import fungus side to Haplo. Routine business and the motion passed without incident. Malkriath found himself relaxing as the task flowed past without hindrance. To his surprise, however, near the end of the session apparently an unimportant action that caused his mind to burn. Leafwin water rights, naturally, allow all to follow a Malden who displayed a rare temperament to become a high counselor, was saying, and Nexus traffic will only be minimally impacted. All in favor. Mulcryoth had only been half paying attention to his motion. It was fairly standard contract where the corporation wished to plead for permission to extract natural resources from a protected planet. In this case, Leafwind, a planet with a proto-sentient species that necessitated the protected status. The species was an aquatic one, found only in the northern hemisphere in an inland sea. The proposal addressed resources found in the southern hemisphere. Environmental impact assessments showed negligible change to the planetary ecosystem, if any, and risk of impact to the species was an absurdly small fraction of a percent above zero. In short, there was no reason to object. He found himself doing so anyway. Nay, he voted. Sal Lothar opened her eyes flaps and studied him as he spoke. Nay, she asked. You yourself introduced the proposal allowing a minimal resource exploitation in developing worlds. You have voted yea on much riskier operations. Why do you object to this one? Leaf wind is still pristine, he said. In other instances, the developing cultures were still rudimentary at best. Leafwinders are already tool users. I failed to see the relevance, she admitted. The resources belong to them, Malkrioth declared. If we mine them, we deprive their future generations. She considered this. It will be many thousands of years before they develop enough to need the radium deposits indicated, she pointed out. Until then, it is actually a hazard. Much of it will decay before they can use it. Is it not better to harvest it than allow it to go to waste? It is not a waste, he said. We have yet to present them the option of selling it. There was a murmur amongst the council members. I changed my vote to nay, Popcock said. Malkriath earns a title today. He is showing wisdom. The world belongs to the natives, and it is not our right to exploit resources that they could benefit from either industrially or economically. Six other council members changed their votes as well. The motion was easily defeated. But why? The risk was there was a radium mining. The session eventually drew to a close and Macriath was dismissed to return to his private chambers. He moved slowly even for his kind, prolonging his brief reprieve. Excellent! A voice said it, he said as the door opened. You performed well, Master Councillor Member. Malkriath wanted to rebel against the voice, to push away the invading presence that gnawed at its own thoughts. His will was overridden as usual. My thanks, great one, he said, an obedient puppet as always. The Chimera sat in a chair in a room. He could sense that from the smells he carried her olfactory glands and wavering cilia. Opening his eye flaps would confirm that he refused to do that. My eye flaps... One token place that I still have some control. It didn't matter in any case. He knew what he would see if he looked. The Chimera's nearest form was both disturbing and, in another sense, predictable. After all, of all the creatures the Chimera had encountered, this one seemed to have fancied their weird cult-like mentality for the longest. There was a thud as the Chimera sprang from its chair and landed on its bipedal feet. Feet that would seem too small to support its gangly frame, a mostly hairless body save for the top of its head that displayed a weird bilateral symmetry. Two arms, two legs, two eyes, but only one nose and mouth, a mouth full of blunt teeth, and had no tail, yet maintained excellent balance as it walked. A hand stroked Malkriath's top, a hand that ended in five digits. Malkriath wished that he could recoil from the touch but the creature did not loosen its grip in his mind to permit it. Humans were not supposed to have psi abilities. Why had the Chimera deviated in this one regard? 
You may ask one question, the Gamera said at last, as a reward for your performance today. Will you allow me to die now? was the question he wanted to ask, but he already knew the answer to that one. Not while he was still useful. He asked another question instead. Why do you wish to preserve Leaf Wind? he asked. The grip tightened on his mind once more and his own thought struggled to take form. The Chimera made a weird barking sound. After? We care nothing for that planet, the Chimera replied. You should know that such things are beneath our notice. He wanted to ask why he had been forced to vote it up, but the grip on his mind would be loosened to allow him that freedom. Why? What did they care if a species was barely at all using with the private radium? Unless... Yes, the Chimera confirmed. Good. I feel the answer forming in your mind. Excellent. The Nexus Gate, of course. The Chimera didn't care about the planet. They just want a corporation sending regular traffic through those gates. Traffic. They might notice irregular movements using those same gates. Whatever the Chimera were planning, it must involve a sector of the galaxy. But why? What could it possibly be of use to them there? He wanted to ponder it more, but his thoughts were frozen again. The Chimera wanted to ask a question. As for the other matter, the Chimera asked, have they been located? No, Malkriath stated flatly. A representative of the church organized a search party and seemed to be tracking them, but they have fallen out of contact. The creature hissed. Malkriath did not understand what that meant, but it was not permitted to ask. How could humans have found the means to steal one of our ships? The Chimera asked. It wasn't a real question, and Malkriath was not permitted to speculate. He waited for more instructions. I wish you to send another search party, the Chimera said at last. Propose it tomorrow, one from your military faction. A thought occurred to him. He tried to bury it. The Chimera faltered mentally ordered him to speak. We have just refused to allow the military to scale up action, stating the Chimera posed no threat. He blurted. If we order the military to search for humans and the Chimera ship, that implies we do think that there is a threat, and that would only lend weight to their cause when the motion comes up for vote again. The mental clamps came down. Yes, the Chimera admitted. You are right. So wise, Counselor. I'm so happy that you're here to advise our cause. Very well. Not the military. Perhaps the police, then? Pursue it as a theft of museum property. Malkriath acknowledged this order and hated himself for it. Please, humans. A small part of his mind that was still his own begged. Flee! Hide! Do not let them find you! A hopeless prayer, he knew. For sooner or later they would be found. Where could they hide a ship that size? When they were found, they would be brought to the overseer. Whenever that happened, Malkriath knew his own usefulness ended. He would be permitted to terminate himself and thus spare himself the ruin that the rest of the galaxy would witness with the return of the Chimera. A return that he had aided. For whatever reason, though, the Chimera were not willing to advance their plans until the rogue humans were found. Whatever else the humans might be, weapons of war or cosmic insult to sentience, they worried the Chimera. As this moment, they were the only remaining obstacle before the inevitable fourth wave. Run, the humans! Fly away! Flee while you still can! You may sleep now, the Chimera ordered. Minecraft's mind shut down before he could form another thought. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 55 Written by Sebi Loki I was still snapping bits of armor in place when Mulfa finally returned. We only had one surgery pod, he explained, and the one with the chest wound had already died, so we put him in first. I almost panicked before I recalled that dead had more than one meaning with galactics. Billy Crystal's character from Princess Bride was closer to the mark than I liked to think. What about the other? I asked. He's stable for the moment, Mulfa confirmed. As long as we keep him in that armor... The armor can use some patching, though. Want us to do what while we're here? Was I really hearing this? 
Yes, I ordered. Check everyone's armor and see if it needs any work. Sure thing, boss, he said cheerfully. The mood of this yeti folk seemed to be improving since I took command. They moved with purpose and enthusiasm, although it was difficult to see faces under all the fur. I got the impression that they were smiling. Lights within the cabin brightened up, and the clean-up crew came in to remove the body with the former leader and tidy up the cave. Six of the yetis were sweeping the floor clean with ancient dust, while another two came in to drain the puddle where I had so recently been duking it out. I know that when the inspectors arrive it's business as usual to hide your normal violations, but why did they seem so happy about it? Molpa seemed to be positively glowing. I had a sneaky suspicion that the Chimera were up to their old bioengineering shenanigans again. Who could ask for a better servant than one that had wanted to be dominated? One that needed to be subservient to others. What's more, one that absolutely sucked at leading themselves. As if to affirm my suspicions, I saw several yetis open up a storage closet and pull out coveralls similar to the ship-issued ones. They shook the dust from them and started getting dressed. Naked barbarians until someone came in and took charge. Chimera were jerks. I heard a beeping sound from behind me and Molpa made a coughing laugh again. I turned to see him holding up a small silver box and pointing it at me. Did none of you guys think to scan them before you tried capturing them? Molpa asked a pair of still naked yeti. He's a full captain. I'm surprised he let as many of you live as he did. Must have caught him in a good mood. My nanites, I recalled, identifying me as captain. The silver box must have been some sort of scanner. As if to prove the point, it ran it over my armor and frowned. The suit is generation three, he muttered. Where are they out of the vibes? I didn't answer. I pushed past him and went to search for my crew. I found them in the nearby corridor. The tunnel, like the main cabin, looked natural, but was also lit by some unidentified source. To my relief, all of them were wearing their armor again. Heather spied me first and retreated a few steps as I approached. What in the world? She glanced away from me and refused to make eye contact. The visor on her helmet slid down, leaving me to assume that she was looking at maps again, or possibly pretending to look at maps. Is everyone all right? I asked. It's fine, someone gasped from the other floor. Ryma, he still looked ashen, but his eyes were focused now. The stain on the armor was crimson, but the blood was already drying, indicating that the new blood was no longer seeping out. He forced a weak smile onto his lips and maintained his steady gaze. Just waiting my turn, he added. Seems that I was in less severe than the injured list. How do you feel? I asked. I, I had been shot, stabbed, and left to die, he admitted. But otherwise, great, yourself. Like I wrestled with a bear, I said absently. From what I understand, that isn't far off, he chuckled. Having a bad day, are we, Captain? I ignored this comment and changed the subject. Do you know anything about these, um, people? I asked. He rocked his head and the severe negative. The legends about all the species in the world is far more complete, though, he admitted. It could be that the word of them just hasn't gotten to Newton. I wasn't too surprised. I searched for Summer and found her sitting nearby with her head facing down. What about your friend? I asked. Does he have any ideas? She was quiet for a moment and I half thought she hadn't heard me. To my surprise, her answer was quick and to the point. They are haploids, she said. He thought that they were extinct over a thousand years ago. Haploids? I asked. Well, at least one species had a proper Star Trek sounding name. I turned to face Rhymer again. Any stories about haploids? I asked. No, Summer interrupted. That's not their species. That's what they are. No, I was lost. Haploids, the professor spoke up, serving as a science to English translator on my behalf, are cells that contain only half of the chromosomes for the usual organism. I looked at her and she rolled her eyes. We're talking about sex, dear, she said stiffly. An egg and sperm and those haploid cells... Technically, they are gametes as they are able to unite and form a new organism with a new genetic code from either parent. Now I remembered my junior year, Mrs. Mills, our biology teacher, with a beet red face trying to discuss mitosis and meiosis, was growing embarrassed because of the class clown. A dashing fellow named um, Jason kept interrupting and saying, Ooh, sex. Haploids, where the human cells carried 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. If these creatures were haploids, that meant that they had 23 total chromosomes. 
Wait, I said, these guys are human. We were, Mulpa answered cheerfully as he approached. The changes fixed that, though. The yeti creature, the haploid, was still wearing his ceremonial robes but now sported a coverall as well. Now that he wore clothing, I could see it. They weren't just humanoid, they were human. Distorted in shape and size, but human. Just another in a long list of chimera experiments. I thought I might vomit, but I contained myself. Fixed, I asked with a full smile, so you don't consider yourself humans. Well, he said as he scratched his head with his scrubby fingers. I guess I've never really thought about it. I mean, we come from humans, but are we still human now? Suddenly he brightened. Maybe we should do a sermon on that, he suggested. I let it go. I wasn't interested in his philosophy. Our ship, I said in an attempt to change the topic. Do you think you can fix it? Oh, probably, he said with a dismissive air. But we don't want to. Don't want to? What if I told you that I needed you to do it? I asked. He blinked and seemed surprised. You are going to order us to fix something, something that isn't even the sphere? He asked. No doubt about it. He was genuinely surprised. Like the idea of repairing something not part of the sphere itself seemed alien to him. Of course, he had offered to fix our armor not long before it couldn't be a big deal. But it was the difference between an armor and an airship? Then it dawned on me. One was chimeric and the other was human built. Even the alien tech housed inside of them seemed to arouse their curiosity. Like their masters, the haploids were complete zealots about their religion. I really wanted to vomit now. Okay, I said slowly, but let's say that I need to get to the land of ferry and I need some sort of transport. The land of what? he asked. I was at a loss of words. What sort of points of reference do creatures like this understand? Summer came to my rescue. The land where the black tower touches the top of the sky, she said from behind me. Oh, he beamed, pointing at her. You want to go to the jail? I guess it needs to be inspected too. Yeah, we can get you there. Now is my turn to be surprised. You can? I asked. How? He looked baffled. We take the... He garbled. A word that he used didn't exist in English. The symbiote tried, and moments later I got a half-formed impression of a train. But that was replaced with an image of a bank using cinematic tubes. What were they talking about? Um, uh, this? I tried to replicate the word but failed miserably. I decided to go with the first suggestion my symbiote had tried. Train, I continued lamely. How fast can I get us there? He seemed to think about it. Well, he said, the jail is out of the sector, so we usually don't do maintenance that way. No scheduled, um, trains for a few more years, but I guess I could request a special. Get it here by, say, tomorrow morning. Get you to the jail the day after, probably. Forty-eight hours. We could be across the sphere in 48 hours. Holy crap, that was faster than originally planned. A faint glimmer of hope dared to ignite my chest. Thank you, I said. He grinned. No problem, boss, he said. Of course, as long as you're here, would you mind doing settling a dispute we have with Unit 514? A dispute? I asked, not liking that. Yeah, he said. Let me get to the transport and I'll take you to the crash. You can arbitrate for us there. No arbitrate, I asked, but he was already gone. I looked at Summer and found her still sitting in the corridor looking glum. You said that the haploids were supposed to have gone extinct over a thousand years ago. I prompted. She sighed. He says the haploids have no reproductive glands, she explained. Each one is individually created by the Chimera. They are all male. All of them are extremely long-lived, but when the Chimera left, there was no one to create new haploids. Their kind should, by all rights, died off centuries ago. They must have found a way to reproduce without the Chimera's bioengineering. I suddenly had a hollow feeling in my stomach. Please, please let me be wrong about this one. Malfa appeared with the transport a few minutes later. The transport turned out to be a floating sleds the others had brought them in on, except this one allowed them to remain visible. The front of the controls reminded me of the scooter's handlebars, the T-shaped pole with the grips on either side of them. Below, there was a huge platform with no chairs or restraints. He waved me up and I stepped up reluctantly. I felt something grab onto my boots and we were off in a flash. 
It was disorienting. I thought that I should feel movement, my eyes registering movement. I wanted to compensate for the push, but other than a slight breeze, it was like we were standing still. How does the machine work? I asked conversationally. Why don't I fall off? Localized gravity field, Malpa explained eagerly, with the matching repulsor on the bottom. Basically, it neutralizes the artificial gravity of the sphere, and only gravity you are feeling is from the plate below you. But what about the wind? I persisted. Why aren't I being blown off with the rushing air? Cavitation force fielding, he said as if it was somehow explained everything. I dropped the issue. We floated down the corridor, spun wildly, and then zipped down a bunch. I counted four other wild turns before I was hopelessly lost. I wasn't sure how fast we were actually moving, but it was fast enough that the corridors were little more than a blur. So, Malpa began with our preamble. Traditionally, we got stock from the Krogan planes. Krogan? I asked. Yeah, he agreed, but an environmental monitor did a random crap factor about 50 years ago. What does that mean? I asked. Well, you know how the old human homeworld, how environmentals occasionally changed? Yes, I am familiar with that, I replied. Well, the changes were fascinated with the idea of a homeworld changed, that things could be so unstable that a place that was wet would gradually become dry or vice versa. They thought it might be even part of a reason why humans and other homeworld life were so hardy. The changed environments doesn't just encourage them to change, it destroys the weak and only the strongest and most adaptable survive. I don't know, but it... But they programmed the environmental controllers to randomly shift some of the environments around here to see what happens. What happens? I asked. The extinction, usually, he admitted. That's the problem with cow grown. Things were dying off faster than the new stock could supply. We wanted to expand out to Yego Valley, but that's what 514's traditional stomping ground, and they won't share. Won't share? I asked. His eyes rolled in a manner that I thought might be discussed. They're a bunch of prima donnas anyway, he admitted. They think that because their unit is in charge of the nuclear attraction amplifiers. The what? I asked. He glared at me. The amplifiers for the strong and weak nuclear reaction, he repeated. I stared at him blankly. What sort of inspector are you? he asked. Not an engineering one, I said. Obviously, he agreed. Okay. You know how this world and its transport make their own gravity? Yes. Same idea, he went on. We create projectors that amplify naturally occurring forces in a localized setting, in case the projectors go laterally within the sphere material rather than projecting outwards like gravity. But why? It's the only way to get something with enough tensile strength to create the sphere, he explained, but sounded frustrated, like dumbing it down to a level of physically hurt him. The sphere can't be made by common materials. The bond would snap and lift out fly to pieces. So every single atomic bond throughout the entire shell has been amplified to many times its original ability so that the bonds can't be broken. Meanwhile, nuclear repulsion is cancelled out with a dampener. If the atoms were much closer to that fuse, much further apart and the shell would shatter. He made another one of those coughing laughs. I guess it goes right to their heads, he explained knowing that if they slip up even a quanta, that the entire shell would unravel. They looked down of us at the exhaust service. Exhaust service, I asked. More laughter. They really didn't brief you enough to be sending you out here. Well, no matter. The crash is just up ahead. Ahead of me, the stone tunnel ended and, of all things, a metal wall appeared before me. On this planet, where the amount of steel in a button knife would buy you an average family food for a year, here, I was staring at the king's ransom of material used to support a wall. He coughed at my gaze and grinned. Six years of extraction to get this much metal, he admitted. We had to track the beam sweeping the system for every asteroid and speck of cosmic dust that we could find. But it was worth it. They actually tried chopping away the stones to form a tunnel. Can you believe it? I didn't get a chance to ask what he meant about the who or they were. They let go of the handlebars and the sled coasted to a stop. Leaping off the sled, he marched up to the door and waved a box in his direction. The thick door ground open on unseen gears. Come on, he said. They're sleeping now so we can actually hear ourselves think. I knew, somehow, that I would regret doing it, but I fell in step behind him anyway. Lights came on in the dark room as we entered. 
Now, these are some of the ones that we still find on the plains, half-starved and disease-ridden. Maybe one in four are viable, he lectured, but the ones in the valley are still in good shape. 514, on the other hand, has almost a 60% success rate. Can you believe that? I didn't answer. My eyes were fixed on the table in front of me. We have a total of 15, he went on, all captured in rage. The problem is fertility. I mean, haploids are genetically viable for a fairly brief period of time before. He didn't finish his sentence. There was no rocks in the room. I had to slam his head into the corner of the table instead. Molfa collapsed to the floor with a gurgle. I didn't bother to check him. There were four rows of four tables, each one eerily similar to a surgical gurney that I'd found myself strapped to so many months ago when Quack and his crew first found me. But these weren't just padded tables with straps and arms and legs. The spider of plastic and steel jutted out of the sides of the table. Each robotic arm ended in a bizarre tool. Tools that buzzed and clicked with the robotic claws moved. The woman strapped to the table should have been dead. Her tattered and flayed skin had been peeled back from her abdomen, and two of the robotic arms were inside her belly working furiously. Her eyes were closed, her breathing shallow, her face twisted into a perpetual scream. The other fifteen tables held similar scenes, male and female, the oldest a man in his sixties who bled out in torrents from his open gut and with machines dug within. The haploids hadn't learned how to survive without the chimera, they'd simply become them. I powered up my burners and set them to maximum. End of chapter The Fourth Wave, Chapter 56, written by Sebi Loki I stepped out of the steel room a moment later. Heat pressed against my spine. It was uncomfortable. I could have ordered my armor to compensate for it, at the very least. Walked a few steps away. I didn't. I welcomed the heat. I let it roll over me as I might scour my memory in my mind. A haploid came pelting down her hall carrying what looked like a gun. A pistol with a long, thin tubes connecting twin canisters projecting from the bottom. The muzzle flared outwards like a funnel, and it was painted in a highly visible shade of orange. It looked like more like a tool than a weapon. The haploid didn't even seem to notice me and raced down towards the room behind me. Ah, a fire extinguisher. My left arm shot out and seized the haploid just below where the mouth of his neck should be. The body would be too wide for my first encircle, but I was able to grab a handful of loose skin and fur. I lifted it upwards and found the haploid's feet lift off the ground. His eyes widened and he seemed to notice me for the first time. Let it burn, I growled at him. There was a clattering sound beside his feet. Then he dropped the fire extinguisher. I lowered him to the ground, but didn't let him go. There's hazardous biological waste in there, I told him slowly, drawing out each word for emphasis. The fire is to decontaminate the place. The haploid's hand flapped as his belt came up with a silver box. He thumbed it. I, I, he stammered. I, I don't detect any hazardous material. My forearm blade slid out and touched his forehead. Of course, he added quickly, the fire might be making some of the readings unreliable. Um, Captain. Up until that moment, I wasn't even aware that it was possible for the hair-covered creature to bail. But somehow, this one did. He used my title. That meant that he was scanning me. For once, I didn't mind so much. I wanted to pull rank right now anyway. Oh, did I ever. Name and unit, I said. Technician cell unit 514, he babbled. I hadn't asked for his rank, but he gave it anyway. I let that blade slide back into my arm, and I was still holding it by the fur so I could see the minute changes in his posture, letting me know that he was relaxing. Instinctively, I wanted to shake him, to cause him to tense up and realize just how close it is to smashing his full head into the wall, just as to watch it splatter. But I fought down the urge. He understood. He also took me sheathing my weapon as a sign that there might be a way out of this long as he did exactly as I told him. That was what thought process I wanted to encourage. Well, Supervisor Krell, I said, dropping to his new rank as if I assumed I had a legitimate authority to do such a thing. How do you feel about exhaust duty? Frankly, sir, he mumbled, it sounds degrading and unimportant. I narrowed my eyes at him. I'm so disappointed to hear you say that. I said as I lowered my voice as I leaned in closer. 
That tiny bit of relaxation he had displayed earlier disappeared. The several hours before that I had thrown pilot the sled back towards the tunnel where my friends were still waiting for me to return. Fortunately, he knew the area of 731 was currently inhabiting. Left to my own vices, I would probably have lost the twisting catacombs forever. With Kraal's piloting, we only got lost four times. The sled settled down in the middle of the cabin next to the puddle that I had only recently used as a combat arena. Except this wasn't a puddle anymore. The water had been cleared away and the floor had already been drying. Other than some odd impressions left behind in the drying mud, there was very little evidence of the violence that had taken place there earlier in the day remaining. All right, I shouted out as I stepped off the sled. Who is in charge here? A haploid, he wearing an orange coverall who just happened to be walking nearby paused and gave me a puzzled look. You are, Inspector, he reminded me. Oh yeah, forgot about that. Of course, I said with a dismissive wave, but don't be absurd. I mean, who is giving the orders to the crews right now? He still looked puzzled. Well, you do, he said slowly. Are you wanting the pit bosses? Who is in charge of the pit bosses, I asked. He pointed at me. This was getting me nowhere. Who are those? So coordinate. Oh, fine, I get it. Put your damn hand down. I rubbed my face. Name, I asked the newcomer. Eflo, he said simply. No rank given. Fine. Coordinator Eflo promoted him. Gather the various pit bosses and bring them here for new assignments. Yes, Captain. He agreed and spun around to face the direction that he'd come from. I glanced back at Kral. I'm having a very bad day, I informed him. He nearly fell off the sled as he scoped as far away from me as possible in the hope of outrunning my reach. I apologize, Captain, he squeaked. My normal don't call me Captain or eat hot flaming death maggot retorts would have wait for another time. I was too mentally exhausted to deal with today. Neflo sauntered back into the cavern and followed the four other haploids wearing different colored jumpsuits. Did the jumpsuit color correspond to job detail? I didn't ask, but I didn't care. Hello, everyone, I said as they approached. I'd like you to meet Krull. He's the supervisor of a 514. Oh, he isn't. A particularly dim-witted haploid in green jumpsuit spoke up. I play knuckleball with him. He's a tech. I fired a burner an inch away from the haploid's nose and continued talking as if I hadn't heard him speak. I want you all to teach him the ins and outs of exhaust duty. A slightly smarter pit boss, this one in blue, asked hesitantly, He's being transferred to 731? 731 is being reassigned, I corrected him. 514 will be performing exhaust duties as well as maintaining amplifiers. Isn't that a lot of work? Someone asked. I hope so, I agreed, and shot them all a grin that felt like manic even on my own face. But it won't matter, because in comparison to what I have in mind for 731, they are getting off easily. Because of this moment, all human harvesting is terminated. Silence greeted me. The stupid one in green spoke up finally. We can't do that. We'll die off, he shouted. Half an inch from his nose this time. I think the molten rock spluttering on him because he yelped. You have a surgery pod here, I reminded them. I've seen you use it. Can it be set up to clone cells? You need to create a new haploid people. They were quiet for a moment. Eflo himself answered me. It can be modified to be a cloning unit, he said, but if we want to clone in bulk, we'd better just off creating a new unit based on the god's tissue sampler. I grinned at Eflo. Excellent suggestion, supervisor, I said. I want you to organize the work crews necessary to create the cloning units. He frowned. We've thought about it before, he admitted, but simple cloning isn't enough. We don't get the genetic diversity we need. That's why we had to start harvesting and haploid cells for breeding. Why can't you just use skin samples and other DNA? I asked him. Why do you have to kill the humans? He blinked at me in surprise. We were killing the humans, he asked. Kral from Unit 514 came to my rescue there. Yes, he admitted. The supervisors of the breeding crash decided it would be more efficient to harvest the native haploid cells from the human reproductive systems. Humans rarely survived the procedure and, uh, even if they died, they were disposed of. Eflos frowned even. But why? He said. It's inefficient. The murder didn't bother him nearly as much as the lack of efficiency. I classified this as pyriac victory and moved on to the next order of business. 
You may collect DNA samples from humans, I said, preferably without them noticing. Do you feel that is possible? Living organisms aren't very tidy, Beeflo muttered. Humans cast off viable DNA samples all the time without realizing it. I'm certain that we could create a collection of systems of sorts. We could modify the synthetic insects, the one in blue suggested. We could set them up to biological samplers. Eflo scratched the corner of his lip and his head as he turned from side to side. Possible, he said at last. I would like to research the tissue sample and see if we can adapt some existing mechanisms. And if it doesn't work, what then? The stupid one asked. The old system worked, why abandon it totally? I fired again. He was fine. Pinky toes aren't really necessary for walking and the wound was cauterized instantly. He still whined a lot as he rolled around on the ground screaming. This is going to happen, I told them firmly. Spread the word to the other units if you have to, but from this point forwards, no humans are going to be killed. Refresh your ranks. Got that? Um, Giflo shuffled uneasily. What? I asked. They harvested humans for other reasons as well, he stated flatly. Do those come to an end as well? It was difficult to aim, what with him rolling on the floor or on the ground like that, but I managed to clip off the green guy's other pinky toe with just a match set of feet. He screaming redoubled. Okay, he flo concluded. I'll just go ahead and issue a statement that we have been ordered to seize the human R&D. R&D. Research and development. Hookson, I blurted out. Her species. What? Crow asked. The Aquatics Prototypes, Eflo translated for me. They brought one with them. Oh, I read about them during my academy years, Growl said eagerly. They are nearby. I wonder what the genetic deviation from the original strain is. Focus, I shouted. Why do you try and create new strains of humans? They looked at me as appeared genuinely baffled by the question. The changes told us to, Eflo answered all of them. Naturally, they did still crying to crack the human nut after all they'd left. Got to love the Chimera. By love, I mean lob a thermonuclear warheads at them from high orbit until their entire planet is a radioactive sludge. I pushed such thoughts aside, with the accompanying annoyances, to one side and tried to focus on the issue. No more human R&D, I emphasized. We put humans through enough. But the yellow jumpsuited figure spoke up. Humans are supposed to be tools. They're weapons used by the changers. Just shut up and do what he says. The one in green scrambled from the floor. Well, I guess he could learn after all. It just took him a bit of time to catch up. Eflo stepped onto his new role as coordinator while lighting efficiency. He pointed to each of the pit bosses in turn and save for one of the green who was still whimpering in a fetal position and gave each of them orders on how to address the new rollout. He said that he would personally issue the message to Unit 119 that were they were dissolved. He expected their unit's personnel would be redistributed and would be used to help 514 with exhaust. Krell agreed to the idea readily enough. As they talked, I found myself becoming increasingly marginalized. Eventually, the green coveralled amputee was uncurled enough to join the conversation and added his own two cents to hear it there. I was no longer leaded, and with some relief, I stepped away and went in search of my friends. I spotted John's enormous bulk first. He was hard to miss. Next to him was a smaller, hairy figure of armor, Yakibo, I hoped. It was the third person in the trio that surprised me the most. Ranald stood there next to them wearing a patched-up armor and grinning from ear to ear. I half strolled casually and half jogged frantically, a pace I like to call strogging, and approached them as they were finishing their discussion. Shoggy Kavodj, with no necks who think that they're real engineers, Yakima was saying, but I don't think that one of them could tell a piston from a piston. By sheer random coincidence, the two phrases sounded remarkably similar in the doggerel chimeric as well as English. Parallel evolution, I guess. Either that, or the engineers all secretly drew from the same sources when naming things. Reynolds laughed. As he did, his eyes roamed aside and caught me approaching. Jason, he greeted. I was led to understand that you were responsible for me being here. Ah, uh, sort of, I admitted. They seem to think that I'm some sort of military inspector or something. Think that might have anything to do with you taking the chief of security and turning his brains into a mop porter. 
He asked the question jovially, almost laughing, but I could still sense disapproval lingering at the edges. Well, I said, forcing a fake smile onto my lips as well. They had just taken away the armor of a couple crew members, causing those two to succumb to their injuries that were being actively treated. True, he said. This time he did laugh. It was not a pleasant laugh, though. I wonder, he said, forth, if the reason that they took away our armor was because of some crazy guy started shooting and cutting up their ranks just a little while earlier. Akimo and Jan's expression froze, their eyes darting between us like Reynolds and I were playing some invisible game of tennis only the two of us could see. I shrugged, still smiling. I guess no one told me about the Sphere's custom of sneaking up on people in visibility to announce your good intentions, I counted. It works a bit differently on the outside. Reynolds opened his mouth, and clearly intending to retort back to the logic, but Nunyakimo grabbed his former captain by the shoulder and pulled him backwards a few steps. Why don't you come with me, Yakimo said quickly. We really haven't given the guard to her, have we? Reynolds shrugged and restrained hand on his shoulder, but kept from tone friendly. Sure thing, Yakimo. A good captain should do his best to make friends, right? I fought down the urge to shoot him through the head right there on the spot. A kill shot or two shouldn't be permanent, right? Better not risk it. I let them leave and I held my tongue. Reynolds was angry with me. I guess he blamed me for everything that had happened since the Akima had fallen from the sky. Maybe he was just angry and I was just a good target to lash out at. But I still didn't like the feeling of reference to himself as a captain. Please don't throw a mutiny on top of all my other problems today. Slouching with exhaustion, I pointed my weary feet in the direction of the tunnel where my friends had been sitting earlier. To my relief, I found them all milling about. The relief was short-lived, though. Heather looked up at me with met my eyes. Her visor was up. Her gaze was steady and her lips were resolved. I knew that look. I was about to get punched. Jason, she said as she walked over to me, I think we need to talk. Um, okay, I said. I waved at the others, which included fully healed Rhymer amongst the rank, and followed Heather further into the tunnel. What did I do now? Walking away while she was having an existential crisis. You're a murderer, she hissed at me without preamble. Didn't expect that tactic. What happened to you, she asked. She spun around to face me. You were the goofy guy, a slacker with no ambition, who made my dad angry. What has this place done to you? Heather I, I began lamely. No, she interrupted. Just because we're off of Earth doesn't mean you get to kill people. What has happened to you? Did the chimera mess with your head or something? Have you lost your mind? First, the breeding crash, then Reynolds, now this. Just because they scare you or upset you doesn't mean you get to kill them, she went on, voice growing louder. How long before you turn on one of us? She probably had more to say. I didn't. The bones in my hand didn't shatter. The armor protected them from using whatever combination of force dampeners, force fields, and durable material that layered over my hand. The chunk of rock that exploded out of the wall. Not so lucky. Now, do I have your attention? I asked her. Because maybe you haven't noticed that I've not exactly been going around random killing spree here. Maybe you might have even noticed that the people I've been fighting have been trying to kill us too. Okay, everyone except for the people in the breeding crash. She didn't need to know about that, though. Where is the priest? She asked. The two of you left and only one came back with someone else. He did try to attack you. I clenched my jaw. Is he still alive? She asked. Probably not. He was there when our fire started, though. You don't understand, I muttered. Oh, don't I? She said. Then explain it to me. Explain it how it goes and you can find it so easy. I never said this was easy. No, she said. There was a slight hitch to her voice, causing me to meet her eyes for the first time. They seemed moist. What was going on? If it's not this easy for you, she asked, then can you tell me what you did to Freddie McNara? If she had doused me with ice water at that moment, I could not have been more of a chill through. My fists unclenched. I didn't even know that my hands had been balled into fists. Where had this come from? Freddy McNara, I asked her, the kid in high school. Why would you even ask about him? Did you kill Freddy Bishop? She asked at the point blank. Was he your first? What? I stammered. No. What would make you think that I had anything to do with... I trailed off as I recalled the events that had led up to that awful summer. It wasn't easy. 
No, well, it wasn't pain-free. I had spent years trying to forget. Still, now that she had said the name and I tried so hard not to think about, the memories came flooding back. Somehow, I kept my footing and a wave of recollection crashed into me. No, I repeated, and I can't believe that you ever thought such a thing. I didn't, she said with a sniff, not until earlier when I saw the way that... The way that you attacked the creature. You didn't see the face. You were so angry. I've never seen anyone so angry. Then you just walk away from it like nothing happened. How can you be so calm about it? Because I haven't had time to fall over from it, I thought. I kept getting hit with new horrors, and every time I think I'm going to have a moment to have my nervous breakdown, the peace and quiet, something happens. I have to, is what I said. I don't want to. I have to. It's the only way any of us walk away from this. She sniffed and looked away from me. You really had nothing to do with Freddy's death? She asked. I should have said something, assure her that I had nothing to do with it, change the subject. I think she was willing to believe me. I think she wanted to believe me, to move past this. She just wanted me to exert a little effort convincing her. Instead, I hesitated. In that fraction of a second, the horror of the situation came right back to her. She turned to face me and I saw fresh horror creeping into her face. Oh God, she gasped. She turned around from me and fled down the tunnel. I could have run after her considering the circumstances. Running her to the ground didn't sound like a good way to convince her that I wasn't a lunatic. Who's Freddy? Someone asked from the vicinity of my elbow. I looked down and saw Jack standing there with her arms crossed over her chest and staring down at the corridor that Heather had just taken. Jack's question had sounded curious, but her face had revealed boredom. You were listening, I asked. You were loud, she corrected. I slumped against the wall. Great, I mumbled. So everyone else heard, she shrugged. It's a long story, I warned her. When does the train get you, she asked. Sometime tomorrow, I said. She shrugged again. Guess we're not going anywhere until then, she coughed. I groaned. This day was getting worse after all. Gather the others, I told her. I'm only going to tell the story one time. Anyone who isn't here when I start talking is going to get it from someone else. Clear? She shrugged and turned to walk away. Damn you, Freddy. You've been dead for seven years and I still can't escape you. I wanted to punch the wall again, but I didn't. I put my back to it and slid down the tunnel floor. I sat there and waited. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 57, written by Sebi Loki. I felt rather than saw the others gather round me. I didn't bother looking up. If I had, I might have met their gazes. I really didn't want to do that. Not then. When I thought back to the choices I had made, even the violent ones, they still seemed to make sense given what I knew at the time. Were they the best choices I could have made? Probably not, but they were the best choice I could do at the time. I thought most of them understood that, but maybe some of them didn't. I didn't want to know who belonged into what group right then. I also didn't want to talk to Freddy McNara, but I wasn't about to ask anyone to take another step with me so long as Heather was planting her seed that I was a homicidal maniac in their heads. If Heather wants to hear the story, I said, still staring at my feet, she can get it from one of you. I'll tell this once and it never gets mentioned again. No one voiced any objections, so I told them. For the first time in my life, I told the story without omitting the key details. Freddy was a grade ahead of me and two years older. The math works once you factor in how many times he failed his senior year. His teachers thought the system was failing him and allowed him to stay in school until he was 19 so he could learn and earn his diploma. They didn't know Freddy like I did, though. I knew he failed his senior year deliberately just so that he could extend his football career by a full year. He knew he lacked the brains out of the athletic skill to make it into a college world and Freddy loved football too much to give on it easily. Or, I should say, he liked being able to hurt people in a socially acceptable way. Freddy was a sadist. He was probably a psychopath as well, but he had both traits very well. Play a game here and some kid gets a concussion. As long as it doesn't happen too often, the statistics and officials don't investigate. As long as Freddy injured more from the opposing team than his own, the coaches looked the other way. Freddy was smart enough to play the system and hide his sadistic streak. I only became aware of it when I noticed that, regardless of where he started out during a play, 
You would always tell where Freddy would be at the end of it, tackling whomever was the smallest person on the opposing team. Freddy didn't like matches he thought were too even. He exclusively targeted those smaller and weaker than himself. For a while, that actually protected me. I was never the biggest guy in the class, but I was never the smallest either. Quietly, I'm behind the scenes, Freddy would terrorize whoever he thought was the weakest person in the school. Until my sophomore year, Freddy's chosen target was Paul Kowalski. I honestly don't know what it was about Paul that set Freddy off, but maybe it was because Paul's parents had died in an automobile accident, leaving Paul and his sister to be raised by an aunt. Maybe it was because he never seemed to have enough money to purchase more than a bare necessities. Maybe it was because Paul's sister had been in the same accident and had taken his parents' lives. Though she had survived the impact, she had struck her head and never entirely recovered. Between the addition of two growing children and the expense of therapy needed to rehabilitate her niece, who was left in a semi-verbal, they never seemed to have enough money to take care of more than the bare necessities. Where everyone else saw pain and tragedy, Freddy saw misery he could exploit. Take a dollar from the most kids and they usually had another stashed away. Take one from Paul Kowalski and he may not be able to eat until he got back home. Even then, it may be hit or miss. Freddy loved to hurt and he wanted to know people suffered because of him. Paul was ruthlessly tormented for months. No one spoke up. Those that did know were just glad it wasn't them. Those that did not could never believe that behind those chiseled good looks and plastic smile was the mind of something dark and twisted. He was a football player, a hero to the school. As far as most were concerned, he could do no wrong. Even the teachers believed that. When did you find out what he was? Someone asked. I blinked in surprise. I had half forgotten that I was saying this all out loud and not reliving it. I looked up and found Lee sliding his back against the wall to sit next to me. It sounds like this Kowalski kid didn't talk about it, he went on, but he told you. I shook my head. He didn't tell me, I corrected him, not then. I knew about Freddy because of the animal skulls. But he closed his eyes. Ah, crap, he muttered. I grimaced. The woods behind my house were supposed to be off limits. Don't go in there. You don't know what might be in there. So naturally, that's where I went as soon as my parents turned their backs on me, up until I found the dog skull one day. The skull was old, but not that old. It was lying there in the forest floor as if it had been dropped. Loose and decaying fresh stalk clung to it in places, and the eye sockets boiled as flies crawled in and out. I thought a predator might have killed it at first. Then I found severed cat's heads, the frog with a nail driven through it, other horrors. Someone had been here and had been experimenting. Freddy almost caught me as I was running away. I spotted him just before he spotted me, returning to his special spot. He carried his sack with him. I tried to pretend that it was just an old clothes or food. I tried to convince myself that, as I ran away, I didn't see the sack move. I was eleven. I wouldn't see Freddy again for a few more years, but then I knew to avoid him. The one day he started spreading rumors about someone I cared about and I decided that I needed to confront him. Lee interrupted again. He said that she was easy, right? Lee asked me. Heather, I mean. She put out. I didn't answer. Lee rolled his eyes. Jason, he said while putting a comforting hand on my shoulder. Those sorts of guys always say that if a girl sleeps with him, he keeps his mouth shut and only tells his friends that she's a slut. If she does not sleep with him, he lies and tells everyone that she did and she's a slut. To guys like that, it's all about power. You either do what he wants or he punishes you. Even if you do, he still wants you to know that he's got the king and you're not. I sighed. I know that, I agreed, but it's hard to remember when you're 15 and your brains and your balls are arguing about who's the got priority with oxygen levels. He grinned at me. That ended after the age of 15 for you, he asked. Not really, I admitted, but at that time it seemed like a good idea to confront Freddy. And Freddy ended up with two favorite targets, he asked me. I nodded. For three months, he had it in for me as well. Dead animals, sometimes missing their skin at that, would appear in my locker. I had to sweep my desk for thumbtacks before I sat down. If I ate my lunch where he could find me, he'd find an excuse to trip and knock my food on the ground or spill something on me. Every day, he and his two friends, Ratboy and Terence, tried their best to force me to grumble. 
I tried making it stop. I told the teachers. They didn't believe me that Freddy always managed to spin it around to make it look like he was the victim of some prank that I was pulling. If I yelled at Freddy, he was mock innocent and left me looking like a raving lunatic. Every time I tried to push back, he managed to leave me looking like I was the crazy one. So one day, after he dumped a rubber cement into my backpack, I tried threatening him. I told him I knew about his little animal experiments. Again, I was interrupted by my narrative. I take it that he didn't leave you alone then. He did. For almost a week, I told Lee. Then he came to school wearing a letter jacket, walked up to me and unzipped it enough for me to see the pistol that he was carrying inside. Then he walked off. An hour later, fireworks went off inside my locker. The fire department was called in, and I was suspended from school because everyone assumed that I had brought them in. Lee shook his head again. Must have been rough on you, Sid. I guess you were counting the days until summer break. I wasn't willing to wait that long, I corrected him. So I confronted him again. You're crazy. A little, I agreed. The next time I confronted him, I wanted to make sure that it was on my own terms. Getting him where I wanted it was pretty easy. The school bought cheap locks for all the lockers. The ones inside the gymnasium locker room were even cheaper. Once I realized that Freddy was somehow getting into my locker without knowing the combination, I knew that there had to be some easy way to bypass the lock. Freddy wasn't smart enough to be a master thief. So, with little research, I learned how to make a shim. You can make one out of an old soda can and you can be patient and are careful to cut yourself. Slide the metal inside the lock between the padlock's body and where the shank entered and feel around for the locking bar. Move it to the side and the shank and the curved bit of metal that locks in place from the padlock pops right open. The good locks don't leave much of a gap. Cheap locks with a wide one that make it easy for even an amateur like myself to pick. I waited until he had football practice and unlocked his locker where he kept his clothes. I didn't leave a dead animal or fireworks. Just a note. A note about going to the special place in the woods. I told him that I would be there that night and I would dig up all the skulls and talk to the police and have them check the semen samples and the neck holes. I was kicked out of my narrative again as Lee burst out laughing. Jason, he said as he buried his face in his hands and muffled his laughter. I'm sorry, but once you decide to pick a fight, you don't go out halfway. I turned my and I shrug. I wanted him in the woods that night because I wasn't going to go through all of this for another day at school, I declared. And did he show up? Yes, I agreed. Lee shook his head. He didn't think there was a setup, he asked. He probably did, I told him, but there were three of them and only one of me. Then they had a gun. Ah, he said, so you had a plan. Yeah, I agreed. I took the gun. Lee stopped smiling and shot me a puzzled look. Freddy, Ratboy, and Terran showed up less than an hour after football practice. They strolled in looking relaxed. He wasn't even angry. He was looking forward to the three of them beating me up. He was actually smiling. He didn't see me as I hid in the shadows cast by the forest. He walked right past me, heading towards the special spot. He didn't even know that I was there until the pipe wrench struck him in the side of the skull. He fell down while Ratboy and Terrence were still trying to figure out what was going on. I reached into Freddy's jacket and pulled out the gun. Ratboy saw me first. I don't think that he saw the gun. He definitely didn't see the pipe wrench. I know because when I hit him in the forearm, his scream seemed to be as much one of a surprise as it was of pain. I ran back a few paces and held up the gun, just wearing gloves, and let them see it. Then I pulled out the Ziploc bag and dropped the pistol inside. I'm gonna kill you, Freddy shouted as he struggled to his feet. Epidural hematoma, I replied. Freddy stopped where he was, as if he wasn't sure I was still speaking English. So I kept talking. There are arteries running along the side of your skull, I told him. Unfortunately, there's where your skull is the thinnest too. A sharp blow like the one you took, it almost always ruptures one of those blood vessels. Five minutes. He took a step forward, and I took one back and kept talking. Interesting thing about the brain, even one as small as yours, Freddy, is that it really doesn't have a lot of extra room inside your head. If there's a bruise, like because of a broken blood vessel, with swelling it just presses the brain right up against the skull harder and harder. Except there aren't any pain receptors in the brain, so you don't feel it. Now, he stopped. He seemed to be really listening to what I was saying for the first time. His hands were clenched. He was ready to spring into action, but his eyes were on my bloody pipe wrench. 
Four minutes and thirty seconds, I told him before adding. The thing is that once the swelling starts, the only way to save someone's life at that point is to drill a hole in the skull and give the swelling a place to go. The nearest hospital is about fifteen minutes from here. Prep time for surgery like that, if you are lucky and they have a neurosurgeon on standby, is probably anywhere between seven and ten minutes. Then they have to sedate you and you don't accidentally lobotomize you if they drill into your head. So, 25 minutes at least before they can cut into you and save your tiny little brain. But I figure permanent brain damage will start setting in in about 4 minutes after that. So, what do you say, Fred? I bet if I start running that I can outrun you for at least 4 minutes. Question is, if you have 4 minutes you can waste. Sorry, 3 minutes and 50 seconds. Now, he looked nervous. His eyes flicked to the two companions. Oh, I pointed out, I don't think that rat boy can drive with his hand busted. And when your receipts start in about, uh, 11 minutes, you probably shouldn't be driving either. Decisions, decisions. You're bullcrapping, he challenged me. Wait five minutes and you will find out, I told him. Now I stopped my own narrative and looked at Lee. I was bullcrapping, of course, I said. There was no way I could tell if I had ruptured your blood vessel. It was pure BS. But he couldn't be sure. So they ran. They ran, I agreed. They told the hospital that they'd been out for a hike and that Freddy and Ratboy had fallen off a rock. Ratboy got a cast and Freddy got an x-ray. I imagine he was sweating as he waited for the results. Which were normal, by the way. I figured they would be. I didn't put a lot of swing and enough to knock him off balance. It was all a bluff. Lee nodded. And the next day at school, he prompted me. Oh, Freddy came looking for me, I agreed. I stood out from where he could find me. Before he could say a thing, though, I reminded him about his gun. I said that it was now sitting in a mailbox somewhere, with the address of a police station written on the front. Unless he knew which mailbox, it would be in for the outgoing mail that day. His fingerprints were all over that gun, even inside the chamber. It hadn't been used to commit any crimes, now had it, Freddy? Lee let out a low whistle. He left you alone because you blackmailed him. I nodded. He spread the rumor that I was a psycho, I said. Tried to make it look like I had it in for him. Called me crazy, but never really did anything to me directly. Soon, he seemed to forget about me, and I was allowed to finish my sophomore year without being harassed. My junior year, almost everyone seemed to forget my psycho rumor and went back to ignoring me. Freddy ignored me as well. Freddy ignored you, he asked. You were really off the hook. He probably had something on mind for me, I admitted. He was just waiting for me to drop my guard, I think. But something happened first. Which was? Well, I said slowly, he took out his frustrations on Paul first. A few months into our junior year and Paul pulls me aside after school one day and tells me he knows that I have something over Freddy and he wants in. I tried to deny it at first, but then he told me what Freddy had done to that finally caused him to snap. What was that? Lee asked. As soon as he asked, though, I saw a flash in his eyes. He knew. He didn't want to know, but he knew. He closed his eyes and lowered his head. The bastard, he muttered. I turned my head and face the floor as well. She was an easy target, I said. How could she tell anyone when she could barely talk? I think I just threw up in my mouth a little, Lee mumbled under his breath. I sighed and I took the plunge. I took Paul back to my place and showed him the gun. I said, still, sealed away in a plastic baggie. I told him how Freddy's fingerprints were all over it. I gave it to him. I may have even said something about how the police were probably looking for it. Maybe I hope I said that. Crap, Lee said. How in the hell were you kept quiet about all of this? I rested my head against the wall, and this time I started to set a ceiling. The police were looking for a gun after all, I went on. They found it next to a rather clumsily staged suicide. I don't think they believed there was one. No one really did. But Freddy's prints were on the ones on the gun, and the gun had been used in a robbery, by the way. The old man was shot. No witnesses. Now they had a gun and a chief suspect lying on the ground in the light, dusting winter snow. No footprints near the body either. I think Paul planned it that way. I gulped once and took a deep breath. He transferred away later that year, I said. Him and his sister... He never said another word to me, I think. Maybe he thought the same thing I did. Then maybe you should have swung the wrench a little harder, Lee asked. I closed my eyes, hearing the same question that had been bothering me for so many years repeated in another person's voice was disorienting. 
Then he surprised me and he laughed. You mean that's it? He asked. I turned and stared at him and lost his mind. I always knew that you were a little crazy, he went on, but that's the reason why. Because you didn't kill a guy when, as far as you know, he wasn't guilty of any crime other than being a jerk. Something felt wrong here. He was supposed to hate me, to shun me now that he knew that I had done. Why was he laughing like that? Jason, he said with a shake of his head. Nobody walks away from crap like that in a tight he right afterwards. No one. You can't keep blaming yourself. But I knew something was wrong with Freddy. I never told anyone, I blurted out. And what would have happened if you did? He asked me. You think Freddy wouldn't have gamed the system, that all he needed was a shoulder to cry on and he would stop? He was going to a bad place. Nothing in the world could have stopped him because he wanted to go there. You just got lucky. Lucky? I asked. Lucky how? Lucky in that you poked the tiger and walked away with your fingers, he said. Jason, you screwed up, but that doesn't mean that when something bad happens to people it's your fault. Relax a little. I frowned. That's easy for you to say, I muttered. But what about Paul? That's on him, Lee said, suddenly serious. His eyes looked as if they had been forged from steel. He knew what sort of monster Freddy really was, he went on. He didn't try to stop him. He should have known that Freddy would do when he found out about her. A lump settled in my throat. He was just trying to protect her, I mumbled. He didn't, he said, so he went for revenge. That's on him. Believe me, you can't blame yourself for what happened to Paul or his sister. What happened to Terence and Ratboy? Jack asked suddenly. I nearly leapt out of my seat when I heard her voice. I forgot that Lee and I weren't alone. What? I stammered. Oh, they went to prison. They were involved in an armed robbery, but uh, without Fred, they weren't nearly as good at avoiding getting caught. They slipped up after graduation. They were legally adults by then and went to prison. She snorted. And that's the last of it, she asked. I squirmed, uncomfortable. Jason, she asked. I sighed. It was my senior year, I told her, and I approached the school paper, asked them if I could write an article about a former classmate who was now behind bars. They weren't thrilled, but they gave me the go-ahead. I drove up to the prison in my mom's car, got a visitor's pass and went to that evening, typed up my article, and the paper rejected it. I wasn't surprised. It was an awful article. I made sure that it was unprintable. Why? she asked. So that you could have an excuse for why you went up to the prison to Vincent Terrence and Ratboy. I didn't see them, I corrected her. I went and spoke to Leon Hesher. Who? she asked. I shrugged. He graduated from our school long before I ever went there, I admitted. He got caught stealing cars and serving ten years. She shook her head. I don't get it, she said. Yeah, I nodded. He wasn't much use for an article. I think he was a bit curious about the strange kid who came to see him, but he didn't like my questions. What questions? What was it like serving time behind bars? Did he regret it? Did it make him uncomfortable knowing that he was sharing a cell block with child rapists like Terence Smiles and Jerry Ratboy Pedersen, who never officially were charged with that? Lee started laughing again. You sneaky little bastard, he said. You planted that rumor knowing what happens to child molesters in Gen Pop, didn't you? I held up my hands in mock surrender. I was just an inexperienced reporter who was trying to do research for a school newspaper. There was a light thud to my side. Jack had slid down to the floor next to me. Jason, she said at last, you are crazy. You're going to get yourself killed one day if you don't stop this. I looked away from her. But, she continued, until that day, I think the universe is going to find out that it was a mistake to cross you. Um, thanks, I said. She nodded as if it was an appropriate response. By the way, she said, Lee is right. Freddy was spreading a bullcrap rumor. She already kissed him. I frowned. How would you know that? I asked her. She rolled her eyes at me. You told me to get everyone, she reminded me. That's when I realized that there had been a sound just at the edge of hearing. I had been noticing for a little while, but couldn't place it until then. Too much noise, mostly my own. Sobbing. Damn it! I shouted as I leapt to my feet. For a second time that day, I got the feeling glimpse of Heather's back. She ran away. Damn it, damn it, damn it! I shouted. How much worse can this day get? And then I froze. I didn't say it that, did I? I asked. Lee climbed up to his feet as well. You did, he agreed and looked around frantically. Oh crap, Jason, my armor is telling me that there's a lockout code in the Berserker drug. Yeah, I agreed. What for of it? 
because you might want to start using it now, he said. I realized that he was staring fixedly at some point outside the mouth of the tunnel. I looked in that direction and saw Reynolds approaching. He had a big smile on his face, and why shouldn't he? There were, after all, thirty armed haploids following him wearing a special comedian armor. As I stared at the soldiers caught a sight of me as well, they paused and a shimmer settled in the air. Like heat rising from a hot pavement, then Reynolds was standing there all alone. Oh, hell. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 58, written by Semi Loki. The word Yabba was as far as I got. All at once I felt my body go rigid, my arms and legs refused to move. The only reason I didn't fall over was the act of balancing itself had been surrendered to the motor systems of the armor. My armor had been hijacked, but that shouldn't be possible. I was labeled as captain and I should have priority over my own crew's armor. Armor that I had let single helix mutants meddle with. I really am a dumbass some days. My jaw was unaffected, so I could go ahead and issue the command, but why bother? Being a mobilized berserker really had an advantage over being a mobile normal me, so I decided to wait instead. All thirty soldiers appeared in front of me a second later. Most of them had their guns trained on me. Lee, Professor, Madakai, and Jack got some of the attention. Rima, Shai, Yakimo, and Yans got a bit less, but most of those guns were pointed directly at my head. One of the soldiers stepped closer and raised his visor. Ordinarily, it is hard to tell haploids apart just by looking at their faces. One face shrouded with orange hair looks like any other fur-covered face. But I had help this time. I'd only seen this dull look on one set of eyes so far. Hey there, Twinkletoes, I greeted cheerfully. How are those eight remaining piggies treating you? His eyes flashed in a momentary spark of anger, followed by an incredibly good job of trying to smother it. He forced a smile to his lips instead and held up a black box in his right hand. It was about the size of a ton of mints and seemed to have a featureless surface. This is a short-range inhibitor, he explained. I'm using it to override the controls of your armor. Oh good, I said for a second. I was afraid that your crippling halitosis was doing that. I was going to tell the gang not to plan any expeditions wading through the raw sewerage. Very faces were darkened with anger. Useful information there. It was also useful to realize that Lee was right. Once I decided to pick a fight, I didn't do it halfway. Your comrade, he went on, his voice tight with irritation, has told us a rather interesting story. According to him, you aren't a captain at all. You're a... The armor is immune, I interrupted. I'm not. If you don't back off a few paces and stand down one of the hurricane fan or two, I might just pass out from oxygen deprivation or miss key parts of this lovely speech. A thief, he snapped. You have stolen a ship and equipment from the holy changes, making you a blasphemer and... Uh, the weird part is, I interrupted him again. I wouldn't mind skipping over all the gloating if your toxic breath would just hurry up a bit. But the mix of boredom and petrifaction is just really distracting. Sorry, you were telling me how your shoes fit a bit better now, right? He bared his teeth and whipped his own gun to the point of my head. I should have known, he growled from beaded on his lips, the way you tried to subvert our divine mission. Where is the high priest? So, this is the only way you people can get to stand so close to you, right? I asked. Freeze them in place and hold them at gunpoint. I only ask because you do this a lot. The gun whined as he increased the power. Summer, Reynolds shouted as he pushed through the throng of soldiers and wrapped his hand around the psychic's wrist. We have to get out of here. I'm taking you home now. No, you not crap for brains, I counted as I rolled my eyes in his direction. After I'm done with Mount Doom's breath over here, you're next on my list. Mutiny. Really, Reynolds? To my surprise, he actually staggered a bit as I said those words. What? He asked, shooting me a confused look. This isn't mutiny. This is... This is... Summer shook a hand free from his grasp. He was still wearing his armor. He could have stopped her if he wanted to. He didn't try. Summer, he said... I'm not going with you, she declared. This is insanity, Reynolds. You betrayed all of us. What? he asked. He sounded genuinely puzzled. It was like he was reading from the script in one movie and he was reading from another. Something was strange about this. 
No, he said, resolved, returning to his voice. We need to get you away from whatever this thing is that keeps getting in your head. The closer we get to it, the more danger you are. I'm fine now, she insisted. You are the one putting me in danger. She's right, Craphead, I growled. Didn't you and Ocho Dido over here and talk about the Hody mission? You really think that it includes letting you go? He turned to face me again. He seemed to be struggling to understand my words. He still seemed angry, but it was fracturing. As I watched, his face seemed to be controlled by some emotional yo-yo. Naked fury one moment followed by bafflement. Its expression was crystallized for only a brief moment before shattering. Eight toes, whether he realized or not, came to my rescue at that moment. When I tell my brethren that you are an imposter, the harvest will resume as well as the research. He rolled again. Harvests? Randall asked. Research? I rolled my eyes. Bunch of eunuchs stomping around for centuries, I reminded him. Where do you think they get new recruits? The mutants are us. They've been kidnapping humans all this time. Some of them they experiment on to create new species. Like Hookson. What? Kavaj! Hookson barked. But mostly they just carve them up with the reproductive cells, I went on, and discard the body. I was bringing this entire practice to a stop before you showed up. What? He stammered. No, that can't be right. Every move you've made, you've doomed us. The wrong decision. Every decision. You've been the one who were... No, that's not right. It can't be. I craned my neck as much as I could frozen armor would allow and looked at Summer's face. I sort of ruined that last crop, I admitted, and Summer looks about the age that they would like a sample. Sorry, man, I didn't expect this part. What? He asked. No, no. The fury returned to his face, but this time it wasn't directed at me. His arm shot out and spun towards Tolus Joe Jackson. Unfortunately, his body froze mid-swing before he could even bring the burner all the way around. No, he screamed, I'll kill you. The anger was sharper this time, more defined, more real. The symbiote, I realized. Damn it, why didn't I think of that? When I'd played around with the pharmacy settings on my own suit of the abjugators had, briefly, been able to insert strange ideas into my head. If Reynolds had the gene that allowed them to exert better control, and he was just gotten out of surgery, with who knows what drugs still floating in his system. Damn, damn, damn. I rolled my eyes back to face the formless pit boss. Once I get out of this, I informed him coldly. You die last. Slowly. He snorted with amusement. And how do you expect to get out of that armor? He asked casually. Not all of us are wearing armor, I reminded him. He looked confused, then his eyes widened as if he understood dawning on him. Scrake screams filled the air as she leapt upon his arm with the howl the inhibitor. He was bigger than her, he was stronger than her, he had unpowered armor. But physics are still physics. When your armor suddenly grows 40 times heavier and normal than it's extended away from you, you pivot. There isn't a choice in the matter. He fell over and with Scrake still screaming angrily at him. They hit the floor and the device clattered away from him. My armor instantly unlocked. We were either out of range of its effects or it stopped transmitting once he let go. Either way... We were free. Scrake let go of Ocho's arm and he reached towards his face in an attempt to scratch the exposed regions of his face. He was a pit boss, not a soldier. He should have pumped up the force fields and deflected her attack. He could have sped up to punch her and disable her, but he reacted as if he wasn't wearing armor and withdrew from her. I took this all in from the corner of my eye in the fraction of a second. My attention was on the thirty armored gunmen surrounding us. They, I realized, also weren't soldiers. They were watching the pit boss struggle with the screaming hobbits instead of focusing on me. Yabba, nabba, do, I shouted. We all heard it because I saw the professor's stance change as we were all hit at the same time with the injected drug. The soldiers glanced back in our direction and brought up their weapons to bear down upon us, but they were moving slowly. So very, very slowly. Almost like the atmosphere had turned to molasses. Then things went black. I blinked my eyes open and heard screaming. I looked down and saw the eight-toed pit boss lying on the ground in front of me, emptying his lungs in pain. Correction, four-toed pit boss. At least I assumed he had only had four toes as I held his severed right leg in my arms. 
The armor along the upper thigh was dented in a pattern that resembled the helmet of the screaming haploid. I had been beating him with his own severed leg. My berserker self needed to check into his anger management, I decided. I was tired, but I didn't have the bone-weary exhaustion that I recalled from my last episode. I was standing with the assistance of the powered armor, but it cut out when I wouldn't drop immediately. I could, in all likelihood, lower myself to the ground without falling. I checked system status, an antidote had been administered, according to the armor's clock, something like five minutes had passed. Five minutes. I said, drop the leg and power down your armor. A shaking voice stammered. I looked in that direction. Seven soldiers remained. Their friends lay on the floor in front of us. Broken to pieces of armor littered the ground around us. Necks were broken. Bennies were slashed. But most sported burner holes in five minutes of berserker mode. And my friends and I had turned into tornadoes of destruction. I noticed a particularly large pile of bodies were near Lee's feet. Me? I had apparently concentrated on the guy in front of me, and I had been attempting to keep my promise that he would be last. The remaining soldiers had retreated into the arm's reach and had trained their weapons on us. The armor had apparently recognized the situation that swift and blinding violence might not be the answer to, and had brought us back to reality. Intelligent are by deed. I dropped the leg and stood upright. My friends followed my lead. Now, the man said in a shaky voice, Get down on your knees and... He didn't finish the sentence. Four beams of light shot through the tunnel across the hall and hit him in the back of the head. He fell. The six remaining soldiers panicked and turned their backs on us. From the mouth of the tunnel, two armored figures ran out. By the size of the bearing, I recognized them even at a distance. The twins were back. They fired their forearm burners wildly as they ran. They weren't even bothering to aim. They would never be able to hit anything like that. They didn't need to. The soldiers had kindly turned their backs on a bunch of people who didn't have to deal with such an extreme range. Without even needing to issue the order to do so, we all raised our own boners and unloaded them. Four of the remaining soldiers fell instantly. The last two spun again and realized that they were truly and hopelessly screwed. They dropped their weapons. I smiled and looked up the call, greeting the twins who were still approaching at a dead run. I was interrupted by a muted scream in front of me. I looked down and saw the former pit boss was gripping his remaining leg and screaming. The leg terminated in a bloody stump. This entire foot was missing now. I guess he was now Zilcho Dedo. I wasn't sure about that, though. The Spanish was never my best subject. I looked around and the shooter, and to my surprise, Heather stepped out of the shadows. Her visor was up showing her eyes were puffy and red. Her eyebrows were knitted together in anger. Bastard tried to shoot me while you were back and was turned, she said with a sniff. Yeah, um, thanks, I hazarded. She nodded her eyes and entirely focused on the screaming man writhing on the floor in front of us. She gritted her teeth and spat out. I'm getting sick and tired of all the shooting. The burners flared and struck him in the chest. Even at close range, it was near the limits of the power that the burners had to punch through the armor and until the juicy living bits underneath. Heather must have scaled the power back a bit from that because even though the bolts hit him square in the chest and left the craters behind, the increased volume of his screams was testament enough that he was still alive. Why? Zap. Does. Zap. Everyone. Zap. Keep. Zap. Shooting each other. Zap, zap, zap. She punctuated each word with another barrage of firepower. The chest of his armor charred began to curl and it repeated blasts, but she was still scaling the power down so even as the armor was weakened, no shot was fatal. Painful as hell, yes, but not fatal. How do you like it? Zap, does it feel good? She shouted. Zap. Then why do you people keep shooting? Zap. By my mental tally, Heather had by far fired the most shots in this little encounter. The fact that they were all in the same target didn't matter. I didn't point out a bit of hypocrisy, though. Why does everyone have to end with shooting? She asked. Zap, 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 zap. The shots were no longer focused on his chest. They were working their way down his torso towards his crotch. The pit boss seemed to reach the same conclusion and snapped his gloved hands over his crotch, demonstrating a willingness to sacrifice both hands for the sake of just a little extra shielding for the area. Well, that certainly proves they are male. She whipped her arm and suddenly fired. 
and the shot went wide into the open faceplate on his helmet. He screamed, how could she do a non-fatal headshot? A charred lump of flesh popped out of the helmet in a mist of superheated blood steam. It's landed on the ground in front of me. Was that a deer? No more shooting, I said. I have had a really bad day and I want everyone to stop shooting. Is that understood? I opened my mouth to say something. Lee, fortunately, elbowed me in the ribs before I could say anything. This sort of circuited my original remark and allowing my brain to chance to grab controls of my mouth once more. Yes, ma'am, I said. There were several echoes of sentiment and at least three different languages. She nodded once and stormed off. Jason, a voice I barely recognized any more, spoke up. I turned to see Volson creep out of the protective recesses of the corner from where she was cowering. Is this a phenomenon your species refers to as PMS? she asked. I glanced in Medikai's direction for a moment in blind panic. Fortunately, she and Hookson seemed not to have heard. Summer was busy tending to the battered and bruised Scrake, which only left Jack. I glanced in her direction and caught the briefest glimpse of a smirk. Molson, I said with a sigh, do yourself a favor. If you want to all continue breathing, never voice that theory again. Okay? If you say so, Jason, she said with a sound like a touch of reluctance. But I had some questions I wished to ask her about the phenomenon. Perhaps that is what the Chimera based their berserker drug and research upon. Yeah, you really need to stop talking now, I said. Leave me. Just shut up. Fortunately, the alien science officer took my advice. I sighed. Now, I said, time to find Reynolds. No shooting, Lee reminded me before I could take a step. Heather seems to disapprove of it. We both glanced down at the whimpering and charred form of the pit boss. No shooting, I agreed readily enough. Lee nodded and let me go. So much for the faint hope he'd volunteer for the job. I marched off in search of the former captain and of the all serene, my forearm blade making clicking sounds as I extended and retracted it as I walked. No guns! I was a man of my word. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave, Chapter 59, written by Semi Loki. I stepped into the room of the cavern, blade still sliding in and out of my clenched fist, when I was forced to pause. Where the hell do I even start looking for him? I wondered, and I realized how poorly I had thought this pad through. The networks of tunnels and shafts that formed the haploid network space was enormous. Granted, he only had a few minutes head start on me, but if I guessed wrong and I dived down the wrong tunnel, it might take me hours before I figure it out. Reynolds himself made it easy on me. Oh, for crying out loud, he sighed. I'm over here. I glanced in the direction of the voice and, sure enough, I saw him crouching with his back resting on the boulder, the boulder that had been the boundary on the underground lake where I had so recently been involved in a deathmatch version of Jello wrestling. He didn't bother looking in my direction. He just sat there on his heels and stared at the shallow and mud-cloudy puddle at once had been a lake. I retracted my blade and walked in his direction. When you're angry, he said as I approached, it messes with what you see. It's easy to miss little details. That's part of the reason a captain needs to try and keep a cool head when things go wrong. He slid down to the floor and stretched out his legs, still not looking at me. He lifted a hand and rolled his wrist to hurry up gesture, as if we were lecturing an invisible audience. It's one of those things that you can't really teach, he went on. The only way to learn it is to have your feet held under the flames over and over again, until you don't even flinch anymore. Giving lessons, I asked him as I sat down next to him. He smiled faintly. I realized I probably should have been giving you tips like these all along, he admits. Better late than never, I guess. We sat there in silence for a moment, and he stared at the tiny puddle before us. I broke it first. Want to talk about it? I asked. He shrugged. Syrians normally didn't do that. I guess it was a gesture he picked up from us. It wasn't a perfect mimicry. Too stiff and with the wrong sort of rhythm. But he tried. A tiny gesture that proved that he'd been paying attention and even trying to connect with us before this incident. In that moment, I felt my rage finally start to evaporate. Would it help if I did? he asked. It might, I replied. I was still angry, but that cooler head that he advised me on was starting to show itself, and he was having sensed my tone and voice or my words because I saw him stealing a look at me. 
For a moment, I saw a flash of faint hope. Then it disappeared and was replaced by a pained grimace. You don't do that, he advised me in a low voice. Don't be weak. You know you can't trust me. It's not fair to either of us if you don't deal with it now. With that, he turned to face the water again. Grim resolve painted on his features. He fully expected to die for what he had done. He had almost caused my death as well as my friend, so, in a sense, it was a reasonable expectation on his part. Still, I was starting to have trouble recognizing my image of a treacherous Reynolds with the sarcastically goofy sky captain that I had been known for the past months. A man I had thought was my friend. Or that couldn't have been a lie, could it? Tell me, I ordered him. He did. I won't lie to you, he said, and tell you that I didn't know what I was doing or what they were controlling me. I'd shoot you right here in the head if you did, I informed him. His smile lasted a microsecond longer this time. Yeah, he said. I would too in your place. Mutiny is bad enough, but trying to lie about it and deflect blame. How could you turn your back on someone who did that? He sighed. No, he said. I knew what I was doing. I even seemed to make sense at the time. Those abjugated critters of yours. I guess I didn't believe in them. Or maybe I just didn't want to face that some of them things are going in my head weren't my own brain. I just ignore that for the most part. Then I got stupid. Summer, I prompted him. He barked a mirthless laugh. I must have it worse than I thought, he said. Does anyone else know? Probably, I admitted, but we don't really discuss that sort of thing. His gaze lowered. He was staring at his own feet now. I have loved her all my life, he muttered. I always thought that we would somehow end up together, that someone, no matter what happened in the meantime, we'd end up with each other because that's the way it was supposed to be. That's how stories like that end. But she turned me down, no matter how many times I asked or she said no. She never pushed me away, though, so I foolishly thought that she meant that there was still a chance. But, I finished for him, she was really just keeping you near so she could have an excuse to be around Scrake. He winced. Pretty stupid of me not to see that, he admitted. I should have seen it, not being blindsided by it like I was. But I was. When that happened, that was whispering that I had been ignoring got a lot harder to ignore. You were hurt and angry, I said. I can see that, but how did that lead to this? Again, that weird humorless chuckle, the laugh of a dying man just before the noose snaps his neck. Anger messes with your ability to see, he said. You miss little things. It ain't just your eyes that is the problem. They whispered to me in my own voice, make me think that it was my own thoughts, told me that this couldn't be real. That was a trick. A trap by the thing that had been pulling her strings. They told me that I knew she loved me and pulled up all the memories to prove it. She was just confused, and the closer we got to that, uh, that thing, the more it did to her just to prove it could. No one else could see it but me. I scratched my chin. Rough bristles scratched right back. When was the last time I was able to shave? Sounds a bit paranoid if you ask me, I told him. A touch of paranoia has saved us more than a few times, he countered. Too shame, I thought, and I motioned for him to continue. That's all they did for a while, he said, kept me angry. I think that maybe that's all they really could do. Sometimes I'd hear them blaming you for the situation that we were in. Whenever I heard that, it felt so wrong that I tried to fight it off. But then, let's start again on how trapping Summer in here with Scrake and getting closer to that thing was making her all crazy. That summer could still be mine if I just snapped her back to her senses. That I had a hard time not listening to. Now I didn't feel angry at all. I felt sick. Images of semi-new John Luke Picard shouting a number of lights flashed in my head. Brain washing. Had the sphere, with all of its centuries of culture and prosperity, really never stumbled upon the same twisted discoveries of Mother Earth? Or was it just Ranald's pride kept him from believing that he could fall for such tactics? Repeating the same words to him over and over again inside his own head. Words that he would not block out. How long had he been fighting this? Days? Weeks? Months? And fight it he did, though. I had to believe that. He had gone this long and I had trusted him for much of it. 
Maybe my pride was wounded as well for the time being fooled. Why today? I asked. Again, he shrugged. I don't know, he admitted. I woke up in the surgery pod and I was furious. It was like I had been arguing with someone, screaming at them for clacks. I couldn't focus on anything but getting rid of the source of all my problems. If you would just surrender command to me, we could all go home and this nightmare would end. Summer would be safe. We'd all be safe. You'd go back to the outer black and be done with this. It wasn't a failure. It was a strategic retreat. I was doing this as I was your friend, and you would get us all killed if you kept pushing it. Too many close calls, too many bad choices. You just needed to cut your losses and try again. Still believe any of that? I asked him while half regretting doing so. All of it, he said grimly. Remember what I said about my anger evaporating? Forget about it. I was angry again. What? I snapped at him. He still didn't look at me. Those were all my own thoughts, he said. That's why it worked. I was thinking it anyway. They just stopped me from thinking other things too. That budding anger froze. Stop you from thinking what? I asked. Like some things like I could have done better, he said. But maybe some things that I would have done a lot worse. Like second guessing after the fact doesn't help anyone. Doubts are normal. I doubt everyone. You, me, Summer, and everyone else. Doubt is normal. Confidence isn't. It shouldn't be easy to see through the fog of bad choices and find the one good choice right where within reach. Life is messy and we're messy creatures. I should know better than to try something as clean as a sea of murk. Maybe you just got polished, I suggested in a weak joke. It was, he agreed, polished because someone had handled it. He'd removed the blemishes and gave it a gleam to catch the eye. That was how you know it's not true. The truth should be hard to handle, too large to grip and too painful to touch, and too horrible to behold. The truth shouldn't care if it makes you feel good. It shouldn't care at all. Humans are meant to doubt. When we get too confident, we make ourselves weaker. His words, though, spoken casually, hit me like I had weights attached to them. Doubts are human strength. Confidence is a weakness. Sounds like something my high school English teacher would say. It also sounded like one of those polished truth Reynolds himself was just warned me against. What would you do if it were in my shoes? I asked him. Do with me? He asked. This time he did not look at me. I already told you, he said as he pointed a finger at me. You can't trust me anymore. Not after this. Even if it was just those alien voices in my head making me crazy. Even if I got handled on it now. You can't trust me not to listen to them again. You have to do what you have to do. You're certain of that? I asked him. Yes, he said. His eyes blazed with a determination, and he struck out his jaw as his left of his neck exposed for me to see. I sighed and then stood up. Then come with me, I said. I have a different idea, one I still have some doubts about. F. Lowe stared at the first at Reynolds and then me. He what? He asked me. I lied, Reynolds answered for both of us and the elaborated. I spoke an untruth, fibbed, fabricated, told the king that horses' rears tasted of strawberry and invited all to lick. I didn't get the last reference, but I know suspected Spherian fables kicked the ever-living crap out of the Hans Christian Andersen. You lied, Heflo asked. Maybe he was just confused as I was. Hid the prostitute from my mistress, he further elaborated. Sold the butcher a wooden cow. Told the forest nymph that she had just grown fat. I lied. Oh yes, I would definitely need to grab a book or two of Spherian folk tales. I don't understand, Evro stammered. Reynolds inhaled and prepared for another list of euphemisms. And, entertaining as it was, I cut him off at the pass. Reynolds was attempting to commit mutiny. I interrupted. He lied to you so that you would help him take the ship. The haploid blink. The ship is destroyed, he pointed out. Yes, Reynolds said. Planning was never my strong point. But the brain scan showed that you were telling the truth, Eflo pointed out. Reynolds didn't even twitch an eye. What do they show now? he asked. The haploid consulted the device and pulled out the pocket of his coverall. That you are telling the truth, he admitted. He looked puzzled now. 
How can you be telling the truth when you said that you stole the ship and also tell the truth when you say that he really is the captain? Heffler asked. I am a complicated man, Reynolds replied. Heffler seemed about to protest again. Isn't it obvious, I interjected. Reynolds knew that you were scanning him and used an advanced biofeedback techniques to fool the scanner. You could do that? Heffler asked. As far as you know, Reynolds answered. What? He means, I interrupted once again, that my orders to discontinue human experimentation and harvesting still stand. I am the legitimate captain. Eflo scratched his head. The changes really did appoint a mere human as a captain of a starship. He asked, still confused. What's more likely, that I'm a real captain, or that I somehow managed to subvert the intricate security systems on the moon-sized battleship, to have it implant me with nanites to make me a captain, and then the rest of my officers, and implant memories on how to operate the ship and equipment? Does that sound plausible? He relaxed. So you're the captain, he declared cheerfully. Contradicting orders are very confusing. Yes, I said. Well, there has been a recent development that is changing everyone's opinions about humans. His eyes flickered to the scanner and he smiled with relief. Apparently my brain scan showed that I was also telling the truth. Of course, he said, if that is what the changes will. It is my will, I said, and you will do it. Of course, Captain, he acknowledged. And, I went on, just to make sure that there aren't any other conflicts of interest after I leave. You're leaving him here. Jack asked after the third time. I nodded, also, for the third time. Yes, I repeated. I need someone to oversee the haploids don't deviate from my instructions on respecting human life. Her eyes darted to Reynolds, judging by her expression. She was trying to splatter his guts all over the wall by sheer power of glare. That fact that he staggered a few steps told me that she was almost there. You think that you can trust him, she snapped at me. A lot more than I can trust him to come with us, I admitted, and yes, I trust him not to let them continue to do horrible things to all of humanity, especially as he's the closest human they could use to refresh the supplies that I burned down earlier in the day. That sobered her up. Her glare softened into something that was almost guilty. I'm sorry, Jason, she muttered. I just that he... he... betrayed all of us because voices in my head told me to do it, Reynolds spoke up which is all the more reason to leave me here. She looked at the Neanderthal. You do want them to stop using humans as lab animals, right? He said. So when the abjugators see you leaving me behind, they'll assume that you are just showing a mercy to an enemy. While they are focusing on you, I can make sure that we can do some real good here. So where the cannon fodder to you? She asked dryly. How noble. I think nobility is a little much for me to expect to regain, he answered, sounding more miserable than a person has a right to sound. I'm just aiming for useful. Jack looked at me again. Jason, she hissed, I don't like him being at our backs. I nodded, which is why we're taking his armor, I answered. Jack's eyes widened. You're going to leave him here with these monsters unarmed, she gasped. Wasn't she for all for killing him a moment before? I'll never understand, woman. Yes, I said, he'll be unarmed. We won't be, one of the twins spoke up. The twins entered the tunnel in the stealthiness that I hadn't thought possible with men with such bulk. I was about to greet them by name before I realized that I'd forgotten their names. I didn't even know which one I was addressing, even if I could remember. Two members of my crew that I thought were lost returned from the grave to save my life, and I can't even recall the names. I do suck as a captain. Guys, I said, clearing my throat, I am thankful that you saved us from Reynolds' mutiny, but he held up a palm to shut me up. Captain, he said, this isn't a matter of royalty. We're not going any further. We fell from the sky, the second twin reminded me. We thought that was it for us. Then, just before we struck, a piece of cloth came out of the back and slowed us down. I smiled. A parachute, I asked. The armor called it a micro-parachute, the first twin spoke. It slowed us down just barely enough. If we hadn't been wearing the armor, I think both legs would have been sent through our skulls. It's apparently one-time emergency measure to allow soldiers to survive unexpected drops. I think it was supposed to keep you hanging in the air a little as possible, so you could escape enemy fire. But the point is, we fell for a long time and thought that we were going to die the entire way. We're done, the other Trin translated. We like you, Captain, but every man has a breaking point. That was ours.
Our feet aren't leaving the ground again, the first added. I nodded in agreement. Couldn't fault them for that. So, just the three of you, I asked. Four of us, hooks and broken. I looked over to saw a grilled crew member as she approached. I felt a stab of pain. My assault force was shrinking by the minute. Hookson, I said. It makes sense, I guess. You want to make sure that they don't do to anyone else what they did to your kind. That, she agreed. And this place is all men. I am not leaving. She poked out the twins in the chest. You, she instructed him, are Tower 1. Now she pointed at the other twin. You, she added, are Tower 2. Is that clear? Good. You have until I count to 10 to get the armor off because the bridge is going in whether the towers are there or not. They raced from the tunnel, slapping bits of their armor as they ran, deciding they was happy for the three of them. Someone tapped my shoulder. I sighed and turned to find Yuns and Yakimo standing there looking unhappy. You're staying as well? I asked. Going home, Yuns corrected. We've had enough of this. We're going to take a ride back to the new town. I closed my eyes and tried to hide my disappointment. The kin need you, I agreed. A throat cleared and I turned to more fine shied standing there. I braced myself. No cavoging way am I missing this, and you can get that cavoging thought out of your cavoging head. You cavoging son of a cavodge, damn cavodge hearted cavodge wad. He stormed off. I spun to face Jack. I think one of them is coming with us, I told her, not even trying to hide my excitement. Four of us, Rhymer corrected me. He had been standing to the one side and now looked amused. Just because you have lost faith in my colleague, he asked, does that mean that you share such a sentiment with me? No, of course not, I said. Good, he said, because I am not leaving Summer and scrake around you or Shide without an armed escort. With that, he tipped an imaginary hat at me and wandered off. Jack, Reynolds and I were now left in a room alone. Jack spun to face Reynolds. One last thing, she said. Reynolds had been quietly removing his armor as a parade of deserters and hanger-ons had marched by. He paused in dismantling his suit and looked at her. Did you cut the hinges on the ship? She asked. His shocked expression told us all I needed to know. Damn it, we had more than one traitor to deal with. End of chapter. The Fourth Wave Part 60, written by Semi Loki. I guess I shouldn't be too terribly surprised that the attitude of the haploids showed their merry band changed noticeably after that. In less than 24 hours, we'd completely upended their admittedly stagnant culture and shook up everything that they knew. While they were never rude to us exactly, I got the distinct impression that we were definitely off their Christmas card list. Fortunately, Haploids are a natural workaholics, and now that I jarred them from their inner eye, they were busy finding work to do. So it was pretty easy to dismiss their curtness for impatience. Unfortunately, now that we were no longer receiving the royal treatment, we soon discovered some of the unpleasant side effects of being surrounded by genetic workaholics. Haploids apparently have three states of existence, awake and working, awake and depressed, and passed down from exhaustion. That's about it. When we found them, they were slipping from state 1 to state 2. They were growing listless and losing their purpose. A few thousand years of no one telling them what to do had set them on an existential crisis. Except, as far as I can tell, haploids don't have a Nietzsche switch in their brains. With normal humans, we can contemplate the futility of existence one moment and order a pizza the next without burning out the cognitive clutch by switching mental gears too fast. Probably because pizza is, by definition, a pretty good reason for existing. But this is beside the point. Normal human brains bounce from one topic to another like a hummingbird on a double espresso in an exotic flower section of the botanical garden. Most people can safely do a bit of navel-gazing without worrying about their lint-filled abyss they're in staring back. Haploids? Uh, not so much. They seem to have genetically programmed to be more than a bit OCD. This compulsion of theirs normally takes shape in a form of a drive to be working every waking moment of the day. They eat and drink while working. They do other things as well, but I'll spare everyone the discomfort from describing the robotic latrines that crawled around the work pits of the spider legs. It took me weeks to get past the nightmares of witnessing one of those in action. It was all enough to make the corpse of Mao Zedong leap out of the grave and cause a priapism. 
Unfortunately, this sort of lifestyle took a toll on ordinary humans, even when we only had to watch. Haploid cuisine, for instance, made the ship-issued field meals seem like pure decadence. Taste was not a consideration when preparing food. Food was quick to make, nutritionally sound, portable, and required the minimum amount of chewing. The most popular choice was the porridge made of boiled grains and pureed beans blended into a synthetic milk. The mixture was poured into a flask so that the haploids could eat and drink at the same time, without making time off to work something as mundane as bodily needs. I didn't even bother sampling the food. I smelled like spoiled cabbage and soured milk, and that was more than enough to tell me that I wouldn't enjoy the experience. The others followed my lead and broke into their meager ration supplies. This led to our second major discovery of the day. The haploids didn't observe the traditional day-night cycle. When we had first been abducted, it had been in the middle of the night. The cabin that we had been taken to had been brightly lit, however. At the same time, I had thought that it was an anticipation of the return of the raiding party. But in the time we spent there, we never observed the lights so much as dim. Haploids worked around the clock and only stopped when exhaustion took them. At such time, they tried to find out a way to play sleep until they were ready to return to work. There was no sleeping barracks. Haploids would simply drop to the floor in the corridors and try to nap, which in turn led to another unpleasant surprise. The haploid mindset. Being as noisy as possible was good etiquette as it allowed a sleeper, who might be in danger of the approaching sleds or heavy equipment, a chance to wake up and avoid the danger. Of course, he would then be expected to help unload the sled before being permitted to go back to sleep. But that was just returning the favor for good manners. Haploids rarely experienced uninterrupted sleep. We were not haploid and, as the day wore on, we became increasingly miserable as we failed to find a spot sufficiently remote to hide from the sleds flying through the breakneck speeds or heavy machines that growed and snarled as they tore into the rock to create new corridors. It was the professor who first suggested we try looking up. While the cabin was dug rather than formed by natural processes, there was also incredibly old. Part of the reason I thought that it might be a natural cavern when we first arrived was because of the uneven features I witnessed as well as the odd static tight. The reason for this, as we soon discovered, was part of the general apathy that seemed to permeate the haploid mindset. Aesthetics mattered little to them, as long as the room was still usable. They allowed nature to progress uninterrupted. Natural erosion had created pockets along the wall, as dripping and collected along the walls. These grooves and shells in the rock face didn't provide much in the way of bedding, but with a few quick bursts of the burner, we widened them enough to allow us to stretch out. From there, it was a simple matter to slap a visor down on our helmets, turn off the vision and hearing, and lock the armor's synthetic muscles to place us so we didn't have to worry about rolling off during the night. It was uncomfortable, yes, but it made sleep possible which meant that we were still better off than Summer and Scrake who, lacking armor, had to make due with wrapping spare cloth over their eyes in an attempt to block the persistent light and noise. Bolson at least agreed to watch over them and agreed to wait them in the event of imminent death. Lacking much else to do, we slept that night and hoped for the train's speedy arrival. As uncomfortable as we were, I found myself almost dozing off immediately. I probably would have fallen asleep if my comm hadn't gone off. Jason, a voice whispered in my ear, according to the display that popped up, sending the glorious shaft of light that burned right through my eyelids and ignited my retinas, the message came from a private channel. Yeah, I groaned as I tried to recall how to bring up the identity of the sender. The voice was unfamiliar. I think I'm losing my mind, the voice replied. My sluggish brain kicked into gear and I realized why I didn't recognize the voice. It was Heather, and she was crying. Heather, I found myself saying. What's wrong with me, she said, her voice cracking near a blubber. Why is this so harm for me? Why can't I just go with it like you do? Go with what? What's wrong? Everything, she said, her voice now dropping to near mumble. And nothing. I'm just so confused. It looks so easy for you. When things go to hell, you just throw yourself at it. I can't do that. All the violence, the terror, the danger. It makes me feel sick. It'll be okay, we're past the hard part, I lied. To my surprise, she laughed. 
You suck at lying, Jason, she accused. You know, we never seem to get past that hard part. No, I admit. No, we don't. So? So what? I asked. How do you do it? She persisted. Why is it so easy for you and not me? How can you just do that? Like where you took the rock and... And... Please, I interrupted. Don't remind me. She fell silent for a moment. You mean it does bother you? She asked. Of course it bothers me, I answered, and heard a crack in my own voice. I wasn't chanting, not quite, but I was getting there. Do you realize what I've seen today, I went on, and what I've done? I'm not all right at all, but thinking about it only makes it worse. The only way I can deal with this is to not think about it. Just keep moving on and keep doing what I have to. When this is all over and I have a year or so to go completely insane, I can go to that rubber wallpaper room and the all-padding diet. But I don't have the time right now. I have to keep focused and keep the people I care about safe. I have to keep the people I l- I caught myself just in time. Like, I had mended alive. Have to get through this. That's all there is to it. I cursed myself with a momentary gaff. Maybe she just think it was a stammer. She sighed. I love you too, she said matter-of-factly, and it sent my heart to flutter anyway. But I just can't seem to wrap my head around it. She went on and just have been discussing with her, rather than saying the words that haunted my dreams since adolescence. I don't think I'm cut out for this. Heather, I said, you're deep-fried that guy. You're cut out. That's different, she protested. He was going to shoot you in the back and... Uh, oh. I could have said something, but I didn't. I let her own words sink in. Jason, she said at last, you have an infuriating way of twisting people's own words back on them. So, you're angry. A little. Good. Why is that good, she asked. I tried shrugging, but my armor prevented that. Beats crying. I heard a strangling sound coming over the common clearly called her name in panic. It took me a moment to realize that she was still trying to stifle a laugh. You sneaky little bastard, she growled. My parents were married, I counted. Believe me, I went over the marriage license looking for the loophole on that one. Shut up, she said. You're not supposed to try and make me feel better by annoying me. Does it work? Shut up, I smiled. So, do you feel better, I declared. She sighed. A little, she admitted, but only a little. I still feel like I'm going crazy over here. Join the club, I said. We're holding elections for treasurer. Want me to nominate you? Pass, she chuckled as then sobered. I don't know if I can sleep tonight. Can you? I was about to admit that after the day I had, I could sleep if they stapled my head to the ceiling and used me as a piñata. But then I noticed some odd inflection in her voice. Curious, I decided to push myself into a more alert state. No, I said, I guess not. Do you want to talk some more? No, she said, then repeated. No, I think we've talked enough. I was thinking of something else. My backup brains that are below my belt begged me to find out if she was talking about board games because I'm going to hurt a lot if she was. Something else, I stammered. Jason, she said in a low voice, come here, please, I need this. I powered up the visor and the armor and scrambled up to a sitting position. Which nook was hers? The com chimed and I answered. Maybe she wanted me to find a tub of whipped cream. The voice was feeble, all right, but not Heather's. Jason, the professor said, we need to talk about what we're going to do when we get to the tower. I've been thinking about a super sentient and something wrong about it, something that just doesn't feel right. You know what I mean. I felt a callus developing in my trousers and I squirmed to relieve the pressure. Oh yeah, I confessed, I'm certainly feeling something out of place. Can we talk about this in the train tomorrow, maybe when we're more alert? I guess, she said, but I really wanted to tell you something in private. You'll have my full attention tomorrow, I promise, just not at the... My comm chimed. I hung up on the professor and switched over to Heather, and then I was on my way. Jason, he said, Jack told me about the hinges. If you suspected a traitor, why didn't you tell me? Lee, this isn't the time. It damn well is, he barked. I understand a traitor means that you have to be careful, damn it. I've earned your trust if you shouldn't inspect... I didn't suspect you, I interrupted. I just didn't want you to start investigating until we had some place safe. I need you to focus on our survival. You really expect me to fall over that lame excuse? I rolled my eyes. Fine, what do you want me to say? The abjugators got into someone's head and until I know who it is, I don't know who to trust. 
Your alien friend had a good view on the hinges from her ship. He pointed out, she doesn't sleep. Why speculate when you can ask her? I froze in place. Damn it, that was a really, really good point. Why hadn't I thought of that? A tapping against the inside of my armor gave me a good reason for why I wasn't thinking clearly right now. But I didn't have an excuses earlier. Maybe later I could. Ah, pal. You're right, I admitted. I should have thought of that question. Go question Volson, but do so discreetly and don't let her know what we're looking for. You sound like you suspect her, he pointed out. We don't know how effective the jammer really was, I pointed out. Just, uh, try not to be too obvious. Aye, Captain, he agreed, and signed off. Oh, good. I could get down to business now. I stood up and was nearly shoved back down as Jack nimbly leapt up the wall and landed on me lightly and a narrow rock edge. Sorry, she squeaked as she landed. Shakily, I righted myself. It's okay, I said as I stood up. I was planning on spending lots of time on my back anyway. If you'll just step to the... I was doing a patrol, she explained. Reynolds had his brain scrambled once, and I don't want him sneaking up on us while we're sleeping. We're all wearing armor, I reminded her. Well, almost all of us. And maybe I should say, wearing armor at this moment. They have armor here. She pointed out as she stepped in front of me and blocked my escape. It's even more advanced than ours. Jason, have you considered upgrading? Considered it, I said, and realized I trust these weasels about as far as I can spit a moose. They locked the armor remotely. Who knows what they can do with armor that they've been tinkering with for centuries. Jason, we need to be prepared for whatever we'll find at the tower. Absolutely, I shouted, and if you'll just step to one side, I'll give Roland a call and, uh... Who? She interrupted. Never mind, I said. Tuddy what? We get there and I will shoot the first and ask why when we wanted us there later. She smiles at this. The first sensible thing you said, she said, while nodding approvingly. I was afraid you want to play it safe or something. I've done a lot of growing recently, I said, especially very recently. Lots of personal growth. Now, if you could just step to the one side while I... Uh, I was cut off by a new voice doing a general broadcast over the open channel. You know what the kvodge, that's kvodging, rat kvodging, kvodge drink. Well, guess what? I just found a barrel of it and apparently forgot all about it. It's kvodging fermented. Now, granted, it may taste like the wrong end of a leaking kvodge latrine, but I, for one, plan to get kvodge face by. I cut off transmission and shot a pained grin at Jack. She tilted her head and shot me a quizzical look. Are you okay, Jason? She asked. Fine, fine. You're sweating, she pointed out. Armor funk, I said quickly. I was just getting to take it off and take give a good airing out an hour or two. She narrowed her eyes. Tell me you're not seriously considering doing what I think you're planning on doing, she demanded. Embarrassment probably would have caused me to blush if I had enough blood supply running to my cheeks to color them. As it was, she merely managed to drop the temperature of the sweat crawling down my spine from volcanic to arctic guilt. Not going to do what? I stammered, the falsetto voice her even I thought sounded guilty of something. You're not going to go drink some of that toxic filth Shy just dug up, did you? This must have been condemned prisoner feels like when he hears a phone ring just before they throw a big switch. No! I promised with a genuine sincerity. You promise? she asked. We need you, Jason. I know this armor can heal a lot, but who knows what strange stuff that is in that vat. Promise me. I promise nothing strange will keep me off my feet for more than a few hours. What? she asked. I mean, I promise I won't drink. I swore as I held up my fingers and I hoped to let the boy scout pledge. I promise I have no interest in hanging out with Shide at the moment. She pursed her lips and eyed me suspiciously. You seem to be in a hurry, she noted. Where are you off to? Jack, I said at last. Do you want me to pull rank on you? Because if you don't step out of my way, I'm going to be pulling... Jason! A familiar voice cut in over the private com. I... I don't know what's taking you so long. Maybe... Um, maybe you are having doubts too. I know I am. I'm sorry. I was weak. I shouldn't have put you in that situation. I've come to my senses and... Um, thank you for... Not being that guy. I closed my eyes. Damn it, I whispered. What's wrong, Jason? Jack asked suddenly. Did something happen? Yeah, I said at last. I promised you that I'd stay away from the vat and there goes the plan of drowning my sorrows. I opened my eyes and saw her frowning at me. So you were planning on drinking it, she accused me. No, I corrected her. 
Just drowning. I think I'm just going to go back to bed now. Alone. Jack took a step back and without so much as a farewell leapt effortlessly off the rock shelf and set the handholds further along the wall. I slid to the floor and groaned in a mixture of frustration and, uh, okay, more than frustration. All the dirty, stinking, rotten luck. If that kid's timing had been lousy, I might have been able to... Uh, I paused as I thought struck me. I activated the common call, Lee. Lee, I asked slowly, do you think the security officer would have privileges to eavesdrop in on a comm chatter? I personally think yes or a no would have sufficed. Laughter was uncalled for. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.